Hello, chairs, are you ready to begin? Yeah, I'm ready. I am ready, thanks. Sergeant Polite, if you could start with your opening statement, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Committee on Criminal Justice, Joint with Justice System. Please place your cell phones and electronic devices on vibrate. Any testimony can be sent to hearings at council.nyc.gov. That's hearings at council.nyc.gov. Thank you, and we will begin momentarily. We're ready to start. Okay, thank you. Thank you to all and thank you everybody. Welcome today. Uh, I'm going to gavel in. Thank you for joining our virtual hearing today on the effects of COVID-19 on the city's jail and juvenile detention centers. I uh, just want to quickly acknowledge those that have joined us in addition to Chair Lanceman, who we'll hear from shortly. We've been joined by Councilmember Cohen, Councilmember Lewis, Councilmember Rose, Councilmember Rivera, Councilmember Holden, Councilmember Amphrey Samuel, Councilmember Lander, Councilmember Yeager, and Councilmember Mizell and I am sure we'll be joined by others shortly. I'm going to turn it over to our committee counsel, Alana Sivin, to go over some procedural items. Thank you. I am Alana Sivin, counsel to the Criminal Justice Committee of the New York City Council. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, then you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called, I will be periodically announcing who the next panelists will be. Today, we will be hearing from representatives of six mayoral agencies, including the Department of Correction, Correctional Health Services, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, the Administration for Children's Services, the Department of Probation, and the Law Department. We additionally will be hearing from the Board of Correction, District Attorneys, Public Defenders, and members of the public. We will be calling agency representatives in panels and ask that council members reserve their questions for after each panel is finished testifying. The first panel will be the Department of Correction and Correctional Health Services. The first two panelists to give testimony will be Cynthia Brand, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Correction, followed by Dr. Patricia Yang, Senior Vice President of Correctional Health Services. I will call you when it is your turn to speak. For the question and answer period only, we will also be joined by Patricia Feeney, Chief of the Department, by Deputy Commissioner Patricia Feeney, Chief of the Department Hazel Jennings, Chief of Staff Brenda Cook, Deputy Commissioner of Financial Facilities and Fleet Administration Patricia Lyons, General Counsel Heidi Grossman, Senior Deputy Commissioner Timothy Farrell, First Deputy Commissioner Angel Villalona from the Department of Correction, and Dr. Ross McDonald, Chief Medical Officer from CHS, and Dr. Ben Harper from CHS. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or of a specific panelist, after the panel is finished testifying, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. Please note that we have grouped several representatives of the administration in groups and will not be taking questions until each group has testified. We will, be, we will be limiting council member questions to three minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer your questions. Please note that for the ease of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of questions for each panelist. Thank you. I'll now pass it to Chair Powers to give an opening statement. Thank you. Um, and just checking quickly to see if we've been joined by any other folks, but I think we'll be joined by more shortly. 
Um, thank you, uh, Lana. Um, we're going to get started. So thank you. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for all those who have joined us today, to my colleagues, to the agencies, and all of those who are at home uh, and watching today. I am City Council Member Keith Powers, Chair of the Committee on Criminal Justice. Uh, I am joined today by Council Member Rory Lansman, Chair of the Committee on Justice System for tonight, today's joint oversight hearing on COVID-19 in New York City jails and juvenile detention centers. In the past few months, New Yorkers have had to completely readjust the way that we operate in order to stop the spread of coronavirus. We wear masks when we go outside, we stand six feet apart from each other, we're encouraged to use hand sanitizer and wash our hands more than we ever have before. All of that intended to mean and make sure that we stop the spread of the virus. For people who are working or in custody in our jails and prisons, following these guidelines is at best difficult and at worst impossible. Everything about a contained environment, like our city jails, risks the curve going steeply up. Social distancing is harder when you talk about escorts. Staying six feet apart is harder when living in dormitories at beds are beds are where beds are close to each other or common areas that are shared. And shared space and equipment among staff means that the spread is even more at risk. To, and, and, and that is not to say at all to disregard the hard work that I know all the folks here and on the front lines at CHS and DOC are doing to ensure that people in custody are safe. They've done a lot, including releasing people in city custody through the 6A work release program, temporarily opening EMTC to allow for more effective social distancing, and to do as much as we can to make sure that people have access to hand sanitizer and able to wash their hands not to mention the daily efforts by the doctors at CHS and the officers at DOC to keep people healthy while trying to preserve their own health and safety and their own family members' health and safety at the same time. The information we've received thus far regarding the state of jails has given us reason to be concerned. According to the Board of Corrections daily COVID-19 report, there are 365 people currently incarcerated with positive cases of COVID-19. 1,344 DOC staff have tested positive for the virus, as have 184, 85 CHS staff. And of course, we can assume those numbers change uh, on any given day or go up in any given, based on any given day. We've lost at least three people incarcerated to the virus. And along with uh, the, the number here says 10, but I believe even we lost an individual yesterday who was an officer to this virus. I wanna, just if we may take a minute to, to of silence just for that individual that we lost yesterday and all those that we've lost just can take one moment of silence for them. Okay, thank you. I want to know that they'll let them know that they are certainly in our thoughts and prayers today. Um, before we go any further, I just want to take, oh, sorry, but we have heard uh, 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 and, have, and have continued concerns about jail conditions. In the Board of Corrections May 11th audit of correctional facilities, they found that only a small people of custody, 17% of all cases audited were, uh, were wearing masks and 45% of audited dormitories operating, were operating at above 50% capacity. On May 8th, in a letter to the Board of Corrections, public defenders expressed concerns that people in custody were unable to practice social distancing in dorms and single cell, single cell units and were unable to access masks. And we've heard ongoing concerns from staff about not having access to equipment, department giving away PPE at a time when it might have been most necessary and requiring work to staff to work 24 hour shifts. Myself and others have called for there to be a clear and public and person from this administration to lead these efforts to coordinate the various agencies that we'll be hearing from today and others that are not here today, which is not a criticism against any particular person or agency, but to help strengthen the entire effort and empower those individual agencies to have what they need when they need it and to have a mechanism to get it if they need it. Um, there's so much, and I just want to mention, there's so much more information we don't know. We don't know the amount of people that are currently incarcerated with COVID-19. So we do know that, but we don't have an idea of how many people have been infected in total, including those who have been incarcerated and discharged. We know how many people have died while they, are in, while they were in custody, but we don't know how many people have passed away after being infected and released from our city's jails. We don't know how many CHSA st CHS staff members have been quarantined. We don't know how many people have been hospitalized. We know that jail environments are inherently dangerous during this time, but we don't have a full picture of how dangerous. 
in the midst of all this, the need to monitor jail conditions and to release people in custody could not be clearer. This is why we're hearing three bills today that I'm sponsoring, all relating to the improvement of conditions and the release of people in custody. The first bill would require the Department of Corrections and CHS to submit to the Speaker of the City Council and make publicly available on the department's website, website a daily report related to the outbreak of city jails. That report would include cumulative numbers of individuals diagnosed, deceased, hospitalized, quarantined, and tested for COVID-19. The proposed legislation would also require the Department of Correctional Health Services and the Department of and, and DOH to provide regular in-person updates to people in custody about the per public health emergency and to publish a, a timeline of significant events, ensuring that people have an understanding of what is happening when it comes to COVID-19. The second bill would ensure that members of the public depositing funds into commissary funds would not be charged a service fee more than $5 during a time when it's very difficult or sometimes impossible for friends and family members to make to deposit money or items in person. It's more crucial that we don't charge exorbitant fees on such deposits. And while service fees for kiosks on site at Rikers Island fall within these guidelines and it capped at $3, $3 transfers made online uh, or at kiosks off the island do not. And finally, the third bill would require the mayor to create local conditional release commission pursuant to section 271 of the correction law. The commission would determine subject to state limitations, which individuals who are serving city sentences could be granted early release. This bill, in addition to the 6A uh, work release program would give the city an additional tool to release people who do not need to be incarcerated. Had the commission been in place prior to the pandemic, we would have decarcerated our jails in a more timely fashion and been able to uh, identify those folks for release. I do still wanna recognize that the, this administration did respond to that call and did do what was in, I think, in much in their jurisdiction to, to get folks out. Um, Erie County in New York has a similar commission and has been able to use it to partner with nonprofit or organizations to provide mental care, healthcare, addiction treatment, job training, and a variety of other needed services to help people upon release. And I believe that we can do the same here in New York City, especially during a pandemic. I wanna thank uh, a number of my colleagues, including uh, Council Member Farrah Lewis, Council Member Lander, uh, Public Advocate Jumani Williams, Council Member Yeager, and others who have sponsored, not all, but different versions of those bills and have been uh, great partners here when it comes to responding to this uh, epidemic, this, this pandemic and, and this crisis. So with that, I want to uh, hand it over to Chair Lanceman for his opening remarks. Oh, and I just, before I, before I do that, sorry, I do want to recognize all the staff on here, both my staff and all staff from the City Council, having seen how much work goes into these remote hearings to make sure they work and that people can get appropriate time to answer questions, things like that. I am really tremendously grateful to all the arms and staff and everyone who is making this work today. So thank you. And now I'll hand it over to Chair Lanceman. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. I'm Council Member Rory Lanceman, Chair of the Committee on the Justice System, and I am pleased to join Chair Powers and the Committee on Criminal Justice in this hearing on COVID-19 and the city's adult jails and juvenile detention centers. Since a state of emergency covering the five boroughs was declared in early March, our local jail population is down 30%, and not merely because overall crime has plummeted. Rather, much of that reduction is the result of deliberate policy decisions and actions aimed at lowering the city's incarceration rate in response to the COVID-19 crisis. Jails are exceptionally dangerous places during a pandemic for detainees, officers, and civilian staff alike, with an infection rate many times greater than the population at large. The council has challenged our city and state criminal justice policy and enforcement agencies, our courts, and our independently elected district attorneys to justify the continued detention of every person sitting on Rikers and in the city's other jails. Is there a better way to achieve justice, accountability, and public safety than by locking someone in a cage at enormous risk to their health and expense to the tax taxpayers. I'm pleased to say that the answer nearly 2,500 times was yes. That's why our jail population is right now at its lowest since 1946. Those released include over 300 people serving a sentence of less than a year, 
pursuant to a law that allows the mayor to alternatively place those individuals in a work release program outside the confines of jail. Over 250 who were awaiting trial on a misdemeanor charge. Nearly 650 who were accused of a technical parole violation, like missing an appointment with a parole officer, and hundreds who couldn't afford their bail while they awaited trial for nonviolent or violent felony charges. Now, some of these folks left the jail in the ordinary course of business, but most were released because of the coronavirus crisis and our city's and state's response to it. Now, it's been reported that about 100 of those released from Rikers have reoffended for what appears to be overwhelmingly nonviolent offenses. Some, like former police commissioner Bill Bratton, view this 95% success rate and call it, quote, a crime virus. I choose to view this safe, rapid decarceration as a potentially much hoped for new normal. And it's important to note that the system was primed to rapidly decarcerate by the time the coronavirus gripped New York City by the previous work of this council in decriminalizing many low-level offenses, pressuring the police department to make far fewer arrests for marijuana possession and fair evasion, and expanding alternate alternative to detention programs, as well as by Albany's new limits on the use of cash bail and the framework for safely decarcerating Rikers laid out by the Lippman Commission. But important questions remain. Why are we still incarcerating nearly 1,300 people solely because they can't afford cash bail, including about 185 people held on nonviolent felonies or misdemeanors? Were there categories of offenses and charges that were excluded from consideration for release, either by the city, the district attorneys, or the courts, and why? Have prosecutors in the courts reduced their requests for and setting of cash bail during the pandemic? Why are we not completely isolating new admissions to Rikers and the city's jails for at least 10 days to ensure that they are not present, that they do not present symptoms of COVID-19? And what should be the easiest question to answer of them all, but which heretofore we have been unable to get a response. How many individuals in the custody of the New York City Department of Corrections have tested positive for COVID-19? I look forward to getting answers at today's hearing and Chair Powers, thank you again for leading this effort. Thank you. We will now. We will now call on the Department of Correction and Correctional Health Services to testify. First, Commissioner Bran of the Department of Correction, followed by Dr. Yang of Correctional Health Services will testify. Before we begin, I will administer the oath. Commissioner Bran, Dr. Yang, Commissioner Feeney, Chief Jennings, Chief of Staff Brenda Cook, Deputy Commissioner Lyons, General Counsel Heidi Grossman, Senior Deputy Commissioner Timothy Farrell, First Deputy Commissioner Villalola, Villalona, Dr. McDonald, and Dr. Farber. I will call on to administer the oath. I will also call on Dana Kaplan, Deputy Director from the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice for questions. I will call on each of you individually for a response. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Bran. I do. Dr. Yang. Dr. Yang, I don't believe you are. I, I, I do, yes. Thank you. Deputy Commissioner Feeney. I do. Chief Jennings. I do. Chief of Staff Cook. I do. Deputy Commissioner Lyons. I do. General Counsel Grossman. I do. Senior Deputy Commissioner Farrell. I do. First Deputy Commissioner Villalola. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
I do. Dr. McDonald. I do. Dr. Farber. I do. It's Dr. Mr. Farber. Oh. Deputy Director Kaplan. I do. Thank you. Commissioner Brand, you may begin when you're ready. Good afternoon, Chair Powers, Chair Lanceman, and members of the Committee on Criminal Justice and the Committee on the Justice System. I'm glad to see that you are all healthy and well. I'm pleased to be joined today by the dedicated members of my leadership team and our valuable partners from across our city's criminal justice agencies. Since the pandemic began, the department has worked around the clock to keep those working and living in our facilities safe. And I thank you for the opportunity to discuss our response to this unprecedented crisis. Before I begin, I would like to take a moment to thank the dedicated and hardworking employees of the Department of Correction and Correctional Health Services for their incredible service during this difficult time. They have remained committed to protecting the safety and well-being of those entrusted to their care at a great personal sacrifice. As commissioner, I am proud to work beside them and want them to know that their horrific, heroic efforts have not gone unnoticed. Throughout this crisis, the department has worked tirelessly with our partners at CHS to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 and keep those under our care safe. As a result of the department's longstanding emergency preparedness protocols, our considerable experience in contagious disease management, adherence to CDC and DOHMH guidelines, and innovative problem solving, we are seeing success. The number of new positive cases in quarantine housing units across the facilities is steadily declining, a clear indication that our containment strategies are working. Over the past two months, there have been many concerns raised about sanitation procedures, the availability of soap, and the provision of personal protective equipment. Here are the facts. First, the department established robust sanitation procedures where housing units, day rooms, transport vehicles, and other congregate spaces are sanitized on a daily basis. High-touched areas are sanitized every two hours, and showers are sanitized three times per day. Supervisors check these processes nine times a day in the Quality Assurance and Integrity Division, as well as staff from the Bureau Chief of Facility Operations, perform an additional audit. Second, all individuals in custody have access to soap and cleaning supplies free of charge. And lastly, at every stage of this pandemic, the department has provided all staff and everyone in custody with ample personal protective equipment. We first began providing masks on March 11th, nearly a month before medical professionals recommended it. And as our understanding of the situation progressed on April 3rd, we made face coverings a requirement for all staff and those in custody, nearly two weeks before the state ordered it. Our supply of PPE is sufficient and all staff and people in custody have direct access to replacement PPE as frequently as desired. As a further protection mechanism, all staff entering the facilities must submit to a temperature and COVID-like symptom screening prior to entry. Since the beginning of this crisis, the department has worked closely with our partners to identify individuals eligible for release. As a result of this action, the number of New Yorkers held in New York City jail has plummeted shrinking nearly 30% in just over one month. The department is currently operating at an overall occupancy rate of 49%, with more than half of the beds empty in open units. Significantly, the overwhelming majority of dorm units are less than half full. Additionally, we have been in constant communication with staff and people in custody to raise awareness and educate them on prevention practices including painting cues on chairs and benches that support appropriate social distancing. The department's multilingual COVID-19 awareness campaign includes conspicuously placed posters, an informational one-pager, and an informational slideshow displayed at intake. Despite the challenges we face due to COVID-19's impact on our staff sick rate 
and the temporary suspension of congregate programming, in-person visitation, and most in-person court appearances, April 2020 has been one of the safest months in recent history. Use of force has decreased by 47% as compared to March 2020, and by 37% as compared to April 2019. Fights among people in custody also decreased by 47% as compared to March 2020, and by 48% as compared to the same time last year. Further, in April 2020, the department saw nearly 50% fewer slashings and stabbing as compared to the previous month, and a 21% reduction in the total number of assaults on staff in the same period. These are significant reductions, and we are sustaining this progress in May. The pandemic has forced many of us to significantly restrict our contact with others. As commissioner, I understand how important connections with friends, family, and legal support are to those in our custody, and the department has made every effort to afford visits remotely. For critical communication with attorneys in the court system, the department has expanded its Skype teleconference booths to ensure contact with loved ones. Over a matter of just days in March, the department created a brand new family televisit initiative enabling video, video visitation from a personal electronic device. The department has continued to provide free telephone calls and is offering three free stamps or pre-stamped envelopes to persons in custody on a weekly basis. For spiritual care and guidance, the department established a hotline for chaplaincy services. In addition to support continued program delivery, the department has worked with our contract service providers to create activity packets with program-specific material, established a discharge planning hotline to assist with reentry, and is providing tablets with educational resources to all persons in custody. Throughout this pandemic, we have endeavored to be as transparent as possible to ensure that the public and our oversight bodies are aware of our approach and our outcomes. Since March 17th, we have provided detailed data to the Board of Correction, who began posting information publicly as of April 1st. We are in regular communication with elected officials, defender organizations, and other advocacy groups, and we plan to continue this collaboration. Our Office of Public Information has responded to more than 600 media inquiries from across the globe since the pandemic began. Regarding the pre-considered legislation that requires the reporting of certain information during public health emergencies, the department is committed to transparency and stands ready to discuss the ways we can improve in this effort. The bill as drafted prevents administrative challenges. However, we look forward to continuing to discuss this bill with the council. Regarding the pre-considered legislation regarding fees related to adding money to commissary funds, the department supports the intent of the bill. We are continuing to analyze the impact of the legislation and look forward to continuing to discuss this matter with the Council. Despite this unprecedented crisis and its many challenges, the Department remains committed to protecting all those working and living within our facilities. We will continue to collaborate with our partners to develop created practices and policies to effectively manage this public health emergency, and we will come out stronger and bolder as a result. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Next, we'd like to invite Dr. Yang of Correctional Health Services to testify. Dr. Yang. Maria. Hi, um, good afternoon. Chairpersons, Powers and Lanceman and members of the Criminal Justice and Justice System Committees. Um, Patsy Yang, Senior Vice President of Health and Hospitals for Correctional Health, also known as CHS. I'm joined here by Dr. Ross McDonald, our Chief Medical Officer and Ben Farber, our Chief um, of Staff. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to update you on actions we've taken so far in the face of this devastating global pandemic, and would like to brief you on three cornerstones of our approach, decarceration, containment, and maintenance. When the novel coronavirus was first confirmed to be in New York City on March 1st, CHS was well positioned to confront head-on this fast-moving, shape-shifting, lethal virus. Much of the foundation of our response has already been built in the four years since we became the direct provider of health care in the jails. To minimize the likelihood of transmission of SARS-CoV-2 virus, we've taken aggressive and strategic steps that are aligned with the best available public health advice. 
tailored to the unique environment of the New York City jails. Most tragically, three people in custody have succumbed to this plague so far. Yet because CHS and DOC strove to lock arms and stay in lockstep throughout this first wave of the pandemic, in order to shield people who were entrusted in our joint care and custody, I am certain that together we saved many lives. Decarceration was one of our key strategies from the outset. CHS focused on identifying and helping arrange for release from custody our patients who we determined were most vulnerable to a severe course of disease should they contract the virus. This effort was built on CHS's long-standing advocacy work for compassionate release of patients with serious clinical conditions. The global pandemic gave, gave strengthened purpose and opportunity for CHS to accelerate this work along with our partners at DOC, MOPJ, defense attorneys, district attorneys, courts, the state office of mental health, the state um, department of, of correction and, and community uh, service, supervision, sorry. Um, this work relied on relationships that were built over months and over years. Between March and May, more than 2,000 people were released, including roughly half of our patients who were age 50 years or older. To support the safe release of our patients into the community, CHS's already robust discharge services were enhanced to respond to the emergency. While our protocols for discharging patients with mental health concerns and or medication needs remained unchanged, CHS now additionally screens for COVID-like symptoms every patient whom DOC escorts prior to release, and we assist patients in securing accommodations within which to self-isolate as appropriate. We also provide information on community testing sites and on supportive services. As before, individuals who need assistance after release can contact CHS's established community services, our point of reentry and transition program, and our community reentry assistance network. For patients who are still in custody, containment was a foundational strategy. Although we, were unique, we are unique, actually, in jail, among jails, to have an 88-bedded communicable disease unit, we very quickly realized that this capacity was insufficient. Together with DOC, we adapted and expanded our concept of therapeutic housing units to create an entirely new designation of housing for patients on the COVID spectrum based on clinical need and status. We separately housed our most vulnerable asymptomatic patients from patients with confirmed disease, from patients with symptoms of the disease, from patients who were asymptomatic but were known to have exposure to a confirmed positive individual. Because this expansion of this notion of clinical housing allowed us to physically separate and shield patients in the face of what felt like a viral tsunami, we also planned for a surge capacities in each category of housing. Whether it was reopening an entire facility or repurposing different types of housing, DOC and CHS together daily balanced the urgent and growing need to protectively house our patients against the shrinking availability of both our staffs who themselves were getting sick. The housing plan that CHS and DOC together implemented involved almost 200 housing units and thousands of beds. During this current past wave of the outbreak, on, any, on a given day, the maximum of 278 isolation and 2,889 quarantine beds were occupied. Another key element of our containment strategy was testing. We instituted an early and aggressive COVID-19 antigen testing strategy that exceeds the standards being employed in the larger community. We test at a rate 4.3 times higher than the rest of New York City. Our approach to testing was so much more aggressive for a number of reasons, ranging from the cognizance of the likely higher toll on our patients who already bear a heavier burden of underlying conditions that predispose them to more severe outcomes, to the realities that while congregate settings make physical distancing difficult, a person's COVID status helps inform housing decisions that are protective. We test asymptomatic patients, patients who are asymptomatic but highly, but who are, we test symptomatic patients as well as asymptomatic patients who are highly vulnerable and universally all patients who are new, newly admitting into the system, regardless of their symptoms. As of May 15th, uh, sorry, um, antigen tests among patients totaled 1,270 of which 537 were positive. We expect to begin, we are actually beginning antibody testing among our patients today. Um, as our understanding of the disease has evolved, has evolved, so has our testing strategies. We continue to proactively pursue all available laboratory resources to take advantage of rapidly developing technology because these will continue to be the key as we prepare for a resurgence of this still present virus. 
The third key strategy for protecting our patients from SARS-CoV-2 was maintenance of access to healthcare services despite mandates to minimize person-to-person -person contact between patients and between patients and staff in waiting rooms, in clinics, and in transit to and from housing areas. In accordance with those emergency declarations, many health systems throughout the city closed or reduced non-essential services, which resulted affecting us as well um, in, the, in the curtailment of certain elective specialty appointments during the height of this last wave of the epidemic. However, while elective and non-urgent visits had to be adjusted, access to our medical, nursing, and mental health services, ongoing substance use treatment, and medications remained unchanged. We continue to be present in therapeutic housing units and access to program remained un largely unchanged. Emergency response, urgent care, nurse and physician availability continued around the clock. As before, we reviewed all missed scheduled visits to prioritize escort by DOC to clinic accordingly. And as always, any patient in mental health crisis or in need of urgent medical attention alerted DOC who contacted us. While maintaining these core services, we built new workflows and systems given the realities of this pandemic. This required maintaining adequate PPE according to the latest guidelines, responsiveness to the latest clinical guidance, and constant communication with our staff. We safely managed the majority of COVID patients who developed disease without burdening our overburdened hospital partners and aggressively monitored for signs of more severe disease so that we could escalate care at the earliest sign of trouble. We incorporated COVID-like screening at every point of contact within the criminal justice process, at pre-arraignment, at admission, at every clinical counter, and upon discharge. We worked with our partner ACS to transfer into our care at the Horizon facility any youth who were suspected to have or confirmed to have COVID-19. We balanced the public health imperative to minimize person-to-person -person contact with our unflagging commitment to healthcare access by expanding our already pioneering use of technology. Our years of experience and our infrastructure allow us to use telehealth video connections to minimize disruptions in care during this past crisis. Working with DOC, we were able to establish new secure telephonic connections for our patients from any housing area to contact CHS directly, whether it was to report health concerns and like COVID-like symptoms or to talk through their anxieties about the disease. These new pathways were important supplements to the provider-patient communication channels that existed before the pandemic. Every evening at precisely seven o'clock, neighborhoods throughout the city erupt. As people stop in the streets, they throw open their windows, they go out on their roofs, they whistle, they applaud, they shout, they bang pots, they bang pans, they sound their car horns. They do this in gratitude for the healthcare workers who put the very lives of their patients ahead of that of their own and that of their families. During every one of these daily tributes, I feel particularly privileged and honored to work alongside the staff who, even among essential workers, face daily challenges that are unique to the jail environment, and they've done so with unflinching professionalism and dedication. Thanks. Thank you. I will now turn it over to questions from Chair Powers, followed by Chair Lanceman. For these questions, we will additionally be joined by Deputy Commissioner Feeney, Chief Jennings, Chief of Staff Brenda Cook, Deputy Commissioner Lyons, General Counsel Grossman, Senior Deputy Commissioner Farrell, First Deputy Commissioner Bill Alona from the Department of Correction, and Dr. Ross McDonald from Correctional Health Services and Ben Farber, uh, in addition to Deputy Director Dana Kaplan. Panelists, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. Thank you, Chair Powers. Thank you, and, and I, I share um, to CHS, I just wanna say thank you to all, to everybody here. Thank you to all your staff and, and, and particularly the doctors that are, are serving at a very, very challenging time in the city. And when we do clap, uh, I know that in my district, people go outside of Bellevue, they go outside NYU, but uh, for many of us, we're, we're, we're thinking about it, all your doctors as well, who um, are, are putting themselves in a very challenging environment. So thank you for, for mentioning that as well. Um, we're gonna go into a number of questions um, related to testing and housing and things like that. But I just want to start, and this is, you know, for, for, for both agencies, and I'll, I'll, I'll pull this question out for, for others as well. But, you know, one of the things we are going to hear from, I think, six or seven various agencies today, we're going to hear from CHS and DOC and MOCJ and ACS and Department of Probation, in addition to 
um, uh, other agencies here that intersect with, we have the DAs, we have the NYPD, we have obviously the Board of Correction. And, you know, one of the things I, I've been trying to get clarity around and just make sure we as a public understand is through the pandemic, there is a, uh, a lot of challenges here. Everything from the release, the question about release and who to release, presumably CHS has ideas around that, DOC has thoughts on that, MACJ has thoughts on that. Certainly we know we've heard the NYPD has thoughts on that. Can you explain, can, can, and, and I'm, I'll open this to either agency, but can you explain to us the, the how these decisions are made amongst a group of six, you know, six, seven agencies, some that report directly to the mayor, DAs, BOC, we understand are outside of that. When we talk about, and certainly there's been disagreements amongst agencies about release, for instance, uh, how, how is this coordinated? How are these decisions made and, and how, what, who is making the decision when there is a conflict between agencies when it comes to things like release or, or if there's a disagreement with the agencies that just testified about how to house or quarantine, things like that? Uh, so I will speak for um, housing decisions and uh, releases with regard to compassionate release. Every day since this pandemic began, we've had calls daily calls with CHS. Uh, we discuss cases. We discuss any issues that arose the day before. We discuss issues um, with any kind of housing disagreements, and we provide a solution before the, the call is ending. So we have a minimum of one, one call per day. Um, we have experienced many days where we have several calls, and we respond immediately to issues that arise. I can say for DOC, and I, I suspect my colleagues at CHS would, would say the same thing, that the bonds um, formed between the two agencies during this crisis has never been stronger. And we have collaborated. We have become very creative in our solutions, in our efforts to minimize the impact of the spread of this disease. With regard to broader releases across the city, I'll let um, Ms. Kaplan speak to that as the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice and how the Mayor's Office has coordinated amongst all the law enforcement agencies in the city. Sure, uh, good afternoon. Dana Kaplan, Deputy Director of the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Obviously, the releases were by, uh, via a number of different mechanisms. So some people were released pre-trial that involved a coordinated process with the district attorneys, the defenders, uh, and the courts for individuals who were released uh, because there were uh, holds lifted by the State Department of Correctional, uh, the state docs. Uh, those were individual decisions that were shared by, uh, that were made by the state. Uh, as it related to the 6A city sentence program, uh, that was determinations that were made by the Department of Corrections in consultation with the mayor's office. And we considered a number of different factors there. So. It uh, looked a little different for each uh, type of population. One of the things that guided the whole process was a consideration of particular medical vulnerabilities. And as Correctional Health Services said, uh, Correctional Health Services was able to help identify individuals who had some of the five pre-existing medical conditions that would put them at particular uh, vulnerability for exposure to COVID. And so we were able to make that information available to all of the different stakeholders so that their individual decisions on the cases that they had discretion over could be informed by an understanding of any health considerations that they should particularly be aware of during this period. Okay, and from CHS, from, this is back to CHS, are there individuals that you are uh, treating or seeing that in custody right now that you believe should not be in a jail setting at this moment, based on either a medical issue or based on underlying condition? Uh, yes, I think there, there always are. I think, I think the, jail, the jail is, a, is not a healthy environment, and particularly in the face of, of a pandemic such as what we're facing. Um, what, what we do uh, continue to do, as we did before the, the pandemic, is to look for our most vulnerable and work to get them get them compassionate release. We of course can't speak to the issues of levels of charges and, and those other factors that that come into into consideration on whether somebody is released or not. 
um, but we continue to work with all everybody involved um, to identify our patients who are most vulnerable to to um, a severe course of disease. And are there um, are there categories, for instance, is it is there an age group category, a medical condition category, or other that you see have not been taken out of the jail setting and either put into another healthcare setting or been released and sent home? And, and, and can you identify which ones those are? I don't think there are broad clinical categories that haven't been, haven't been looked at and, and efforts been made. It, it gets really down to the individual patient um, and, and what his or her clinical condition is, what the charges are, um, all the circumstances that, that come into play. Um, and I think that Dana was talking about some of them. Okay, and and but but theoretically, there is a there could be an individual. Not even there. In practice, there could be a individual where you identify because of their underlying condition. This person should be going home or going somewhere else, not be in this consented setting where either they are contagious to somebody else or they have a their own condition that could put them at risk. And but there would be other obviously clearly other factors here um, that would lead to them not being able to be released. Is that fair to say? Uh, yeah, it is fair to say, um, but it, again, I just, I just want to say that, that our work around getting people compassionately released from jail, um, it, it, it precedes COVID. It, it is part of our, our whole, you know, since, since we came over to health and hospitals and really, really picked this up, um, our geriatric complex care service is very much part of that, our court advocacy and liaison program, our discharge planning and reentry support. Um, this is you know, COVID just gave more strength and, and impetus to, to the, the rapidity and, and the volume of people who could be considered um, because of the cognizance of, of the part of the rest of the criminal justice system of what, what risks were engendered by remaining in jail during this time. Um, I think it made everybody more aware of, of each, the impact of each of their decisions at each point of the, of the process. We have not stopped we did not start with COVID. We did not stop with COVID. We accelerated through COVID. We continue to this day, every day, to identify people who we work for release. Okay, thank you for that. Thanks for that answer. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna ask a lot of questions here that are both for DOC and for CHS, perhaps Mock J, we will have to answer some, but um, these are, we're just gonna ask for some data here, some information. I'm gonna try to do this in uh, short order so that I can hand it over to Councilman Lansman and I have a number of colleagues who I know are trying to get questions. I want to be respectful of their time. So, just if you can, if you can uh, give us that, in, in, you know, intel information in uh, in a concise manner. Um, for starters, in total, what is a cumulative number of people in custody who have been tested for COVID nineteen? Uh, the numbers that so I gave you the testing numbers. Um, the number of tests that we did in my in uh, that was twelve seven. Right, 1270, um, 537 were positive. Those are tests. Um, as of that same date of May 15th, 1,154 people um, tested, of which 545 were positive. So that sounds like you've tested people more than one. Some people you've tested more than once. Is that is that sometimes? Right? Yep. Right. In in again in some in some of our testing strategies, we have done repeated sweeps, um, and and again our strategies continue to change as we understand better the both the technology and the yield of the, the laboratory work, as well as the understanding of the virus. Okay, are you testing every new admission that enters DOC custody? We are now. You are now, okay. And then, so how many tests on average per day are you, the CHS giving? Uh, so we only started, recently started uh, at the end of April on testing universally all new admissions. Um, I'm sorry, what was the question? How many tests? How many tests per day? So I might just jump in. So yes. the tests that we've actually done per day have been very variable during the course of this epidemic. Uh, many of the tests that we do are driven by symptoms of COVID, which in turn is driven by the prevalence of the disease and the epidemic curve. And it's important to point out that the epidemic curve has declined very dramatically. So for example, there were times, days when we saw over 30 fevers in the system recorded on a given day, and most of those would represent new cases of COVID. Uh, today, we're back down to our baseline level of fevers, which is closer to zero to five a day. Um, so the number of tests has, has changed, and we're trying to be as strategic as possible about which populations we, we test, 
and to go where the most risk is, which right now is in the new admission population. Okay, so let's you you touched on this, but what is a specific criteria used to determine between both staff and an incarcerated person about who gets tested? So symptomatic criteria have been present throughout. Um, and those have shifted as the guidance from CDC and DOHMH has shifted, uh, as well as, as Dr. Yang mentioned, targeted strategies towards uh, asymptomatic screening. So symptomatic individuals, but new admissions too, right? So we have symptomatic individuals, new admissions getting tested, and then is there any other categories beyond that? Is any, any, you said something about asymptomatic, but when would an asymptomatic person get tested? So, yeah, so again, for vulnerable populations, right. during the course of the, of the epidemic that we saw, uh, there were different points in time when we implemented those strategies. Okay. I mean, I, I should just point, if I, if I may, um, also that, that uh, COVID hit, hit the jails before testing was actually even available. So we were working without that, that, that technological advancement and assistance. I mean, the minute test, laboratory testing was available, we, we began to use it. Um, but, you know, we, Dr. McDonald and team were, were ahead of this. Uh, Ms. Martell, every, everybody's looking at, at what data and tools we did have, which includes monitoring fever and symptoms. Clearly by, you know, 12 weeks later, everybody's understanding is greater in terms of what the, the meaning of having a symptom or not a symptom or what a symptom is um, continues to change. Do you think you have enough tests today to let to uh, accommodate your testing needs? Yes, yes, we do. Okay. Do you have, okay, thank you. Are you doing temperature screening, even absent tests? We, we screen um, for symptoms, yes, among people who are obviously asymptomatic and exposed, definitely with DOC, um, I think the commissioner mentioned this, um, together launched a, a program to screen. Uh, we ask our own staff to screen themselves, um, but we also screen people before they come into the facilities, DOC does, and with us. We okay, so if, I, if I'm a staff member showing up to work, I'm getting my temperature taken and my symptoms evaluated, Some is it a verbal examination, and then sure. I'm also getting my temperature taken, is that? Is that yeah. correct? Yeah, okay. I, don't, I don't know if Commissioner wants to say anything, but yes. Okay. Um, for for uniform staff, for instance, if they get, uh, if they have symptoms and they go quarantine, what is the criteria by which when they return for to work and what is the, do they get a follow-up test given to them to determine whether they still have it? What happened, what, what is the process for a, an individual as a staff member who has symptom, or let's say test positively, what is the process by which they would return to work? So I would um, defer that question to FTC Villalona, who oversees our health management division. Sure. Hello, um, good afternoon, and thank you, thank you for the question. So if a staff member uh, of any type, whether it be uniform or non-uniform, um, uh, has is calling in sick related to COVID-19, they would call our health management division and um, report sick, report their symptoms. We would track them uh, via our sick codes. There are specific sick codes based on the uh, symptoms that the staff member is uh, exhibiting. At that time, they would be told to stay home and self-quarantine um, pending them being able to uh, either get a, a, uh, a test performed or for their symptoms to subside. Uh, the doctors at our health management division will um, be guided by documentation from the employee's uh, uh, primary care physician and um, they would um, provide a, uh, the results of their COVID tests if they uh, um, were to uh, receive one. Um, well, let's say I, they test positive. I test positive. I am, I say to you, I'm not feeling well. You, I go take a test. I've come up positive. I'm an officer or a staff member. I mm -hmm. test positive. What happens now? I'm told, I assume I go home, I quarantine. Right, so I can tell you 
that um, I tested positive. And so um, my interactions and everyone else's interactions with HMD are that when you receive your positive test, you notify our health management division, you are assigned to a doctor, that doctor tracks your symptoms, you um, are in contact with that doctor who tracks your, your progress until the point that you no longer um, are exhibiting symptoms and you are cleared to return to work or receive some type of medical documentation from your um, healthcare provider. Um, those re uh, do that is documented with HMD and you are given a return to duty date once you are uh, free of symptoms for the established uh, period of time per medical guidelines. So I need a doctor to clear me to go back to work. Uh, right? So there have, not, not in every case, right? Just because there are certain doctors who, uh, we have come across doctors who refuse to um, provide a written note uh, because they're not physically, as we all know during this time period, people are using, uh, are going through telehealth so it's teledoc or it's a virtual. So there have been a very limited uh, occasions where the staff member reports to um, HMD. And so in those instances, extra precautions have been taken. But the- Is, is there a minimum amount of days if I test positive that I'm off duty? So I believe um, the, that it's seven days from the initial symptom or three days without any symptoms is all the medical guidelines. I thought it was 10, but okay. Um, and then do I get a test? I don't get a test at, uh, for, I don't CHS or otherwise, I don't get a test to reconfirm whether my symptoms, or I mean, reconfirm whether I've cleared the test, cleared the... the. To my knowledge, there is no requirement for a secondary test. Okay. And do those sick days, are, are sick days used? I assume there's an allotment of a sick days an individual can have. Uh, does, does that count against their sick days if you are tested for COVID? So... We're talk, I'll answer the question in, in two parts. The first part is uniform staff. Uniform staff uh, have what we like to call in general terms, unlimited sick. Uh, so uniform staff, if they test positive or have their COVID case documented, documented at HMD, those uh, days will not count towards uh, the, uh, any potential sanctions or discipline related to um, excessive use of sick leave. And if it's a non-uniform person who has called the entire health management division, they will not be, uh, their sick time, which they accumulate, uh, will not be deducted uh, based on having reported a, a COVID uh, um, illness. Okay. I just want to make sure we are not asking somebody to go back to work when they, or to feel compelled to go back to work based on their uh, uh, any policy that the city has, I, if they are presenting symptoms or feeling sick or not cleared it, I, I think it's important that we do know we're not having any policy that compels them to go back to work. No, absolutely not. And I can and I can say that if anything, our health management division is being extra cautious um, because if we introduce someone who is still exhibiting symptoms, we only uh, create the potential for more people to contract the disease, which is absolutely not what we want. Okay, um, this may be. CHS, can you tell us which diagnostic, which COVID test you're, you're using right now? Our PCR-based testing is via our uh, longstanding lab contract or bioreference. Okay. Um, and are you doing antibody tests as well? We are starting those today, uh, yes. Okay. Um, and um, is there other plans for contract tracing or any other plans for expanded testing in the near future? So I think our focus, as we discussed, is moving towards the new admissions where we're seeing the, the largest positivity rate, um, as well as the antibody testing, which will be an additional tool that will allow us to have uh, very detailed contact tracing as a, a, a new normal as we have new cases more sporadically in the future. And um, how, what you, with the new emissions, what percentage of new emissions are uh, testing positive? Okay. Approximately 7% uh, last check. We'll, we'll get that for you. 7%? What's the average in the state? It's probably about 1%, right? 2%? 
yeah, if, it was like nine percent so far. But again, we've only begun the intakes. Yeah, it depends recently. on exactly what period of time you look, but I I think it's in the single digits yeah. or thereabouts. Yeah. But that is a high number relative to comparatively, is it? Isn't that fair to say relative to the general population? Yes, that's correct. At this point, it is. But again, you know, for for the concentrated number, of, we're assuming community transmission, right? Which is why we're focusing on new admissions. They're the people who are most likely to be um, introducing the virus to to the people who have been in, in custody for a while, um, and and the fact that we're universally testing everybody who comes into the jail system is not something that's being done outside in the city of New York. So again, our more aggressive testing strategies, even from the beginning, make it very hard to make comparisons with the rest of the city of New York. Um, the rest of the city, it's it's not. As aggressive testing, it's not universal by any means. It's not available across the board. It's not, you know, it's, this is not being offered to every every 8.5 million people in the city. Um, so, so, so it's a. I just say that as a cautionary word. No, oh, I I totally totally understand. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Just a few more questions, and I want Councilor Lansman uh, uh, give out. I know the colleagues feel that I have an opportunity. Can you just give us numbers? How many people in custody are currently hospitalized for COVID-19? Uh, let's see, between, we have an average on a day, we've had in single digits less than eight people. Um, between March 25th and May 15th, we had 34 people who were hospitalized at some point. Between 34, between which dates? March 15th? March 25th and May 15th. Okay. And how many are there today? We don't, we'll have to get, I'll have to get that to you. Okay. How many people have, okay, you gave us that number. Uh, how many people in custody are currently on ventilators? None that I know of. I, I don't know. We have, we have to check. Okay. Well, is, that, is, that number really, maybe. No, sorry. Good. Yeah. These are, these. Well, we need to check with our our sister um, hospital our hospital. It's okay. whose care we transfer people. We we would like to know maybe um, since the beginning of the pandemic how many folks have been put on ventilators if that's available. Uh, my last question, and then I I'll hand it over. Um, just in terms of how for I'm going to come back, but uh, just for now. Um, just, just walk us through what happens when, and this, maybe this is for DOC, but when someone is tested positive uh, after having already been in the general population, in terms of housing and testing, where are they sent? How long are they quarantined for? Do they go back to their original housing? If so, how long after they're separated? Can you just walk us through what happens if um, I am in, if I was in general population and I tested positive, what would happen in terms of my housing? Mm -hmm. So I will start for DOC. Uh, I just want you to know that we have a conversation with CHS when that occurs. And then I'll let Chief Jennings speak to how housing decisions are made. Hi, good afternoon, how are you? Hi there. Um, so, good. Um, I would first like to thank you for the moment of silence for all of the staff uh, and persons in custody in which we lost, because I think for all of us who were not infected, we have all been affected by this deadly virus. Um, and so uh, I think at the onset, there was a lot of collaboration with CHS and to talk about how best to house. So we worked with them and um, we partnered up with MACJ and also NYPD, whereas uh, there were two community courts that were opened up to actually have all persons coming through uh, be arranged via video conferencing at one in Red Hook and one in um, Manhattan. Um, and all of those persons who were arraigned there and screened, they were either brought right into uh, our West facility, uh, CDU unit, or the facility EMTC in which we opened up to house uh, all persons male coming into custody that were either suspected or uh, positive with the COVID. And so, for all new admissions that were asymptomatic, uh, MDC became the facility in which we would house all of those persons there. Um, and so they were there for approximately 14 days until they were cleared by uh, CHS and then they were properly housed. And so for anyone who are already in our system um, in general population or any other housing, once uh, CHS made the notification, 
uh, we went out and we actually went to the housing areas to make sure that uh, the persons in custody as well as staff were made aware as to what was going on and we issued personal protection masks and that person was either transferred um, to EMTC or West facility and then the house would be placed on quarantine um, and they were notified as to what the protocols would be. So that's how the housing plan came about. Okay, so the answer to that is if an individual is tagged, just a short, to cutting this a little bit, if an individual was tested positive, EMTC and West facilities became the places where those individuals would go, and then their housing unit would be quarantined. And today, MDC is being used for all new admissions. Is that correct? Asymptomatic. Asymptomatic. If you're symptomatic and you're a new admission, you go where? To EMTC and- you Go directly to EMTC or West facility. Right, okay. So the Manhattan Detention Facility, how many people are in MDC today? Uh, we have 504. Just right around 500. 504, I mean, believe that. 504 are the new admissions uh, since you've started doing that that are asymptomatic in the Manhattan right. detention. Okay. Um, I'm going to I'm gonna um, hand it over to Councilmember Lansman, but come back um, to uh, uh, questions. I, I just want to touch on one topic that you came up before I had one more question, so, so I apologize. Um, you know, the mayor had a few weeks ago, you know, commented on the 24 hour tours, calling them a mistake. I, I don't think anybody here is going to defend that policy. I, I would like to know if there have been changes to that have been or directives that put in changes or directives that put in place to ensure that no individual staff member is being asked to work 24 hours in the middle of a pandemic. Can you share with us what changes have been made? So um, at the height of the pandemic, we had a uh, staff out sick rate of approximately 34%. Unfortunately, there, there were many staff who were working uh, double tours because um, we did not consolidate housing units as would have been not only fiscally prudent, but also um, increasing our ability to uh, put staff where they needed to be we kept those housing units open according to our housing strategy to minimize the impact of the virus transmission. And so unfortunately, there were some times, very few, where people went into a third tour. That was um, uncovered, it was discovered, and it has been remediated. And since it was brought to light, there have been no reoccurrences of anyone going in through a triple tour. That has been eliminated. And um, I, w I will agree, there's no, there's no one in this room, there's no one in this agency who will defend that. Um, and, and we are committed to moving forward with that not ever happening again. Thank you. Um, uh, uncon I mean, it feels unconsciousable in the middle of a pandemic to ask somebody to work three tours, even if even a second tour feels difficult, but I understand that's practice, but a third tour feels uh, uh, unconscionable to me, to me, but I, I do appreciate that that being changed and uncovered. Um, I'll hand it over to Councilmember Lansman for questions and then we'll go to members. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Commissioner, I, I wanna understand the, um, the testing and, and the, the cumulative uh, positive uh, numbers. So if, if, I, if I heard correctly, it's, 1,270 tests have been administered to um, detainees, and 537 of those came back positive. That's the that's the cumulative number. Do I have that right? Are you asking CHS? Whoever can answer, so, can answer that's fine. Correct. So as of May 15th, 1,270 tests, 537 were positive. All right. So that's a 42% positive rate. That's an extraordinary number. But before we get into that, can somebody tell me, either the commissioner or CHS, why it took weeks and weeks to get us that information? I'm concerned whether or not you don't have systems in place, you know how many uh, people in your custody have tested positive for COVID-19, or was it some effort to um, uh, conceal from the council and the public the uh, number of people who tested positive because it would call into question 
um, how uh, good a job the, the department was doing uh, in protecting people. Can you tell me why it took so long to get that simple number? Uh, we, we, it's a correctional health number. Um, we have systems, we are highly data driven. Um, we track, you know, even before there was laboratory testing available, we used every tool in our, and all our data systems to identify people who were at risk or were sick and needed to be protected and shielded from COVID. It is not for a lack of data system. We report daily to the state commission on correction and we report daily to the New York City Board of Correction. The New York City Board of Correction, we really appreciate their service to us by posting our data for us um, so that the public can see that. Um, there has been concern, and we have said that, we have said this to the New York City Board of Correction and to the State Commission on Correction um, with, 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 with caution about how our numbers are interpreted. Again, um, the more you test, the more you will find. We have an aggressive testing, 4.3 times more aggressive than the City of New York. Um, and, and, and there was concern about the comparative prevalence that people were going to draw conclusions. But that didn't stop us from reporting daily data to the board and to the commission, and the board posts it for us. Well, I, I don't want to speak for the board. They're going to have an opportunity to, to testify, yeah. but I don't think I'm out of bounds in saying that they, too, were very frustrated in not being able to get the cumulative data that um, we were seeking as well. So I, I, not to belabor the point, and I don't want to spend more time litigating why it is that we couldn't get data that we wanted but you can assure me that you do, in fact, know how many people have been tested and how many people have tested positive, and, and you, you've had the ability to know that for some time. It's part of our patient management. May not be in a, in a format that, that suits everybody, but it, it, it allows us to manage the, the clinical care that we provide. Okay. Let me ask you about the testing, and I apologize if I'm, if I'm going over some things that, that uh, Council Member Powers may have asked in a, in a different, better way. Um, the, the current test that you're giving to new admissions, how long does it take to get a result? About 24 hours. About 24 hours. And, and can you tell me, what's your understanding of, of how long a person um, uh, uh, might take from the time that they've been exposed to COVID-19 to actually develop enough of uh, the virus to test positive uh, for it? Uh, you know, the details of viral transmission are changing quickly uh, and our understanding thereof. Um, typically, symptom onset can occur within, within a range of 14 days, most commonly around five days. Uh, the time to onset of PCR positivity would be less than that five-day window in general, uh, usually two to three days, um, based on the latest data that I've seen. And during those two to three days, if for, for if, let's say I, I, I was someone who was in the three-day category, I'm exposed to it, and it's not until day three that I have enough of the virus that a test would, would test me as positive. During those three days, Am I um, uh, capable of infecting other people with the virus? During the days prior to test positivity after a point of exposure? That's yeah. what you're asking? No, that, that's not our understanding. Okay. All right, so um, you test everyone who's coming in, you get the test results um, back in, 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 in 24 hours. Um, what is the... Um, understanding of the, the, the accuracy of, of that test? The, the PCR-based testing has fairly good test characteristics. As you know, no test used in medicine is perfect, uh, but in general, we quote a sensitivity of approximately 90%. Um, there are various estimates in the literature, uh, but that's generally what we consider in our minds. So um, someone comes in, they're newly admitted, they will get tested. If they have um, COVID positivity, I think that's the term you, you used, um, you will know within 24 hours, uh, in, in about 90% of the, the, the cases, if someone um, has 
been exposed and they are going to develop uh, COVID positivity, um, but, but they're in that one, two, potentially three day window of the test, that test is gonna come back negative. Uh, am I getting that right? Yes, I mean, you're raising an important limitation of PCR-based testing, that it's really only a point in time. And so testing is a very important part of the strategy, but it can't be the entirety of a strategy uh, because we know that uh, it only gives you information about that moment. Excellent. And, and um, although I'm not a, a, a doctor or a medical professional, um, I, I did have a, a a very productive uh, conversation with someone from the Department of Health who explained all that to me. And so that Chairman Powers and I um, arrived at the, the, the conclusion that the only way to truly ensure that somebody who is newly admitted to Rikers is not going to potentially infect other people at Rikers is to quarantine, segregate, isolate, each new admission for at least a period of 10 days. I know that there's a 14 day potential incubation period. I'm advised by the Department of Health that that's really the outer limits of science, practically a 10 day incubation period. And so can you tell me, are you um, isolating, segregating, quarantining new admission for 10 full days irrespective of whether or not that test comes back positive or negative. Because as you observe, that test is only a moment in time. Some percentage, some percentage of individuals who test negative, in fact, will have the ability, the capacity to infect other uh, inmates and staff uh, for potentially up to 10 days. So thank you, that, that's a great, great question, or, 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 or uh, thank you. Um, I think Chief of Department Jennings um, and, and or Commissioner Brand mentioned this, uh, working in concert together, the two agencies have created new admission housing where people who, who test results are pending, they all, everybody is, is, is housed together, in fact, quarantined together. Well, that's fine for the people whose test results are, are pending. So for a period of 24 hours, they are, they are segregated. <clears throat> but as we just went through, um, unless I'm getting something wrong, some percentage of new admissions will test negative even though they are positive, either because their um, uh, COVID positivity uh, time period has not, has not uh, expired or because approximately 10% of those uh, negative test results are just flat out wrong. So why are we exposing the rest of the population at Rikers Island or the rest of the population and whatever units these individuals are sent to after their 24 hour quarantine period, rather than fully quarantining and isolating them for the full 10 days. So I just, I, I just want to clarify that we are, we're not using that test to release them from that new admission housing. So we do, we do keep them together for longer than that. Of course, each, individual situation that has to be handled on a case-by-case -case basis. So there are other considerations, whether they're clinical considerations, such as comorbid mental illness, uh, that have to be taken into account. Uh, but the test is not used as the sole factor in uh, moving someone to general population. But, but let me understand, let's understand, let me understand. When you say new admission housing, those are all the people who were newly admitted after that housing was, was, was set up, if I'm not mistaken, and, and more to the point, that housing includes people who themselves have passed through 10 days since their admission, have shown no uh, symptoms, and who are uh, virtually uh, certainly not uh, COVID-19 positive. So those people are vulnerable to being um, exposed by someone who has been admitted, whose COVID positivity has not yet lapsed, or who is in the, the pool of 10% of, of negative tests that are, uh, in fact, COVID positive. Chair Lanson, this is Brenda Cook, Chief of Staff. Let me see if I can try and clarify your question and provide information. 
So if I understand your question correctly, you could possibly be asking whether or not we're putting people, why we aren't putting people in a 24-hour lockdown in a cell situation for 10 days. Is that is that what you're asking? Because you, you want them to have no access no. to anyone? Well, no. In, in, in two, okay, because we're not doing one. that. And I was going to clarify that we aren't doing that for a lot of reasons because... Well, I, that's, not, that's not what I was asking. You asked yeah. me that because I was asking. So, okay, so I wanted to clarify that. So what we are doing is um, all of the housing units at uh, the Manhattan Detention Center are celled housing units. So everyone who lives there has a single occupancy cell. Um, when people come in new admission, the new admission uh, designation, and there is designated new admission housing for an extended period of time beyond the, the one to three days that you've been talking about. So those folks will live in a new admission housing pending testing and including post the, the outcome of their testing, which is what uh, Dr. McDonald was referring to. As a general rule, we have been limiting the rehousing or the movement of anyone in our custody unless necessary for clinical reasons or for safety and security reasons throughout this pandemic. And so those who are living at MDC, when they come in as a new admission house, into a new admission house with others who are newly admitted, they stay there for an extended period of time. In fact, we have opened up additional new admission housing at uh, MDC, including up to as of today, because we are opening up new houses as opposed to continuing to our, what would be our prior operational practice, which is to have people in new admission housing for just a handful of days and then move them in 72 hours and then move them to a different house. So we have modified all of our operations with the principle of containment. And so limiting the movement and the exposure of additional people to, to, to new people in custody has definitely guided our practices with respect to housing operations and guidance from clinical so, uh, professionals at CHS. Right. So here's, <clears throat> here's my, my concern and my question. I'm newly admitted to Rikers. <clears throat> I take my test, I'm negative. 10 days pass, 14 days pass, no symptoms. I don't have COVID-19. I am still in that new admission unit and another guy is coming in and he may have COVID-19 and he may expose me to COVID-19 because the test that you're giving him, 10% of the time, it's gonna give a false negative and some percentage of people coming in, some percentage of the guys coming in behind me are gonna not be COVID positive or have COVID positivity at the time that their test is taken. So I don't want to make up a statistic, whether it's 10%, 15%, I don't know what the right number is, but certainly some percentage of people who are coming in after 14, 15, 20 days after I came in are going to be in a position to infect me because even though I'm a new admission relative to, to, to the general population, I am still stuck with potentially COVID-19 positive people because those people are not being isolated for the 10, 14 days, or really will take 10 days that would certainly definitively determine that they're not able to infect anyone else, including their fellow new admission housing unit. Yeah, I think that I think the challenge with your hypothetical, um, sir, is that as uh, Dr. McDonald identified, um, it presumes, uh, as Dr. McDonald identified, was not the proper uh, approach. Uh, it, your hypothetical presumes that testing is our only strategy. And so in addition to um, testing as a strategy to identify and um, minimize the, and contain uh, the exposure and the spread, you know, we obviously have robust um, sanitation protocols. We have uh, PPE distribution for both people in custody and our staff. We have um, other housing strategies, um, including the identification of individuals, um, you know, who've lived in a house who are in fact asymptomatic, um, but have been exposed. And then we have additional uh, operations with respect to the uh, limitations uh, for those housing designations that are guided by uh, and directed by CHS and only lifted um, at the direction of CHS. And so it's a multi 
layered, um, complex approach, of uh, which testing is, is obviously, as Dr. Yang has described, robust and important, but um, but not our singular approach. And and I'm and, it, and I'm not going to I'm not going to sit here and tell you that uh, that it, it is perfect because obviously um, you know absent you know absolute isolation of every person from every person forever. Uh, you know, there's always a risk of uh, introduction, uh, you know, of a person um, in custody or a staff member or, or across each other um, to to a to a very very um, virile and uh, deadly disease. Um, let me just ask two more questions or categories of questions, but but briefly, um, what uh, um, accommodations and mechanisms have been put in, in place for uh, uh, detainees to be able to communicate? Uh, easily with their with their counsel. I'll let um, Chief Jennings respond to that. Yes. So um, one of the things that we've done is that uh, we have added uh, additional uh, units to each facility to be able to allow persons in custody to uh, do visit. Uh, via Skype for the attorneys and or the courts. And currently today, we have approximately 55 units totally uh, operational. And, and, and we have, and we have uh, access to the telephones, um, in addition to the fact that uh, personal calls in the department have been free, uh, the calls to attorneys are, are exempted um, from any phone uh, limits, and they can call their attorneys as frequently as they like. And those rooms are are, are private and, and confidential and, and uh, someone can speak uh, candidly to their, their attorney without fear of being overheard? Yes, they are. My last question, um, since you mentioned phone, I was gonna just pick one example from the Board of Corrections uh, audit and review that found um, the problems with with the actual implementation of a number of these uh, safety mechanisms. Um, but one, for example, uh, found that uh, across 45 instances of phone use, the phone was cleaned before use only three times. Um, and, and it was cleaned apparently uh, with a wipe uh, of a cloth or, or a sponge. Um, listen, it's a big operation. Um, thousands of people in a confined uh, environment. Um, but what, Commissioner, I, I want to ask you, you personally, because you know we haven't seen a lot of you. Um, and you know what? If if the job's getting done, I I don't need you to to be out there and. Uh, front and center necessarily. Um, but can you tell us what are you doing, you personally, to make sure that these operational changes that reach you at the level of a, of a, of a, of a conference room and a, or a memo, that they are actually happening? How are you able to, to in a hands-on leader way, able to make sure that that these these operational changes are happening. So um, I personally tour the jails. So I'm not sure what you mean that you haven't seen me out there. That could be in front of the press, but I've been busy in the jails and I tour with my wardens and I tour with my deputy commissioner and I review audit protocols. I talk with staff. I've talked with people in our custody to make sure that everyone is aware of um, how to protect themselves as much as possible against the spread of this disease. I find that when I do talk to folks that, um, that they're, not, they're not concerned that they don't have things available to them. Uh, some of the time they just, they forget to use it. So I have seen um, the Virex and the sponges, the, the buckets of that available to people in custody near the phones. Some people choose not to use them. Some people choose to use a sock to cover a phone or to use a t-shirt. And, and that's not um, abnormal in a, in a correctional facility. That was occurring even before 
this pandemic um, came through our jails. Um, with regard to the BOC audit that you mentioned, that was um, 12 days in mid-April, and we have um, significantly increased our, our audit response and our, um, our processes. And so as people become more aware of how they can protect themselves, they're using it better. Um, I frequently see uh, people in custody not wearing their masks, and I talk to them about wearing their masks. They have them, they're around their chin, but they're not wearing them. And so a lot of it is reinforced education by staff who are working every day and by when our leaders are walking through the facility to make sure people know what they have available to them and use it to their advantage. If you would like um, additional information, I'll have uh, Deputy Commissioner Feeney talk about the audits and what's available to everyone in the housing units. No, I, I, I know, thank you. I, I just want, and I'll close with this. Um, uh, you know, you have one of the hardest jobs in, in government. Um, thankless job. Uh, the situation at Rikers is so, so fundamentally and inherently bad that we're, we're, we're shutting it down and building new jails. Um, and, and I, you know, I just want to have a level of confidence. I've been reached out by constituents, family members of the incarcerated, correct, many correction officers. You know, they want to know that you're out there, that you're leading. Um, and it's true, we haven't seen you, as you put it out in front in the press, and, and, and I don't, I'm not saying you need to be. Um, I just want to know that, that, you know, you're handling this, that you're, that you're, you're leading this effort in, in as much of a hands-on way um, as, as possible. So, um, so I appreciate your answer, and I hope we can all you know, get through this together. Uh, that's all I have, Keith. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're going to move now on to council member questions. Thank you for everybody's patience with uh, with us. We are long winded collectively, but uh, I know I am at least. But um, thank you guys. We'll go move on to questions, and a lot will take it in the order that they raise their hands. Thank you. I will now call on council members in the order that they have used the Zoom raise hand function. If you would like to ask a question and you have not yet used the Zoom raise hand function, please raise it now. Council members, please keep your questions to three minutes. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and I will let you know when your time is up. You should begin once I have called on you and the Sergeant has announced that you may begin before delivering your testimony. First, we'll hear from Council Member Rivera, followed by Council Member Holden. Council Member Rivera? Time starts now. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for allowing me these questions. Thank you all for being here and for your service. And um, it's never easy to lose colleagues, to lose people, New Yorkers. Um, so I wanna just thank the chairman for allowing that moment of silence as well. Um, I, I only have a couple minutes for questions, so I'll keep them very brief. I wanna start with you, uh, Dr. McDonald. Um, I thought you made a very honest, uh, and courageous statement via Twitter. You said you cannot change the fundamental nature of jail. We cannot socially distance dozens of elderly men living in a dorm. And he, he urged the district attorneys and courts to let out as many people as you possibly can. And I quote, do you think that there are still additional individuals that could be released in order to uh, keep more of uh, I would say members of the DOC and of course people who are detained and incarcerated safe? So I see as a doctor, the medical side of that equation uh, and what I saw the city do um, with many different partners was uh, respond to the urgency of the situation. Um, and I, I think that as Dr. Yang mentioned, we are certain that we saved many lives through the variety of efforts and uh, depopulation of the jail decarceration was a critical effort, probably the most important one. Uh, so I feel very good about how the city responded to, the, to that particular question. 
And I understand, I understand that maybe we've asked you a, a couple times in different ways, but I just feel at this point, our executive leadership has kind of failed in that way in terms of being able to release people with kind of a flick of a pen. But I will move on to uh, some of the staff there. So the board has found relatively low rates of people in custody with PPE. And I just wanna make sure that CHS is uh, what efforts you've made to provide public health education to people in custody to encourage mask use and social distancing and what else you've done for those detained or incarcerated uh, to stay safe in terms of PPE. I mean, it's, it's part of our, our um, patient education and information. Again, it, 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 we, have, we have touch points throughout the criminal justice process from pre arraignment on intake at, at every clinical encounter including telephonic, which is a new thing under, under COVID that we did, um, and on discharge. I'm gonna ask you about telehealth in one second. Um, I just wanna give you two questions since I have to ask everything in the three minutes, but um, I wanna ask how many currently in custody have recovered from COVID-19? The number currently in custody who have tested positive includes recovered patients, but we don't know how many. And then in terms of time, if I could just finish my thought, Chairman. Uh, we've heard complaints about the telehealth number often ringing with no answer, and we've heard this complaint with regards to both 311 calls and calls to sick call. There's also the nighttime shift and being responsive. So can you talk a little bit about the telehealth and what CHS staff is providing and when they're expected to answer the telehealth line? And if you could just give me the, the custody, uh, the numbers of people in custody who have recovered, I would greatly appreciate it. And thank you both for being so gracious with the time. Right. Um, I will need to get back to you on the numbers of people um, who have recovered. I do some, some calculations. Um, the, the, the two lines that we stood up specifically related to COVID was um, a, a telephone line. And this is, again, the first time that people who can call us directly from their housing units. Um, that, that, is, that is unprecedented and that it's only been possible through the partnership with DOC. Um, we have a line for people who are asymptomatic but have no exposures to COVID to call us um, to report symptoms that they may have, some concerns that they may have. We also established a mental health line uh, for people who are either symptomatic or confirmed to have COVID to talk with any of our staff, our, our mental health staff about some of their concerns or anxieties about the disease or, or what it means to them. Um, those, those operate, um, the mental health line operates from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m and asymptomatic reporting um, from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, we also uh, have made, made known the survival advocacy uh, line for people um, who have been victims of, of uh, sexual assault, and that runs from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Well, thank you. That's all the time I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have Council Member Holden. Time starts now. Thank you, Chairs, and uh, thank you all. Nice to see you again virtually. It's not the, it's not the greatest, but uh, it's, it's all we have. Uh, I, I guess this question is for Mark J. Um, for inmates, inmates involved with the early release, how many had no home to go to? In other words, what percentage of those who were granted early releases were ultimately sent into the homeless shelter system. Hi, so we, uh, I don't offhand have the number of individuals who were homeless, who were granted uh, the discharge into the 6A program. But what I can say is that we provided hotel rooms uh, for that population. So. We have hotel rooms that are available now for anyone who is being released from Rikers Island and doesn't have a place to go where they can safely quarantine. We have hotel rooms that are available both for people who are identified as having a uh, coronavirus where they can be in one of the specific designated isolation sites. And then we also have hotel rooms available for people who are uh, asymptomatic or who have not been identified as having COVID-19 where they can go and have an individual room. And so actually one of the, this program was started uh, 
around the exact same time as we began the 6A program so that any individual who was identified as being a city sentenced individual who was being discharged into this 6A program would be able to be placed in a hotel and we have reentry providers on site as well as those same linkages to the uh, medical services that CHS was describing in terms of the follow-up care. That's good to know. So nobody was released into the congregate shelter system because that, that would be like you stepping backwards actually. Yes, so we have hotel rooms that are available for everyone. I will say that when we have, when it has been made aware to us that someone was released and did not have a place to go after the fact, we made sure that we were able to make a referral point back. So uh, the mechanism is in place for that. Thank you so much for that. Um, I guess this is for the Department of Correction. Um, with the proposed borough-based vertical jail model, do you see a potential problem now with the, the you know, coronavirus spread um, that there might be some issues as opposed to, um, uh, let's say a rebuilt Rikers, would you have more indoor and outdoor space? It would be hard right now to make a judgment call on, on the inside of the building design because none of that has been decided. But I think what we will be doing is uh, using what we've learned in our housing strategy and how we've contained this virus so far into those discussions as we look at the inside of those buildings. All right, Chairs, can I just ask one quick question? Um, I, I, um, I, I believe that the uh, uh, correction officers got the mess around April 3rd. Um, why, did the, um, why did COBA have to sue to get the PPEs? Yeah, you can answer that. So they did not have to sue to get the PPEs. We were delivering um, masks in early March. I believe it was March um, 11th, before it was even um, recommended. And um, I can't speak for why COBA felt the need to go to court, but we were already distributing PPEs prior to that court action. Okay, thank you, Chairs. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Council Member Ampli Samuel, followed by Council Member Lewis. Time starts now. Um, hi, everyone. I don't want to waste anyone's time. Um, usually, by like two hours in, we've um, you know had the opportunity to hear from the different agencies, and so I ask uh, my questions were all related to our juvenile detention centers and focused um, directly to ACS, and so. Um, I guess I'll have to hold until we hear from them um, and I'll do the. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Council Member Lewis. Good afternoon. Starts now. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank Chair um, Powers mm -hmm. and for um, organizing this call. So I have two quick questions. Uh, the first question is for Angel. On April 9th, I reached out to the Department of Corrections. I got a lot of phone calls and emails from corrections officers um, that tested positive for COVID and required to go back to work. They even emailed me their um, test results. So I wanna know when did HMD implement the tracking for uniform and ununiform staffers that tested positive? And the second, let me just be quick because I know the time is limited. The second question is for DOC. So it was mentioned that tablets were made available to those that were incarcerated and 55 units were designated um, for rooms for Skype and telephone phone purposes. But I wanted to know how often um, will the uh, incarcerated population be able to provide, be able to um, have visits, video visits with their family members? Um, that wasn't answered in some of the uh, questions that the chairs mentioned. And what's the plan moving forward? Do you, are you gonna expand capacity? Is it gonna be more than 55 units? What does the technological um, aspect of this look, look like moving forward? Thank you. What angel will answer first? I will, I'll answer the first question, which was related to HMD. We began tracking both uniform and non-uniform staff at HMD at the very beginning of March. I believe it was around the 6th of March, but I could get you the exact date. So what happened with those officers as of April 9th that were still required to go back to work, even though they tested positive? So um, 
without speaking to the specific situations of the individuals that reached out to you, I can say that, as I previously mentioned, every one of our uniform and non-uniform staff, um, whether they test positive or not, are assigned to a doctor who tracks their progress and they are um, cleared to return to work when they are no longer symptomatic. Um, and that is in consultation with their doctor based on the documentation that that employee provides. So um, if you have specific names and um, that you would like um, information on, we can um, um, speak about those um, separately, but our policy is as um, I just articulated to you and to uh, previously Chair Powers. Thank you. And to the Department of Corrections regarding capacity for video conferencing for participation uh, with family members and the incarcerated. So this is Chief Jennings speaking. Um, we have installed uh, approximately 74 kiosks uh, department wide, and we've done over uh, 3,400 actual visits, which are available for exploration. Um, one of the things that um, we looked at, and prior to this pandemic, we had always looked at of ways of increasing our visitation. And I think it's been our plan all along to do additional uh, kiosks in the housing areas, which we're looking to expand that. And even when we go back to uh, what normality will look like, where we have in-person visitations, is something that I would like to keep and also encourage because um, you know we're looking to install additional kiosks in the housing areas so that people in custody can communicate with their family because one of the things that we know is that um, having that communication really creates a more positive outcome. Um, we had the liberty of going away to Norway to look at uh, the way in which they are currently doing their processes. And when we talk about the borough-based facilities, that's one of the things we would like to see is that for persons to all have tablets or a kiosk in their living area so that if it's in your cell, they will have the capability of doing uh, both video visitation as well as uh, texting uh, to the family members where they have capabilities of doing short videos for different, you know, like uh, uh, activities that's happening so that they're able to participate in those, um, as well as doing um, uh, actual health, telehealth visits, you know, um, social services, grievance, to be able to do those things from a tablet. So we're definitely looking um, at this opportunity to increase uh, these services to people, and it's something or vision that I've had all along. So we're just now taking advantage of that, um, and also to do the attorney visits um, so that they'll be able to have more contact uh, with their attorneys. And um, we've also been able to do court arraignments um, via the kiosk. So it's something I think that we need to take an opportunity of this technology moving forward so that we will change the way in which we do business. I look forward to seeing more on that. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we're gonna keep moving on. Um, and uh, we're gonna, I guess she, I think, Catherine Ambry Samuel had questions and we're gonna come back to with ACS on. So we'll go next, I'm sorry about that. Thank you. Next we have council member Lander. Sorry. Um, Clock starts now. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for being here and thanks chairs for convening this hearing. Um, I just wanna associate myself with the um, taking our time to think about and thank and mourn those that we've lost in, in all your agencies. And, and I also really do to correctional health services, especially both Ross to you, uh, but also Dr. Rachel Bedard, who was one of the people who really rang the alarm, alarm bell earliest and loudest for me, pushing me not only to speak out about uh, the releases that we need to do and the changes that we needed to make to do as best as possible, 
but even to get shut down earlier uh, out of a real commitment to saving the lives of patients. So uh, I'm grateful for Correctional Health Services as well as the other agencies, uh, all of you at, at this time. And I guess I'll say, you know, I wish we were going uh, further in all of these ways, having read that Board of Corrections report on the continued social distancing violations, wanting to think about who's there that doesn't need to be. We could go further, we should go further, but I will say by comparison to what I'm seeing at the state and federal uh, correctional systems, uh, I appreciate the work that is being done to have gotten our numbers down and to have changed uh, our systems as well. Um, I wanna ask two questions uh, and I'll just go ahead and ask them now and then just uh, take your answers. One is about one of the bills. Um, I wanna ask some questions about the fees. Um, I know you gave us a kind of one line we support in principle, um, but I really would like to drill down here because there was a hearing on this issue back in 2016. And I think we asked then whether you had explored with DCAS uh, free payment processing options um, that are available for other, can you guys hear me still? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry, I apologize. Um, um, uh, have you explored with DCAS free payment processing options that are available for many other city payments? If so, what's going on there? If not, can we set a deadline for getting that answer? What can you tell us about how many deposits are made each year and what New Yorkers are spending on those deposit fees? Um, and are you aware of the fact that other jurisdictions, uh, even our current vendors are charging a lot less? I was surprised to see that a $40 deposit with JPay costs six bucks in New York City, but only 275 in Kentucky. So help us understand what you've done and how we can get that done quickly. And then I just have a much larger question um, because having gotten the numbers down as far as they are and understanding what it really means to think about who needs you know, who we think we need to incarcerate and hold uh, differently in a pandemic. I'm curious, like what you started to think about that you might want to think about after this pandemic, about what we should learn about, you know, how, you know, obviously what we've heard on the other side, so to speak, from uh, the former police commissioner and even the current, the current police commissioner, kind of just without much data, throwing out the idea that some of the things that are being done jeopardize public safety. I really want to learn here. I want to see how how few people we can incarcerate. So what are we doing to learn from what we're doing to get it right going forward? And how are you thinking about building from this awful, awful pandemic to build a far more humane and just uh, criminal justice system uh, in the days after the pandemic? Thank you. So I would ask um, uh, DC Lyons to, to speak about the fees, but before I ask her to do that, I would just like to say that I've spent most of my career in corrections, um, almost 30 years, in managing risk in the community. And I think that the, um, the communication and the collaboration between all of the criminal justice agencies in the city now have come together to learn about how to do that well, that we are taking a proactive and individualized look at each person who is committed to our custody and um, looking at whether or not once they're sentenced that they could go back into the community without much risk um, and be productive. With regard to the courts and the DAs, um, we all have to work together to understand real risk in the community, risk to self, risk to others, um, and risk to public safety. So I think moving forward, we'll take these lessons that we've learned, uh, how successful this program has been, and move forward um, in collaboration with each other rather than at odds. Would you commit to giving us up, making that report and those learnings public, I guess either as part of the required re uh, legislation here or separately so that that learning you guys are doing internally, uh, I guess where you all agree and where you don't all agree, we can really see that data and have a real understanding of what we're learning? Well, I, I'm not gonna speak for Mark Trey, but they, because they're situated out of the mayor's office, they have the ability to gather all of that information. Um, and if, if they're willing to do that, I'm sure that, that they would be happy to do that. They're, they're um, putting out reports all the time with regard to information that we gather as a city and how we work together. Dana, is that, uh, can you make that commitment? Yeah, so, and, and as the commissioner said, we have been putting out uh, regular fact sheets right now. As you noted, council member, the decline that we've seen in the jail population is something that is uh, significant, impressive. The 
you know, lowest jail population since 1946. And we agree that this is a good thing and that we can learn from this. Uh, you know, we there was recently uh, an analysis and assessment put out around the 6A program that some of the nonprofit providers that are involved in the supervision components uh, released. But certainly, we will continue to work with the agencies and uh, can you know continue to share updates on both um, the uh, the data, but also you know what we plan to do in the future in terms of sustaining uh, this progress. Patricia, okay. if yes. you could handle the second part. Sure. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Council Member, for the, for your question regarding the fees. So we have not engaged ECAS in those discussions, but I'm happy to have those conversations with them and explore what options they have for us. And additionally, because the fees that are collected for the deposits related to um, banking with the commissary are outside of the correction department, meaning their fees you know, allocated to a third party vendor that we don't see, I wouldn't necessarily have that information offhand as to what has been collected um, by those vendors. Um, it's certainly questions we can explore with you, but I think, you know, now is the time to look forward and um, in the spirit of this bill, take a look at all the agreements that we do have right now and see what, um, what modifications we can make. I'm, I'm well over time, but Chair Powers, if you want to follow up on any of those uh, items, since the bill is yours, uh, I hope you will. Thank you. We'll do. We'll move when we'll keep both. Thanks. Thank you. Next, we have Council Member Yeager. Starting time. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, okay. Uh, I just, uh, my, my questions are very brief and uh, uh, Councilman Lander's questions actually touched on a little bit of uh, where I'm coming from. I am uh, co-sponsoring one of Councilman Powers bills, uh, the introduction related to the deposits and commissary accounts. And I view this um, uh, similar to how I viewed uh, a previous bill of Councilman Powers, uh, introduction 1199 which he sponsored last year and was passed uh, and it related to fees on bail. Um, I believe in a civilized society, we have the unfortunate need for a criminal justice system uh, to protect the public. And uh, it's unfortunate, but it is necessary. But that also doesn't mean that government should either profiteer or should sit idly by uh, while others profiteer off the incarceration and frankly, off of people's misery. Um, so my question really is uh, the following. Uh, I've rarely, if ever, seen an agency come before this council and say, um, hey, folks, that's a fine bill you have there. You should pass it tomorrow. And uh, with respect to this bill, you've indicated that the administration supports the intent of the bill, um, but you look forward to further discussing this with the council. Well, the council's here. The prime sponsor is here. Uh, it looks to me like, you know, my time is going to run out very soon, uh, I guess, um, as will all of our time at some point. But uh, here we are. Tell us what's wrong with this bill and what needs to be done, assuming that Councilman Powers can get in front of a keyboard today and type in a couple of syllables or comma here or there. What is it that's preventing you from saying right now, this is a good bill, you want it to pass today, tomorrow, the next day, and look forward to its implementation? What is it? Is it that if this is an outside vendor and therefore you don't control it, that's great. Does that mean that that the only, the only an outside vendor can run this? Can the city not run this program? What is so complicated about you coming in and saying, good bill, pass the bill, we'll get it done? Do you feel so I, oh, yes. So I think, uh, thank you, council member. I think the um, we have to take a look at the current agreements the city has with these vendors to understand the changes we, mean, we need to make um, to ensure we can um, achieve a deadline that's reasonable for all. So um, we have agreements that are in place with I think JPay was referenced and Western Union, and we'd have to take a look at those in consultation with Mox and the law department to see how much time it would take and the effort involved to modify them. That, let that's me, the let me, we let me ask you a question because my clock kicks away and uh, the bill is unforgiving. Um, the assuming that this JPay, um, this very great, wonderful company that is is really uh, just incredibly uh, uh, onerous in its fees uh, uh, is not the right place. 
Why can't the city just do this on its own? Of all the things that the city of New York does I'm expired. On its own, why can't the city just do this? Why can't you tell us today that you know what you're committed to doing? You're committed to talking to DCAS or talking to the Department of Finance and setting up a system where just like the city can take property tax payments, just like the city can take parking violations payments, just like the city can take a myriad of different kinds of payments and it does it every day and it's very, very good at taking payments and figuring out how to apply them. Why can't the city say we're going to do this for people? The idea that, I mean, how have you, how has the department never been offended by the notion that somebody can walk in somewhere and deposit 20 bucks and have to pay a couple of bucks to do so? I mean, I, and I'm not blaming you per se, but I'm saying, you know, I find this frequently with bills. I apologize, Mr. Chairman, if I could just have a few more seconds. I find this frequently with bills that the administration kind of doesn't even read them before you show up. You write up testimony that says, we like the intent. We look forward to working with the guy. I've, I've been in the council for two years, four months, 19 days. I can't tell you how many times I've heard the phrase, we like this bill and look forward to working with the council to make it better versus we like this bill. Here's how you make it better. Pass it tomorrow. I'm just, I just don't understand it. I'm not that smart, but I just don't get it. So council member, as I had answered the previous question, we're absolutely open to conversations with DCAS and finance to figure out a way to move forward in an amicable manner, absolutely. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Next, we will turn it back to Chair Powers. Thank you, and thank you for the comments of support, both from Councilman Yeager, Councilman Lander, and others. And I agree, we should know have no system where we're profiting, and we should have been out of this business, I think, a long time ago. But I think I thank you for echoing um, uh, support for our bill. Um, I'm gonna do a few more questions, but but as others have noted, we are uh, uh, a little time limited here. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, one is, are, are there, in terms of housing units right now, how many units are at 50% capacity and how many, today, if any, are at 100% capacity? Thank you for the question. This is Brenda Cook. Um, there's no units that, uh, that I'm aware of at, at 100% um, housing capacity. Um, the department-wide, as the commissioner mentioned in her testimony, we are uh, uh, under 50% occupancy in the department um, and in our dormitory housing where the people have in custody have the least opportunity to um, uh, self-isolate in a single occupancy um, uh, cell for uh, you know time during the day and sleep at night. Um, our dormitory housing is um, uh, is an, an average of 37 percent occupancy um, and dropping as our. Right, could, 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 just, just, just. I'm sorry to be. I don't want to be rude, but I just want to stop. You say yeah, I'm not aware of any other 100 percent. Does that mean it's possible uh, for our uh, staff? No. Not and I'm and I'm sitting here with the senior deputy commissioner Timothy Farrell, who oversees custody management. I'm sitting here with the chief of the department Hazel Jennings. Uh, we there there are no. Uh, housing units occupied at 100 percent we okay. have certain zero housing... so z the answer is zero for 100 percent how many zero. how many are at over 50 percent capacity i i don't have that um that number sitting here there are housing units that are um over 50 percent um capacity uh those would be housing units um that are uh, uh some of our therapeutic housing units like pace or caps um, could in fact be, um, you know, those are smaller housing units to begin with, and those housing units are based on clinical need. Um, and so we're not depriving people of access to a clinical need um, housing. Um, uh, those, those are closely monitored and managed um, in partnership with correctional health. Uh, there may also be um, a detox housing or other, um, again, clinical um, housing uh, for those with uh, uh, service, uh, service therapeutic needs with correctional health that I'm aware of that have occupancies that are driven by, again, patient care and need, not, um, not an arbitrary number of the number of people who could live in that house. And so there are some of those housing units. I don't have, I don't have those numbers, um, with, as was, I believe, stated uh, earlier, um, or maybe I just know it, and so I believe it was stated, but there, there are more than 230 housing units open across the department, so I just I can't recite from memory sitting here for you today um, all of those housing unit occupancies. Okay, how many are over 75%? Uh, I, I don't, I, as I said, I don't have, I don't have, I don't have that, that number. Uh, I don't have that number. 
Okay, guys, like let's get if you can if you don't mind getting us that data um, to understand how crowded or congested a particular housing units might be, that would be helpful and potentially we can get that today. Um, what what criteria is used to determine a person in custody has recovered from COVID such that they could be rehoused in a regular housing unit? Um, and are they then retested or it are or is it a what's the criteria? Is it a number of days of symptoms? Yeah, let's start there. So uh, we've generally followed the CDC non-test based criteria for the most part, although it, there is a individual case by case determination depending on where the person is likely to return to. So for example, for our vulnerable populations, we've been more conservative uh, in terms of the time frame. Um, but we feel pretty confident and all the emerging data seems to support that CDC uh, test based criteria. Non-test based criteria. Apologize. I'm not testing, but you're doing a certain amount of days and how many days is that? 10. Uh, 10 at least, depending on symptomatology. And so they're still presenting symptoms, you would not rehouse them, is that fair to say? Correct, uh, correct, yes. Okay, but then after a certain period of time, somebody's going back to the housing unit from where they originated. If they go to, they go to West facility, for instance, because they're sick and symptomatic, they are now done. They go back to, uh, they go back to their housing unit. And, and is that is that fair to say? Yes, in general. Okay, and if they were a new admission and they came in and they'd normally be going to MDC, but they're not because they have symptoms. Where are they sent after that? They're not sent to MDC, they're sent to where? Either EMTC or West facility. After, but after they, they're, stay, they're kept there after they clear symptoms? So at that point we would uh, indicate, we have systems in place to indicate to, to DOC that they uh, don't need to be in isolation status any longer. And then uh, DOC would make a determination where they would be housed unless they also had some clinical reason to be housed either in the infirmary or in a mental observation unit, for example. Okay. Um, my final questions here, um, uh, uh, just a few, and they are, and by the way, thank you, Common Yeager, for telling me how long I've been a council member. I actually wrote that down. But um, um, we, we heard, I, I think Council Member Vary asked a question earlier about, um, about tele, tele, for telephone calls, but I wanted to, this is, a, I think, a <laughs> asking question. You had previously told, I think, our committee staff that 311 and health calls are not counted towards the allotment of free telephone minutes to an individual. Um, we have heard reports of people trying to file complaints via 311, particularly health complaints, but being cut off because, before the complaint is registered. Can you share with us why that might be in light of what we've been told by staff and, um, and, and what have you done to address that? Uh, we, uh, without the uh, individual information of, of, you know, to investigate the specifics, um, again, our, it, it's it's um, it's not the it's not the uh, phone system. The phone system is not set up to uh, utilize uh, time limits and minutes for um, those free phone calls, including to 311. So we have to, you know, you have to give us the specifics, and we can investigate the specific circumstances. But the the policy in the system is is set up um, other, otherwise. Okay, so just getting on the record here, 311 and health calls should not be counted towards a daily allotment of somebody's telephone minutes. Is that correct? Okay. That's correct. Um, and then at the beginning of telehealth calls, we've heard that uh, individuals are being told that the call is being recorded. And while I understand that that's not, the staff has told us that they, you don't record these calls, um, we just want to confirm, are those calls recorded by either DOC, CHS, or any other agency or entity? No, no. The the, the telephone numbers um, that uh, CHS uses for those um, access to care have all been logged into the uh, phone system. They were logged uh, prior to the launch of the phones uh, for this purpose in March. All of those phone numbers were logged as 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 we log attorney numbers or um, clergy numbers or uh, you know medical uh, BOC DOI. They're all white, it's whitelisted, so those numbers are not. Those numbers are preset um, to when a person in custody calls any of those designated numbers, they're not recorded by the system. 
Okay. Um, do you believe that individuals understand that? Because that notice alone might prevent somebody from being forthcoming about their medical conditions or issues? I, I, I have, I have, we have made sure that the uh, persons in custody are made aware of that, and we've done that via inmate council meetings. Yeah. Okay, just wanted we, that would be a concern. And then how do you ensure that those phone calls are not recorded and stored by the third party phone provider? Uh, the, the, as I, as far as um, I'm, I'm aware of the of the system, uh, the recordings um, the, that is uh, hosted by the Department of Correction, and so there is no um, capacity for the third party phone provider to create a record and, and of a recording and store it elsewhere. It's, it's hosted by the Department of Correction on our on our servers. And do you have any agreement in your agreement with them? Is there anything that says that they are prohibited from storing? <laughs> There is. Yes. 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 Okay. Um, my last question, just is just for CHS and DOC. Can you commit? I, I, we're going to hear from the Board of Corrections. I think. Uh, can you commit to get us that information that we have asked for? Some of the data. We'll follow up with what that it might be. Can you get that, that 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 back to us within the next 24 hours to get us some of the data that we have asked for? And the board as well. Well. Is it the are you asking about the, the housing unit census? The, um, it's housing, um, it's testing. I think there's some questions we had asked earlier around. Okay, so, so both CHS and DOC, because I, I, I was not aware that you had another data request to the Department of Corrections. That's what I was confirming. Um, okay, well, we're going to add my request that we get that information back as soon as possible. Can you guys commit to getting that to us? We always, we always endeavor to get yes. you the information as quick as possible, and we'll do the same here. Okay, I'm gonna move on uh, out, of res out of respect of everybody's time and hand it over to Council for back to Council Chair Lansman. Thank you, Council Member Lansman. Um, Thanks. I want to ask uh, one last question. Um, there are issues in um, court proceedings uh, around. Uh, determining whether or not bail should be set, whether someone should be remanded um, about the safety of Rikers Island. So um, could you confirm for me that, that it's fair to say that despite your best efforts and, and, and best execution, <clears throat> that the environment on Rikers Island still is one that presents a much greater risk of infection from COVID-19 and a much greater risk for someone who might have um, an underlying medical vulnerability compared to just being out in, in the general population in, in New York City? Is that a CHS question? Probably. So I think um, it's a it's a tough question to answer at this point. I think you know, as our data shows and as our experience shows, we saw a wave of transmission uh, that was that was very marked, and that has declined very dramatically. Uh, I think that the the success that we've seen, though, as we've discussed many times. Uh, did rely on a reduction in the jail population. And so uh, we are concerned about new admissions um, and the risk will remain, absolutely. Uh, and we don't have all the answers about uh, COVID as a society. Um, so I, I think it's a, it's a tough question to answer because clearly things are much better than they were in our worst days. Uh, but uh, I would be concerned about uh, reintroduction of disease with continued new admissions, and that's where we've uh, put a lot of our focus. So, so you would agree that um, continued new admissions uh, only increases the possibility that we will go back to where we were earlier um, with a high rate of infection, and also that at least comparing the, the, the rate of infection and, and the likelihood of exposure at Rikers Island to the general public, it's much more significant in the jail setting. 
again, I think it's a, it's a complex question and it's clearly shifting. Um, but I think that our success, which we've achieved, uh, relied on a lower population. And if the population were to, to, to go back to pre-COVID-19 decarceration levels, um, we might see the, the gains that we've made at Rikers Island a slip away. Is that fair? I, I, I think it's as fair as saying that, you know, I think there's a general concern as the city, as elsewhere on this planet, consider uh, returning to what people dream of as a normal um, and will not be achieved, um, that as people reemerge or get more impatient um, and, and, and become to, and begin to um, comply less with self-isolation or, or social distancing or hygiene etiquette and attempt to reach back to what they believed and remembered as very fondly as, as normal life, um, the risk to everybody increases. It's inevitable. The virus is with us. It, it, it continues to be a shape shifter. It's, 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 a, it's something to, to have great respect for and, and, and concern about. Right. And, and, and given the higher rates of, of infection at Rikers, is it fair to say that, that that risk is much more acute when we're talking about a jail setting like the city's jails? I, th I think a congregate setting, whether it's a jail or a nursing home or assisted living, is is always a higher risk when when transmission of the virus um, requires contact, close contact, um, and can only be slowed down by separation. That is true in any congregate setting. Um, I and again, I would say that, um, with all due respect, the the concern about the numbers of people that we test, the total numbers of tests, and the positive. Are, need to be handled with caution. We we test four times more than four times more aggressively than the city of New York. The pre the prevalence can't be comparable. All right, you thank can't you very much. All right. In, sorry, unless Congressional Health Services had something to add. No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Lansman, and, and thank you to the agencies. And I, I'm sure we will. Have follow-up questions. We are having, a, as many know, here a weekly call to discuss these issues and get data and to provide oversight. Um, we're going to move on now to thank you to everybody and thank you to everybody at the department who is working tirelessly to keep people healthy and keep people safe, and as well putting yourselves at risk of uh, the same the same threat. That we, we appreciate all your time today and and your work on behalf of those in New York City. Um, we're going to move now on to the Board of Corrections. Um, uh, we're going to, I think, um, hand it over to Alana to uh, get them sworn in and get them loaded up. Thank you. I will now call on the members of the Board of Correction to testify. First, I will call on, a, on Board Executive Director Meg Egan and Board Member Dr. Cohen. For the question and answer period, we will be joined by Deputy Executive Director of Research, Emily Turner. Please raise your hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? Executive Director Egan. Yes. Dr. Cohen. Yes. Deputy Exec Executive Director Turner. Yes. Executive Director Egan, you may begin. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Powers, Chair Lanceman, and members of the Criminal Justice and Justice Systems Committee <laughs> Committees. Excuse me. My name is Margaret Egan. I am the Executive Director of the New York City Board of Correction. I am joined today by board member Dr. Robert Cohen and Deputy Executive Director Emily Turner. Chair Jennifer Jones Austin sends her regards. She had hoped to join us as well today, but unfortunately was unable. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today about the COVID response in the New York City jail system. I would like to speak to you today about the board's response and what we are seeing in the jails through our oversight work. Like all others, the New York City Board of Correction, the city's independent jail system oversight agency has been forced to quickly adapt to this new normal in response to the COVID-19 public health crisis. The board has redirected its oversight setting priorities to both monitor 
the Department of Correction and Correctional Health Services evolving COVID-19 response and facility compliance with agency plans and DOC and CHS's general operations and compliance with BOC minimum standards admit, amidst the public health crisis. Our work seeks to independently and publicly document the scope of the public health crisis in the jails and the criminal justice system's response to understand the successes and challenges and ultimately ensure that lessons can be quickly learned. At the beginning of the crisis, the board called on all criminal justice system stakeholders to reduce the population of the jail. We believe that this is one of the best tools at our disposal to minimize the transmission of COVID-19 in the jails. The board has publicly advocated for district attorneys, defenders, city officials, the New York State Department of Corrections and Community Supervision, advocates and providers to come together to release as many people as is safely possible. Since March 16th, the population has been reduced by just over 1,600 people. However, we have seen in our daily analysis that admissions are beginning to increase again. This is concerning to us and we will continue to monitor the population over time. It, as has been said, on April 1st, the board began producing daily public reports outlining DOC and CHS's response to the pandemic. These daily updates available on our website include data on the number of people currently incarcerated who are, who are confirmed or symptomatic for COVID-19, exposed but asymptomatic, DOC staff who have been confirmed, CHS staff who have been confirmed, and the number of people who have passed away in custody. We also include a full analysis of the jail population to show custody status as well as certain demographic information. We believe these daily updates are critical to provide the public, defenders, advocates, policymakers, and families with critical information on what is happening in the jails. In addition to the daily data reports, the board has developed a new crisis responsive jail monitoring program. Given our very small staff, our approach has been focused on leveraging the board's access to DOC data systems, surveillance cameras, grievance tracking system, daily sanitation supply audits, updated policies, preliminary incident reports, and complaints the board receives directly from people in custody, staff, family members, and advocates. Additionally, board members and staff have had at least weekly calls with DOC and CHS leadership. There are ob certain obvious limitations to each of these methods, but taken together, the board seeks to provide an objective assessment of the response to the crisis and the function of the jails during the crisis, while also raising issues for immediate action by DOC and CHS. Uh, based, on the guidance from, based on guidance from the mayor and DOHMH, board staff have been working remotely since about mid-March. Um, for the last week, however, we have begun to slowly, slowly reintroduce in-jail monitoring taking a very targeted and strategic approach. The board will continue to follow local guidance on agency work conditions and to reduce the risk of, of spreading COVID-19. Our oversight in the jails will be guided by the do no harm principle, meaning the board will prioritize the safety of BOC staff and the safety of all of those who work and live in the jails while planning jail inspections. On May 11th of 2020, the board issued a report on our observation of housing areas designated for confirmed COVID-19 uh, patients, systematic, sorry, symptomatic patients, and those likely exposed by asymptomatic for adherence to DOC statements and CHS guidance. We re reviewed Genetech surveillance camera footage, conducting 72 audits in 56 unique housing areas to monitor social distancing, use of PPE among staff, use of masks among people in custody, phone access and cleaning, and DOC rounding practices and cell units. Our observations found that while the majority of staff were observed wearing PPE, including masks and gloves, there were challenges with people in custody wearing masks. We do not believe that there are issues with mask availability, but we've recommended that CHS and DOC should identify and address barriers to the use of PPE for staff and people in custody and renew their efforts to educate on the importance and proper use of PPE. Um, DOHMH has advised that public health communication should be conducted by non-security staff. Another critical piece of our oversight is to understand COVID-related complaints submitted to DOC. The board is working closely with DOC's Office of Constituent and Grievance Services, OCGS, the office responsible for handling complaints. Board staff review COVID 
related complaints daily, analyze grievance data and audit complaint resolutions, regularly providing analysis and feedback to OCGS. We plan to publish our own analysis and audit findings in the future. Since March 5th, OCGS has been tracking COVID-related complaints in three categories. Environmental, um, which is the lack of access to PPE and cleaning supplies. Medical, which could be concerns about COVID-19 exposure, um, safety, and access to medical care. And staff, um, which could be complaints about DOC staff from people in custody, as well as complaints made by DOC staff members or their families regarding staff working conditions. As of May 5th, the department had received 1,029 COVID-related complaints, so that's from um, early March to May 5th, representing 18% of the uh, 56, just over 5,600 complaints received by DOC since March 5th when the department began tracking COVID-related complaints. Since March 16th, the department's environmental health and health unit and facilities operations office have conducted daily audits of a sample of housing areas at each facility to check for the availability of sanitation supplies and as of April 8th, mask availability for people in custody and usage. DOC provides the board with its documentation daily and board staff analyze each audit. From April 5th through April 18th, DOC audited an average total of 64 areas daily DOC wide and an average of six areas per, per, per facility each day, ranging from an average of five areas at AMKC to an average of 12 areas at BCDC. In general, the DOC audit documentation shows high rates of sanitation supply availability and that work orders are submitted for inoperable sinks that are identified. Board staff will seek, seek to independently verify this documentation through our jail monitoring, genotech review, and other oversight sources. Every day, the board receives complaints directly from people in custody, staff, family members, defense counsel, and advocates via phone, email, mail, web form, just as we did before the crisis. Phone calls from jail to the board are free and not monitored. Board staff developed a new complaint protocol to review these complaints and refer them to the appropriate agency for a response. The board also reviews these complaints to identify systemic and urgent issues, which are then escalated to DOC and CHS as appropriate. From March, sorry, from March 30th through April 30th, the board received 370 complaints. This is a 99% increase from the same period in 2019 when the board received a total of 186 complaints. Of the 370 complaints received from March 30th through April 30th, around a third or 119 were COVID related. The board's oversight work has been and will continue to be critically important in this crisis response. We have and will continue to provide necessary information to the public outlining essential data and independently confirming what is actually happening in the jails. We will continue to advocate for a small, for as small a jail system as is safely possible. And we will continue to recommend that DOC and CHS provide as much information to people in custody, staff, families, and the public at large. As in the community, it is a public health challenge for trusted messengers to continue to deliver critical information on how people can protect themselves and the people around them. While a jail setting creates unique and increased barriers to this work and will take a creative and intensive approach, the importance of communication remains. The Board of Correction will continue to provide oversight and we will, con we will continue to encourage the city to further its efforts to engage with people in custody uh, staff and the public to ensure that people are taking all necessary steps to protect themselves. The number of people in custody in COVID confirmed or symptomatic housing has dropped from a high of 286 people on April 1st to 67 people on May 17th. DOC and CHS leadership and staff, as well as people in custody, custody who work in the jails and have taken measures to protect themselves should be incredibly proud of their efforts. However, the pandemic is not over and the risk of getting sick in the jails is still significant. Further, as the city carefully considers when and how it can reopen, the jail system must have clear, safe and transparent plans for managing new risks in the coming months. Thank you. Um, Dr. Cohen now has a short statement and then we are happy to take your questions.
Um, thank you very much. Um, part of the public health and clinical response to COVID-19 has been to decrease the population in the jails by almost 30%. CHS has stated that, that this is the most important factor in their ability to manage the pandemic without minimizing the extraordinary clinical care they have provided. Uh, it has been the release, particularly the release of older and medically vulnerable persons. The city did an amazing job getting many, many people out. Over the past three weeks, however, the population of the jails has been going up. We should be concerned. The population on April 24th was 3869. Yesterday, it was 39.54. It is important to look at this data category by category to understand what actions are driving the increase. The number of city sentence persons has decreased over this period from 134 to 115. This makes sense when the city's criminal courts are not functioning normally. Number of persons with technical parole violations incarcerated on order of DOCCS has also decreased from 267 to 199. There is a population of persons incarcerated charged with a technical parole violation and an open case that I don't have current information on. The population which is increasing is the pretrial detainee population. Essentially, these are people who have been arrested by the New York Police Department, arraigned before a judge, been remanded or had bail set and have been unable to afford bail. This population was 3316 on April 24th and yesterday was 3,484, an increase of 168. We do not know if the increase in the pretrial population represents a change in police arrest policy, a change in district attorney practice, or a change in the bail practice of the city's judges. We live today in the hope of a better tomorrow, but we live in clear expectation that there will be a surge in infections and a surge in deaths later this year. It is vitally important that the jail population not be allowed to increase to pre-COVID levels. The decrease in population was intentional, the result of joint action by the city's agencies, DOC, CHS, MOCJ, the elected DAs, the defense bar, and the judges. Population increase in the jail, if it occurs, will also be intentional and will follow from changes in the city's agencies, particularly police, the elected district attorneys, and in the practice of the judges with regard to bail. Our task is clear. We must intentionally work to keep the population in our jails as low as possible, carefully tracking each of these categories. We must work particularly hard during this pandemic to release medically vulnerable persons at increased risk of serious illness and death from COVID-19. I am very proud to be your representative on the Board of Correction, and I'm very proud of the extraordinary effort of the Department of Correction and Correctional Health Services during this pandemic. I mourn with you those who have died. Thank you. Thank you, and nice to see all of you. I do hope all of you are, are, are uh, doing okay, your families and, and everyone else. Um, and thank you guys for that testimony and your work to uh, ensure oversight on the, in the jails at a very difficult time. Um, one of the, in the testimony, I, I think you had mentioned that um, BOC complaints, there was about a third were COVID related. Um, and then uh, I had two questions related to that. One is, can you give us more specific specificity about um, what exactly were, are the types of complaints COVID related? And then on the, uh, for the other two third, can you give us some um, insight into what those are related to? Sure, and um, I'll ask Emily to, to jump in on specifics. I mean, I, you know, I think that we're getting, we're hearing from um, family members and from people in custody um, in, at times about lack of communication, just people sort of not understanding what is what is happening in in the jails. Um, you know, I think that's one of the general categories. Emily, can you speak to to other specific um, issues that that we're we're getting specifically um, from people in custody? Sure. So, in addition to those that the board complaints that the board receives directly, um, board staff review every, have reviewed every single complaint that the Department of Corrections has received and that are handled by the Department of Corrections Office of Constituent and Grievance Services. And we've done some additional coding of um, those complaints to have a better understanding. Um, one of the um, main categories of COVID-related complaints um, 
which represent about 37% of those received um, by um, health, uh, include health complaints. Um, so 37% of those complaints that we've reviewed um, that were handled by the department were health related. So concerns about um, a lack of access to care um, in terms of being able to communicate and um, reach care. Um, concerns about exposure safety. So um, concerns about who they're being housed with if someone in their unit had been um, sick and left the unit um, and then concerns about preventive measures um, some of these complaints also were related to um, concerns about staff coming in and out of the facility and potentially exposing um, people in the facility. Um, and then a concern about testing and having the ability to access testing. Um, and I think as, um, as Meg mentioned, um, a lot of this is um, related to um, what is communicated or, or not being communicated to people in custody and um, having a better sense of how, um, how the jail is being managed. Um, so we think that is really gonna be an important part of the response is how people in custody are educated about how to access care now under these circumstances and um, that they have a better understanding of um, the steps that the department is taking to keep them safe um, and how those policies are being implemented. Okay, um, if there was a second wave of this pandemic, do you feel that we are prepared for a second wave? If not, do you have recommendations for how we might be prepared, better prepared for another, if there was another wave of this pandemic? I mean, I, I think it's fair to assume that there will be a second wave. Um, and I think that you know, I think that DOC and CHS have done an incredible job of of figuring out how to respond to this crisis in a very short period of time. I mean, I think this is this is a challenge that everyone around the world has has had to to grapple with. And in a jail, it's it's a particularly I think challenging situation. Um, I I think that that they are learning um, as they go. And I think that's important. I think in a response, you want to be, you want to sort of iterate on what is working and what is not. Um, you know, I think the, the thing that, that we hear about the most from, um, from people in custody, from families, from defender organizations is um, it is a lack of communication. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, if, and we are certainly, we as the board are certainly happy to, to help communicate as much as we can. Um, but I, I do think that it's important for both the department and CHS to, um, to communicate more um, with people in custody, with staff, um, and with the, the public at large. Okay. My, I'm going to, ask one question and then hand it over to Chair Lanceman. And that is, um, uh, are there data points that you think the Board of Corrections needs from DOC today to provide proper oversight? And if so, can you share with us which, which what those might be? Yeah, I mean, I'll let, I mean, Emily, Emily is our data guru, so I will let her give the specifics. What I would generally say is the, the more data that, that DOC and CHS can provide us to, to be able to clearly outline what is happening in the jail system would be incredibly helpful. Um, I appreciate Dr. Yang's point that we want to be careful about, about how the numbers tell a story, but, but I think that we still need the numbers and we, and we want to, to make sure that we're telling that story responsibly, but I'll let Emily talk about the specific data points. Okay, thanks Emily. Why don't you tell us what you think is helpful? Um, well, um, a lot of the data points um, that um, we think are important are included in the proposed bill um, that we're hearing about today, um, including the total number of um, confirmed, um, confirmed positive patients that have been tested and confirmed while in custody um, since the start of the pandemic, not just those who are currently in. Um, 
and we think it's important to also share the testing numbers so that people understand the testing strategy, um, the outcome of those um, test results. Um, again, it can be complicated for people to, to understand and put this in perspective, but it's important um, that we have access to it and that we are able to have this conversation publicly. Um, I, hospitalizations, um, also important to understand how many people hospitalized hospitalized um, to really understand the trajectory and the response to the pandemic. Um, and then um, a question uh, that council member Rivera asked about recoveries is also important because the numbers we're currently reporting on total um, confirmed COVID patients in custody now includes a number of people who have recovered. Um, and so, you, you know, you may look at that number and, and see over 300 um, 60 people with confirmed COVID, but a significant portion of those individuals have recovered. Um, and so that's important context too. Okay, thanks. And, and, and did the BOC support the legislation that's before the council today? Yeah, we do. Um, and however we can, we can be helpful, we're, we're very happy to, I mean, again, robust communication is always a good thing. Okay, thank you. I'm going to hand it over to Chair Lansman and then we'll go on to um, council members. Thank you. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Um, I, I want to ask your opinion on the issue of whether or not uh, new admissions should be uh, fully segregated and isolated from the rest of the population for at least a 10 day period, if not a 14 day period. <clears throat> Are you satisfied with the current testing and quarantine protocols that the Department of Corrections is uh, employing? You know, I think that the, the, the response from DOC and CHS needs to be whatever will minimize the transmission of this virus through the jails. And so if based on you know, medical and public health expertise, the best way to do that is to test everyone and quarantine, then I, I'm supportive of that. Um, and and it, it sounds like that, that is, a, is a good and smart way to, to manage um, the, the vectors of transmission in the system um, in terms of days, you know, the, it's not necessarily my area of expertise, but I think whatever minimizes transmission makes a lot of sense. Well, based on your understanding of what the Department of Corrections is doing, do, do you believe, are you confident that the, the current protocols is the most they can do to minimize transmission? And you, you heard the exchange that we had back and forth and you know the Department of Corrections and their operations inside and out. What do you think? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I mean, I think it, well. So it, yes and no because it's it's hard to. I, I it makes sense as a as a going in strategy. I think this is one of the challenges of of not having all of the data. Um, it, you know, it's hard to see how the virus is actually moving through the jail system. Um, it looks like uh, most new cases are coming in as new admissions. And so a so uh, some period of quarantine does make sense. Um, it goes into housing strategy as, the, as they talked about. Um, and so, so I think it does make some sense as to, as to how you would minimize the transmission based on people going in. I also think that it goes to sort of a tangential issue, which is reducing the number of admissions into the jail system, as Dr. Cohen talked about. I mean, we're starting to see admissions rise, and I think we're, we're also concerned about that, um, bringing the community spread into, into the system is let me, let me super ask, concerning. All right, let me ask about the board's access to the, the data. I mean, you, the board plays a very important role in overseeing and, and, and regulating to a certain extent the Department of Corrections. Um, I was very surprised to learn in certain circumstances that, that you did not have data that I would have thought are, are even, even, is even more essential for you to fulfill your responsibilities 
than than even the the, the council. Have you anywhere uh, made a list of all the different types of data that you would want and feel that you need to do your job that you have not gotten from the Department of Corrections? I mean, in response to this pandemic, um, yeah. I, th I think Emily just outlined for, for Chair Powers the, the missing data elements that, that we um, we think are essential to, to, uh, to providing the most robust oversight that we can. Um, so on May 11th last week, you, the board published um, uh, a, a report on, um, on, on what's going on in Rikers with, with COVID-19. And you found a number of um, shortcomings as one would expect, um, even in the best of circumstances. Uh, but <clears throat> given the seriousness of what's happening and, and the potential for serious illness and, and, and death, um, I, I wanna know, are you confident that the Department of Corrections is acting on the five plus subparts recommendations that you make in that report? Do you have any indication that they're taking this report seriously and that they are actually acting on these recommendations? We do. I mean, we we have had a number of, of conversations with them about the findings in the report and, and issues that have come up through our oversight um, in this process. Um, and, and I will give them credit. They have been incredibly responsive where we have we have raised issues, um, but I think, you know, and you're, you're sort of getting to this point, I think it's, a, it's an ongoing process and, um, and, and we will continue to, to monitor their response to this and answer the general operations in the jail to raise issues with them when we see them. Um, as I said, we pulled the, the monitoring staff out of the jails in mid-March. We are starting to, to do, go back in. We're starting, we're restarting our, our um, in-person monitoring in a really targeted and strategic way in order to support um, and supplement the, the oversight work we're doing through Genetech, through the, the grievance audits that Emily talked about, through these other means. Um, and so when we're raising both individual and systemic issues, I think the department has been, um, has been responsive. Mr. Chair, if I, if, I could, if I could comment on this. Uh, I, I first just want to say not, I want to compliment uh, their, um, you know the chair, the, the chair of the board, Jen, Jennifer, uh, for for her for her work and and the staff in this very difficult time. But I, I think that you can make some judgment about the way this has worked, or Jennifer Walston, uh, by looking at the mortality at this point. It's terrible what we described, um, but at the same time, um, the uh, I think that the effect of the the effort of the Department of Correction and and CHS uh, can can be measured by that. And uh, I, you, you know that uh, the, the, the board's role is to oversee and to, and to identify problems and help the department correct them. And we spend a lot of time identifying problems and we know, as you say, more than anyone, what the warts are uh, in, the, in, in the system. Uh, I, 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 I have been concerned that we were not provided the kind of data that, that are in this bill, but which came out today uh, when I heard Commissioner Brand and she and I don't often agree on, on things, when I heard her response today to the board's report, I was very heartened by, um, by, not, by not a response of criticism, by a response of, of, of agreeing with, with, the, uh, with, the, with the observations and a, and, a, and, a, and, a com and a commitment to do it better. I think these are very, very hard, as we all do, uh, uh, pro projects uh, on, the, on wearing masks, uh, which is a critical issue. Uh, the, the department has to model that, and uh, and the and the men and women living in the jails have to model that behavior to each other. Imagine wearing a, a mask all day long in a in a jail in in New, in New York City right now. Uh, it's an incredible uh, effort that we're asking of, of people, and 
I support the, 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 the council's efforts to, 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 uh, to instrumentalize the processes that you have through these, uh, through these bills and to get the reporting that's necessary going, going forward. But uh, um, I, think we're, uh, I think we should be very proud of the, uh, the work of New York City at this moment. Thank you. I, I will just add that um, as we have been doing the monitoring where we have noted issues, we are seeing improvements. We are seeing, actually seeing more uh, availability like through our monitoring of the supplies to clean phones. Um, getting people to consistently do that cleaning is going to be a challenge. Um, again, the messaging to staff and people in custody has to be there. I can't just be about making things available, um, but we have seen um, improvements in terms of compliance with the use of PPE and the availability of supplies um, from what we have been able to observe remotely. Um, so we, we do see um, corrective action and improvement taking place. Um, but I think the challenge in terms of looking ahead to the future will be, um, clarifying the policies, um, making sure that the board is aware of what the policies are and the, how the different units are being managed. And so that if we can have written guidance, we can have a better understanding of how it's working. Um, and there can be more clarity in that messaging across the board to staff and people in custody um, can, can be better implemented. Um, so I think getting those policies in place and memorializing them and then developing that communication strategy will be very critical in terms of preventing another um, wave or surge in, in cases in the jails. But it's gonna take a uh, consistent effort and um, you know, there's, there's no room for complacency in this setting. All right, thank you. Thank you. I will now call on council members in the order that they have used their Zoom hand functions. Um, if council members have not used their Zoom hand functions as of yet, please do so now and you will be called on in the order that you have used your hand function. Seeing no questions, we will move to the next panel. Thank you, thanks to the board. And I think next we're gonna have a mock J on if you want yes. um, We will now hear from Liz Glazer, Director of the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. For the question and answer period only, we will be joined by Dana Kaplan, Deputy Director of Close Rikers and Justice Initiatives, Eric Cumberbatch, Deputy Director of the Office of Neighborhood Safety, and Deanna Logan, Deputy Director of the Crime Strategy of Crime Strategies for MockJ. Before we begin, I will administer the oath. I will call on you each individually for a response. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Director Glazer? I do. Deputy Director Kaplan? I do. Deputy Director Cumberbatch? I do. Deputy Director Logan? I do. Director Glazer, you may begin. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Lanceman and Chair Powers, uh, and members of the Justice System uh, Committee and Public Safety Committee. My name is Elizabeth Glazer, and I'm the Director of the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today regarding the city's response to COVID-19 in its detention facilities. And I have several of my MACJ colleagues with me uh, available to respond to questions as well. The Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice advises the mayor on criminal justice policy and is the mayor's representative to the courts, district attorneys, defenders, and state criminal justice agencies, among others. Uh, MACJ designs, deploys, and evaluates citywide strategies to increase safety, reduce unnecessary arrests and incarceration, improve fairness, and build the strong neighborhoods that ensure enduring public safety. 
COVID-19 has put our criminal justice partners and system to a severe test calling upon us to protect the people in the city's care and custody, many of whom are medically vulnerable uh, and from our city's poorest neighborhoods. Uh, and it's been called upon to do this as the city has maximized social distancing and courts have streamlined down to only the most essential virtual operations. The city's response was a dramatic acceleration of what already were historic transformations in the, the criminal justice landscape. In the six years before this crisis, the city saw historic declines in its jail population, far less crime, and far fewer arrests and an emerging model of safety relying less on the formal controls of enforcement and punishment and more on informal structures of family and neighborhood. COVID-19 has hastened these trends to warp speed. Indeed, the response to this public safety emergency by the criminal justice system, our public health system and the people of the city has been nothing short of extraordinary. The crisis has demanded distilling the operations of the justice system down to what is most essential to sustain public safety. Concerns over spread of the disease in congregate settings has led to concentrated agencies, uh, concentrated efforts by the agencies testifying today and the courts, district attorneys, defenders, State Department of Corrections and nonprofit providers to drastically reduce the jail population while maintaining safety. This has resulted in unprecedented declines in the number of people held in city jails, particularly those most vulnerable to the disease. Since March 16th, when social distancing began in the city, the jail population has plummeted to levels not seen since 1946, shrinking by approximately 30,000, uh, 30% 30 to fewer than 4,000 people. City agencies and nonprofit providers have also joined forces to help ensure those arriving from jail into a city in quarantine have places to stay, re-entry services, and access to medical care. And we have seen other dramatic transformations outside the jails with the crime rate cut by a quarter and arrests by a third. Our crisis management system and the mayor's action plan for neighborhood safety are continuing their work in hard hit communities to promote collective civilian action and responsibility for public health and safety. There's so much we don't know about this disease and how long the city will battle it. Dr. Yang so eloquently referred to this formidable enemy as a shapeshifter, and it is so true. COVID-19 has brought tragedy and hardship, but also hard earned uh, lessons. Uh, that may advance us even faster towards a smaller, safer, and fairer justice system. Our challenge will be to learn from this experience, both the good and the bad, and sustain our advances as New York City emerges into its future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Director Kaplan, you may begin. I, I uh, don't have any affirmative testimony. I'm here to answer questions as they arise. Thank you. Uh, I will now turn it over to questions from Chair Powers, followed by Chair Lanceman. Chair Powers, please begin. Thank you. Testimony, nice to see you virtually and, and hope you're all doing well and, and your families as well. Yeah, uh, you too. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, the, uh, on the week of May 3rd, there was 34 new admissions to our city jails compared to 100 admissions to jail the week of March 29th, um, according to the Board of Corrections, which is an 127% increase in over a month. Can you give us some, in, can you give some insights into that um, and also let us know what the city is doing to ensure, uh, you know, that the jail population does not skyrocket, that the releases were meant to be you know, compassionate releases to make sure that people do not get COVID. Can you share with us some insights on that and also what additional efforts the city is taking now to ensure that that population does not go back to where it was and that we are not putting extra people into harm's way? Sure, so um, we've been through an extraordinary period, uh, quite obviously. Um, 
And two things happened. One was a very dramatic drop in admissions, um, largely because of the conditions um, in the city, uh, number of arrests, a much, much smaller uh, court system that accepted only the most essential cases. Um, and at the same time, we had a very intentional and dramatic effort that a number of people have talked about already um, to review really every single person who was in custody uh, to determine uh, whether there is a route to safe release. Um, that very dramatic discharge where we had discharges really sort of outpacing admissions in a significant way um, has slowed. Uh, and I think it's slowed for all the reasons that you could imagine, um, uh, partly that people uh, are, that that tension between public health and public safety uh, is becoming tighter uh, as the population has dropped to these low levels. The admissions um, you know, are a function of a lot of different things. Um, we are in an artificial period. Um, I think it, it goes without saying where you know, all of New York is under stay at home orders. Um, I think we take some hope from uh, the period that we've gone through and the kind of way in the DAs and judges and others have done uh, to determine when and whether jail is really the necessary um, solution to getting people back to court and to ensuring the city's safety. So I think it's pretty early to tell um, what the impacts will be and what the lessons learned are, but we are intently interested in seeing how we can hold on to uh, some of the things that we have learned. Uh, and I think that we may see some enduring effects of um, behavior among judges and DAs with respect to um, how parsimoniously they use jail. Okay, um, I'm, I'm just, we're gonna hear from the DAs, um, uh, I think after this on the next panel, in a, in a letter back in March 29th, the 60 A's wrote to the mayor and to Commissioner Brand expressing concern that the city was not providing housing supervision and support service needs of individuals that were being released from city jails. Um, can, can you tell us what Mock J makes of that opinion and uh, are there other programs that you've also put in place if that is a concern? Yeah, I. Um... I actually think one of the heartening things to come out of this tragedy um, has been a kind of uh, uh, intensified focus on what the kinds of supports are that are needed to ensure that people leave jail and are supported and don't come back. Um, there's been an enormous amount of work. I really kind of knit together what really should look like from DOC, uh, from Providers, my office has played a role as well. And Dana, I don't know if you would like to sort of step in and describe in a little bit of detail what those kinds of supports look like, which for sure have evolved um, and been strengthened, you know, since the beginning of the pandemic. Sure. So as I spoke about uh, a little bit earlier, one of the things that we put in place that is specific uh, to this moment has been the setting up of the hotel sites. And those are hotel sites that are both available for people who are have tested positive for coronavirus or who are uh, symptomatic uh, of, of coronavirus. Those are uh, operated by the Department of Homeless Services and Office of Emergency Management. And then a separate set of hotels for individuals who are asymptomatic or not identified as having, uh, co uh, having COVID-19. Uh, on site at these hotels, um, particularly the ones that the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice supports, we have reentry providers that are providing uh, daily wellness checks 
Uh, we're coordinating to provide medical services um, at, the, at these sites. Uh, we provide essential supplies, such as phones, uh, food vouchers or food. Um, uh, we provide um, access and referrals to benefits assistance, um, to longer term housing placements, uh, and the and while we have reentry providers that are on site providing uh, supplies and doing wellness checks and making sure that they are contacting people who are in the hotels, we also are accessing our ongoing reentry supports, particularly the jails to job service providers. Uh, and all of those service providers are providing continued services um, virtually uh, doing case management, um, the same types of referrals uh, that they have always done. Those services are of course available, not just to people who are in the hotel sites, but to anyone who is coming out of Rikers Island. Um, okay, I appreciate that. Um, but I also wanna add that the DAs also you know, found that that program they claim was, a, was a, their, this is their words, a seemingly, was a seemingly haphazard process. Do you agree with that? assertion and why do you believe that that is an assertion that they made? The process of relief or the process? The process of release. This is the March 28th letter where there was an exer express, a concern expressed uh, by the DAs that the this was a seemingly haphazard process. Yeah, I mean, I would take issue with that and um, I'm sure you have my letter back to them as well. Um, I mean, obviously, this was a moment of great crisis uh, and 24-7 work by everybody, by the DAs, defenders, us, um, all our partners, DOC. Um, and I think under the circumstances, the review of every single person in custody uh, who had, uh, who was particularly vulnerable to these uh, symptoms. Uh, it's certainly possible that not every person in the justice system was happy with the outcomes, um, but I think the city did quite a good job um, with our partners in order to do that review and to be as responsible as possible. Um, and I think the results um, speak for themselves. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna get it over, uh, hand it over to the chair, Lanceman. Um, that's something we supported, I, I think both of us, but I know I supported doing uh, 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 more release of folks that um, were particularly vulnerable. And um, are there, kind of one last question, are there individuals, I asked this to CHF earlier, are there individuals that are being held in our city jails today that you think should be additional folks that should be, that maybe you don't have uh, the ability to release, but are, do you believe there are additional individuals that should be released due to either a health condition, on underlying health condition, being vulnerable, or being in, in any way risk of the COVID virus? So I, you know, I think it's not just one thing. That's what makes this um, such a difficult process. It's not only the numerous different decision makers, but it's both a public health um, evaluation and a public safety evaluation. Um, we're very uh, fortunate to have a first class public health system within our jails. Uh, you know, as the corrections commissioner testified, it's now the jails are now half empty permit the kind of social distancing and medical care. So obviously, you know, there continue to be people coming into the system, even though at a much reduced rate. Um, and, uh, you know, we continue to keep our eye on that ball. Okay. A yes or no would have been okay as well. Um, I, I, do, I do get concerned that there may be additional folks that have not. But anyway, um, I'll hand it over to Chair, the Chair last one. Thank you. Good afternoon, how are you? Good, how are you? Very good, thank you. So um, I wrote in the, the Daily News and I, and I believe it firmly that while there's more to do, the, the effort to quickly uh, decarcerate Rikers and the city jails 
has been um, very successful and something that we should all be proud of. And I, I, I hope and understand that, that you are rightfully proud um, as well. You know, one of the things that stuck, sticks out in my mind, um, <clears throat> we were, of course, told that if you let all these people out, um, crime will, will, will rise, it'll be, a, it'll be a, 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 a get out of jail free card for people to go on, on a crime spree. And, and of course, you know, that did not come to pass. And just looking at Mock J's uh, weekly uh, New York City jail population reduction in the time of COVID-19 update, um, you report that 95% of the people who were released, who were, who were released under the um, Article 6A of the, the state correction law, the people serving a, a city sentence, a sentence of, of, of less than a year, 95% of those people have not been rearrested while in the program. Put another way, 5% have. I mean, can you get any, I guess you could get better than that. You could be 100%, but that, that, that is, a, a, I think it's fair to say, um, a very safe and effective way to release people and, and keep them um, out of harm's way. Wouldn't you agree? I can answer yes or no to that, uh, and yes. You could expand if you wanted to, but you're, you're not required. So yes, I mean, I think that when I said that I think there are gonna be some lessons learned here, um, obviously it's still early days. Obviously we're living in a very different city than hopefully we will emerge into. But we certainly find those results very, very heartening. Um, and there is something to be learned there um, about what the purpose and function of jail is. Um, and I think it is something that um, our colleagues across the criminal justice system have taken very, very seriously in this crisis um, the DAs, the defenders, DOC, CHS um, have really grappled with um, and been respectful of the different views and issues that go into making a decision to release. But I think it's a very, um, it's heartening. Now you, you see that data, I mean, you report the data, I got the data from, from you and you see the data. Um, Commission, former Commissioner Bill Bratton took to Twitter to write, as predicted, the crime virus is expanding rapidly as the jail population is decreasing rapidly. Is it fair to say that you don't share his view that, that what we have unleashed, what all of us and our collective efforts have unleashed, have, have unleashed is a crime virus? Look, we always want to be uh, keep an eye on crime and what's driving it, uh, at least in the early returns right now. Uh, it doesn't seem from where I sit um, that the data is showing that the releases, the COVID-related releases are driving um, a crime spike. So let's talk about that process. Uh, because you also have a very hard job. You've got five elected district attorneys, the special narcotics prosecutor, the courts, each individual judge, many of them are, are, are themselves independently elected. Um, you know, the, I'm, I'm reminded of the, the, the metaphor that some wise sage senator said about, about about being the majority leader of the, the, the Senate, it's like trying to herd cats. Can, can you walk us through in some detail the process for how the people who are going to be released um, were identified? Let's start with the one that, that you probably have the most control over, and that is the, the city sentenced folks. Was that you and the, the corrections commissioner and who else sitting in the room going, going person by person? Were certain categories of offenses elim eliminated for, from consideration right off the bat? H how did we get to that number that you got to? So I'm fortunate to have uh, our deputy director, Deanna Logan, who led so many of these conversations um, with me. So let me, why don't I start? And uh, Deanna, I've 
there's anything you would like to add, that would be terrific. Um, one of the things that, uh, you know, we, uh, it sometimes sounds like a joke, but we work very closely with our partners in the criminal justice. <laughs> um, and uh, this crisis has very much accelerated uh, that working relationship. I think, uh, you know, we've already heard mention of the, that among many different agencies. Um, but what it did was really bring together on a daily basis um, our court system, our DAs, our defenders, us, our sister city agencies um, in a common effort, even though we sat in different places and had different views, um, to figure out what could we do in this crisis um, to um, to slow or halt the spread of the disease in our jails. Um, and there were literally daily calls, hourly contact um, with each of those offices um, to get input and ideas on uh, what we should look at. Um, we were guided very much by CHS uh, who was able to, um, to tell us uh, who were the people who had, uh, as an aggregate matter, uh, suffered from the kinds of underlying conditions uh, that might make, make them more vulnerable to the disease. Um, so it was really a process um, that uh, was intense and daily. Um, and Deanna, I don't know if you'd like to add to that. Uh, maybe needs to can be. We, can we unmute her, please? <laughs> Alana, can we unmute Deanna Logan? There we go. Hi, good afternoon, yes. So uh, just, Echoing what Director Glazer said, all of the system actors committed an enormous amount of time, but not only time, but executive levels, individuals who were actually decision makers. So on a daily basis, the decision makers in all of the offices, members of the court administration, defense bar, made their personnel available to review cases. And then after doing their reviews, they took action in making sure that cases were calendared very expeditiously to have individuals brought before court so that cases could either be expedited for completion and or bail reduced in many of the cases that they reviewed for um, a number of cases that CHS brought to their attention, but then ones that uh, defense bar brought to DA's attentions, all of the system players made sure that they were able to, on a daily basis, be available. And when we say daily, we're not just talking about during the week, we're talking about hours on weekends and nights and um, pretty much at the drop of a hat, they made themselves available. So that process, meant reviewing people who were pretrial as well as city sentence going through and getting the individuals that after balancing health and public safety concerns, the parties believed they could consent to release. Let, let me ask you about the, the city sentence. Um, because if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, that decision is a unilateral one, correct? That's, that's, that's the city or maybe more specifically the, the commission of corrections, right? You don't need the district attorney's approval or a court's approval to put someone into that, that 6A program, do you? You do not need the DA's approval or consent on those individuals, that is correct. Okay. So, I would say, let me just jump in for, for one second. Um, I think any decision maker uh, is always grateful for and welcomes and wants to have um, information before they make a decision. So what, um, what we can see with respect to a case or the circumstances of a case um, is quite minimal. 
Uh, we can see what the charge is. Uh, we don't necessarily know whether the charge describes the conduct. Um, we really don't, we meaning the city, um, don't know that. So consultation, as Dan has sort of laid out, uh, was, was and is an important part of, um, of making those decisions. Were there any hard and fast rules, for example, was it necessary for someone to be considered that they have some kind of underlying medical condition that made them particularly vulnerable if they contracted COVID-19? Our, um, our focus was um, to prioritize those who uh, had an underlying medical condition or were o over 50 years old, um, which were sort of the two you know, main um, main areas of vulnerability. Um, but we were also interested in ensuring that we could um, make the kind of space um, within the jails um, that would permit DOC and CHS to do the kind of social distancing and care that they wanted to do. Um, and so if, the DAs themselves, I mean, this wasn't just us, the DAs themselves worked with the courts um, with lists of people that they consented to release. Uh, and so I don't think it was, our priority was to focus on people with those issues, but our priority was also to make space. And if the DAs in, uh, agreed, there were a number of different routes to go there. So in terms of the city sentence, folks, if if someone didn't have an underlying condition or wasn't over 50, that they, they still might have been considered, maybe, maybe not in the first round, maybe not in the first day, but but they weren't barred from being considered. Is that is that correct? Correct. Yeah. Um, were any and just focusing on the city sentence right now, because again, just the things that you control, even though I understand and certainly makes sense to me, you'd want to solicit input. From a wide range of sources, sources, but for the city sentence folks, um, were there any offenses or charges that were uh, um, uh, would preclude them from 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 being considered for this program? For example, you know, we're not uh, letting anyone uh, uh, serving a sentence for a, a sex offense or or some other offense. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there was a particular concern. Um, around sex offenses, uh, course of conduct of, you know, DV behavior, um, some kinds of violent offenses. Uh, so definitely there were things that, um, that uh, you know, seem to be limiting factors to some degree, but no hard and fast rules. Um, you know, it's a program that needs flexibility. The commissioner has to exercise her discretion. Uh, and so having information is important. Yeah. Did, um, did at some point, I, you had mentioned earlier uh, the importance of creating enough space at Rikers for there to be proper social distancing. At, at, at some, was there some, <clears throat> some target number to, to reach after which uh, let's just say the kind of intensity that um, Ms. Logan desc described uh, ebbed and, and, and okay, we, we, we've cleared out enough people, now they can socially distance. Let's move on to other things. I mean, I think there was um, a, a sort of natural and organic um, process in which the decisions became harder and harder um, there may be people who have underlying conditions, but the nature of the offense or other concerns um, that our partners expressed meant that um, that was not going to be a release. So there was, we never had a quota or particular number we were, uh, we were aiming for because it was really a case by case um, evaluation. Is that case-by-case -case evaluation still going on? Or if anyone is in, in Rikers now on a city sentence, basically they've been evaluated and it is what it is. They're gonna, they're gonna serve out their term. 
I mean, right now for the city sentenced, um, we are not because of the nature of what's happening in the court system. We're not seeing any newly city sentenced people. Um, so we have gone through uh, that, uh, you know, that evaluation process um, again with our partners, and again, you know, taking guidance from uh, the corrections commissioner, who whose discretion is obviously the one that has to be exercised. Um, so my understanding from 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 the, your data, as as much as I could could figure it out. Um, eliminating the people who are uh, pre-trial, not moving away from the city sentence, moving to the, the pre-trial population. The, um, the uh, not including the people who have a remand or remanded or have another warrant or on or hold. You're looking at about 1,300 people who are held purely on cash bail. Um, and again, people not remanded, people who don't have some other hold um, or, or warrant. Uh, you know, a lot of people would think that's on any certain on any given day. It's it's hard to to, to swallow that somebody's in, incarcerated because they don't have the money to to bail themselves out. Um, but uh, particularly. With what's going on with COVID nineteen, it seems particularly potentially uh, tragic. Um, is any is there any ongoing effort being made to try to figure out a way to get those approximately thirteen hundred people out, maybe through some mechanism other than, than than cash bail, so that they're not sitting in Rikers during the corona coronavirus crisis because um, they don't have money. Yeah, so I don't, uh, I can't confirm that that's right, the 1300. Um, if it comes from our data, great. Um, uh, so, I mean, we have done quite an extensive process. Um, I, less so about people coming in right now. Um, so obviously the pretrial population is a more dynamic population. People are leaving um, and people are coming in, although obviously at much reduced rates. Um, so, you know, there's a point at which um, uh, the district attorneys, the police department, other people uh, in the criminal justice system uh, feel that in fact, uh, incarceration is the right uh, the right place for the individual. Um, and so that's where we have, that's where we have landed. Um, I don't think it'd be fruitful for me to ask you to uh, assess each of the district attorney's level of uh, cooperation and, and enthusiasm, um, but I'd love to know it. And I certainly wouldn't want to miss the opportunity for you to share it if it's something that you want to. Yeah, I mean, I think the district attorneys have are, you know, this has been an incredibly difficult uh, crisis for everybody and for them and their offices as well. They've been just remarkably dedicated and uh, at a time when they were setting up parallel systems uh, to, uh, to, uh, to carry out their duties. Um, really sort of put their shoulder to the wheel on these issues as well um, with a great deal of care and thought. Um, they obviously have a, an array of different uh, views and uh, they also have constituents. So, um, so but I, I really, uh, I was honored to be able to work with them even if we didn't see eye to eye all the time on every single thing. But that's good to hear. So um, my last question, just like, so we're on the same page because it's hard to believe in my mind, but it, apparently it's the case. Um, I, I, the, the entire effort to reduce the population at Rikers Island is, is driven, is it not, by an understanding that the jail setting 
even in the best of circumstances, is a much more dangerous, much more likely to spread infection um, than having people at home or, or in some kind of work release program. I mean, I mean, that's why you went through all this trouble, isn't it? So, I mean, I think that, you know, we've heard from experts about the, you know, the issue of congregate settings and, you know, we as the city and our partners took that seriously, no question. Um, but there are balancing tests here also. Uh, test makes it too formal, but there there is more than one consideration. There's always more than one consideration, which is why um, it wasn't just a flick of a pen. Well, I understand that, and I, I really do appreciate the amount of thought and effort that you went into to balancing those um, those 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 considerations. It's it's strange to me to hear, or potentially we're going to hear later, um, an assertion that that the 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 increased risk at Rikers Island is not an actual fact and and not an actual consideration as opposed to it is a fact it is a consideration and of course it has to be balanced you know alongside other considerations like public safety etc um well listen I thank you for your testimony I thank you and your whole team uh for uh your very hard work and um to a very significant de degree, uh, you're, you're a great success. I would just respectfully uh, urge that you not let up. If uh, you know we've flattened the curve, if um, uh, Rikers appears to have more space now than it did before, um, I, I don't know if you were here to hear the testimony of the, the people from the Board of Corrections, um, but they, like everyone else, we should all be very, very worried about a return to the, 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 the population size at, at Rikers, driving a return uh, in force of um, a new wave of the, the coronavirus. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I will now call on council members in the order they have used the Zoom raise hand function. If you would like to ask a question and you have not yet used the Zoom raise hand function, please raise it now. Council members, please keep your questions to three minutes. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time is up. You should begin once I have called on you and the Sergeant has announced that you may begin before you deliver your, before delivering your testimony. Uh, the only hand I see is Council Member Holden. So mm -hmm. Council Member Holden. Starting time. Thank you, Director. I just uh, want to address the public safety aspect of it, which, um, I think many of us uh, are concerned about in the public. I'm, I'm looking at a Gothamist uh, article about a, you know, a couple of weeks ago. It said the uh, police say that nearly 110 people who were allegedly reoffended were charged with 190 uh, case arrests because some are accused of multiple new crimes. Uh, none was accused of murder, but there were several charged with major crimes. Um, do you have a um, a, a breakdown of the crimes that individuals were arrested for after being released? Um, I don't have that at hand. Um, I would say that, um, you know, COVID has not ended crime. People leaving jail committed crimes before and they'll commit crimes after. Um, and I think what we have our eye on is, um, what kinds of crimes? Uh, is it more or less than we might expect in a pre-COVID period? Totally understanding what a strange moment we are at right now. So we take it seriously. We very much, um, you know, are obviously talk to the police department every day about um, what they're seeing and what we're seeing. Um, well, the police are telling us that they're they object to about 95% of the people that were released. And you can't cite uh, the crime uh, uh, breakdown, meaning you should have that if you're going to assess if this is working or not. Because let's face it, only a small percentage of, of criminals who commit crime are getting caught. So we, we can assume that many more crimes are being committed, just they're just not getting caught. 
Uh, and also, you're, you know, by not knowing the breakdown, you can't assess the situation. So I think there's a there's a case where. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, wait, wait a minute. There's I a case. Say, I, I, say, I, I, to, I didn't finish asking my question. Yeah, but you can't sort of say things that are just patently untrue. Well, yeah. you can you can answer you can answer that after I'm finished. But we are risking the public to a certain degree. How many crimes, how many victims are we going to allow by just letting people out before they, they're doing their time? So there, there, there is a case here where we're putting the, 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 uh, the public at risk. And we have to take that into consideration. Uh, there, was a, there was a man that attempted to rape a woman he didn't know. He was in a jail. He got released on a technicality or uh, some parole violation. But you have to look at the greater picture here. What advantage does the public have in releasing people who have committed crime over and over again and are released in, into the public? Yeah. I'm so. expired. So I would just say that uh, the public safety issue is an important issue. There is no question that that is absolutely an important thing in the balance. Uh, I would just take very strong exception to the notion um, that every single crime that's committed is committed because of these releases. Crime existed before, crime will exist afterwards. We need to take a very, to really sort of be attentive uh, to what is driving um, whatever the crimes are, but you know, I'll note the crime is down. I don't remember saying that every single com crime was committed by early releases. That was that's oh, if I did say that, that that's ridiculous. Your, but that was I don't your, believe I said that. That was your implication. I don't, well, you can you can read into it, but that wasn't uh, what I. Of course, that's that's uh, ludicrous to say every single crime yeah. committed in public Absolutely. is by early releases. Come on. It is ludicrous. Agreed. Yeah. All right, I, I agree, but I didn't say that. I didn't come close to saying that. Okay, Chair, thank you. Now back to Chair Powers for additional questions. Thank you. Um, I, we're going to move on, I think, um, out of respect for everybody's time. Thank you to Mock Jay for your time and testimony. I think you're back at the council, I think, even tomorrow for uh, a budget hearing. So uh, yeah. questions as well. Thank you uh, and be well. Thank you. Um, I think we're gonna move on now to the district attorneys. Thank you. Now we, now we will call on the district attorneys to testify. First, we will hear from district attorney McMahon followed by special prosecutor, Bridget Brennan, Jill Harris, director of policy and strategy for the Kings County DA. Yeah. Derek Linton, Chief Assistant District Attorney for the Bronx DA. Jennifer Nyberg, Chief Executive Assistant District Attorney for the Queens District Attorney. Before we begin, I will administer the oath. I will call on each of you individually for a response. Please raise your hand. The building and obviously Please raise your hand. I believe one of our district attorneys is having technical difficulties. And if that's the case, I will call on you later to administer the oath and have you have you sworn in. Um, I will call on each of you first right now. Special Prosecutor Bridget Brennan. Oh, I apologize. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? I will call each of your name. Special Prosecutor Bridget Brennan. I do. Director Jill Harris. I do. Chief Assistant District Attorney Derek Linton. Chief Assistant District Attorney Derek Linton. I do. Chief Executive Assistant District Attorney Jennifer Nyberg. I do. And I will call on District Attorney McMahon. So I do, I do. Thank you. Special Prosecutor Bridget Brennan, you may begin. Okay. 
Uh, first of all, I want to thank the chairs for calling this uh, for this calling this committee meeting and inviting me to testify. I think this is uh, a critical issue for all of us, and it's important to have the opportunity to discuss our strategies and the process and programs that we've used to reduce the population of city jails in response to the COVID crisis. And I wanna say before I go any further, how closely we have worked with MOCJ, which has uh, demonstrated tremendous leadership in this area, particularly the director, Liz Glazer, and our primary contact, Deanna Logan, have been just extraordinary. And we've worked closely with the defense bar, with the court system, uh, it has really brought us all together and has taught us a deep respect for each other uh, and how to listen to each other, how to listen carefully and try to get us to the best result during this terrible crisis. Uh, you have heard the statistics on this crisis from the experts, and I won't go through those again, but I will tell you about our approach. The compassionate release of prisoners who at, are at high risk of serious complications from the virus is a priority to us, so long as the release will not jeopardize public safety. And as long as we are confident that those who are released will return to court. Due to criminal justice reforms, which eliminated bail or remand for the vast majority of narcotics offenses, relatively few individuals facing prosecution by our office were confined. And in case you are not aware of uh, the specific jurisdiction of our office, we have jurisdiction of our felony narcotics offenses throughout New York City, and we focus on the highest level of offenders. Our goal is to prevent deaths. So we investigate a lot of cartel-related cases, um, cases of distribution of narcotics related to overdose deaths, and public safety is our highest priority. 73 incarcerated defendants face charges brought by our office at the start of this crisis in mid-March, and most were charged as operating as a major trafficker or were facing weapons or assault charges. We work closely with MACJ to identify defendants appropriate for release. We continually track and update information on all incarcerated defendants, including information from reports or letters relevant to the defendant's heightened health risks. This system in the form of a spreadsheet is circulated among our executive staff and used to initially evaluate requests for release. Each case is then reviewed by the individual assistant district attorney assigned to the matter and by the bureau chief. We're also able to see if defendants whose release we have agreed to are still incarcerated. And once we have agreed to it and we know that we don't have any holds, because of uh, the difficulties with communication within the system, sometimes we could see that they remained incarcerated. And then we would follow up with the mayor's office to understand why that was happening and make sure they knew that we were uh, agreeing to release. Over the past two months, 40 defendants have sought review of their incarceration status in our cases. These reviews were brought on uh, in a number of ways, including requests for review of vulnerable defendants by MACJ, writs of habeas corpus, and individual requests and bail applications for release by individual defense counsel. In addition, recently, we were presented with a request for electronic monitoring uh, of a defendant who's currently remanded. Of these 40 defendants, approximately 42%, 17 have been released with our consent as part of our review process. We have opposed the applications uh, for bail or writs of habeas corpus as to 23 defendants. In these cases, our opposition was based on concerns for public safety or flight. Uh, and none of these applications for release, which we have opposed, have been judicially granted. We have also closely analyzed information provided in individual cases and publicly available data on the risk to prisoners in custody of the coronavirus at uh, Rikers. And when we have an application, we do reach out to uh, the Correction Health Services to get as much information as we can about the health risk to the prisoner. Now to demonstrate how we factor in these considerations, I'm going to go through uh, an application that's currently pending for a defendant who's indicted on the crimes of attempted assault in the first degree, reckless endangerment in the second degree, 
uh, and criminal weapons possessions, conspiracy, as well as narcotics charges. Many of these charges stem from his alleged participation in two shootings which were captured on video surveillance. In telephone calls intercepted on a wiretap, the defendant and his family members discussed the pur purchase of bulletproof vests, which would be sewn into hooded sweatshirts. Multiple firearms were uh, recovered during the investigation. Shortly before these incidents, the defendant was released from federal prison, having serving, uh, served a 20-year sentence for a conviction of conspiracy to distribute heroin. Under the current charges as a predicate felon, he faces up to 15 years uh, of incarceration. In this application, we have argued against release uh, for public safety reasons, but we didn't do that without first doing a thorough review of all available health records, indicating that the health care he received while incarcerated did actually protect this defendant's well being and it appears that he may have had better access to appropriate, appropriate care uh, while he was incarcerated than he might have had when he was at liberty. In his application, the defendant states that his pre-existing health conditions escalate the risk of serious complications from the virus and support his request for release. We evaluated his claims using reliable statistical data and comparing the health risks related to COVID-19 in city jails to the risks faced by an ordinary New York citizen. Our review of his medical records indicates that this particular defendant may have had better access to virus testing and follow-up care than available to the ordinary citizen at the time. He received two COVID-19 tests at a time when most of New York was unable to obtain a test. Because the virus was identified through early testing, he immediately received supportive care and was transferred to a unit dedicated to inmates exposed to COVID-19 who became ill. This suggests a level of care that the severely strained city healthcare system could not have provided during that same period of time. There's no reason to believe he will not continue to receive appropriate care while incarcerated. And we balance all of these factors in determining whether we should consent to his release. And in this case, balancing the public safety concerns and risks against his health status, we have determined that we should oppose release in the interest of protecting the people in the city. Our ability to respond is enhanced by the public reporting of relevant information by the Department of Corrections. Docs regularly reports on the number of inmates under observations, whether they're symptomatic or not symptomatic, and you've heard all about this. Uh, their reporting is excellent and the responsiveness is excellent. Our concern, one concern we do have uh, regarding those who have been released is the inability to supervise them in a meaningful way while we are in the grips of this pandemic. Our concern is best exemplified by a defendant who was released to the community by the DOCS commissioner under Article 6A, which pertains to convicted prisoners, as you know, uh, who are serving a year or less. This defendant faced a felony charge and he was allowed to uh, plead to a year. The released prisoner uh, had a release date of August 30th for selling drugs. While we consented to the majority or agreed with the majority of 6A releases, this was one of the few where we raised concerns because this individual had three uh, prior felony convictions, two of which were for violent crimes. We were concerned that he was unlikely to obey the law and the conditions of release. And almost immediately after his release, my office was contacted by the lawyer for the landlord of the building that he immediately returned to. And he said that the defendant resumed drug dealing from his home while he was still wearing corrections clothes upon his release. And a steady stream of strangers entered the building to purchase drugs, putting other residents at great risk. Uh, it became apparent that at this point in time, there wasn't a great meaningful uh, mechanism in place for supervising or sanctioning the defendant. The only uh, suggestion was to, conduct, to conduct an NYPD investigation and make a new arrest. 
uh, this is not possible under the current circumstances. These are not the kinds of cases that the NYPD was typically involved in at the time we received this complaint. And apart from that, we're not really looking to return defendants to jail. We're really looking for effective means to keep them out of jail when they uh, are committing low level nonviolent offenses as this person was. However, the lawyer pointed out that the neighbors should not be subject to increased risk of infection, not to mention the other risks posed by this early release. I'm in complete agreement that we want to get away from a system that incarcerates people for nonviolent offenses. But instead of arrest and incarceration, we must have an effective means of protecting the public. In this instance, under these unique circumstances of the pandemic, it was clear that the neighbors felt their safety was compromised solely to benefit the released prisoner who immediately flouted the law. And there was little we could do about it. Uh, the current uh, restrictions on the supervised release program didn't allow them a, you know, a great opportunity to intervene. Uh, and as I say, this is not, we're not looking to return defendants to jail at this time but we do need a means, an effective means of intervening. Uh, so that is one thing that I think we all should be looking at. If we don't wanna keep this cycle going, we need to think of how it is. We're going to satisfy neighbors, satisfy the public that their safety isn't being compromised. I have one comment um, on the proposal to create a local conditional release commission uh, designed to address these same concerns about releasing defendants who are serving less than a year. My understanding is that this commission would not take the place of the docs commissioner and the docs commissioner would still have authority to release uh, defendants, obviously. It would simply amplify this. But at this time, I would view this as redundant um, I believe there are fewer than pro probably 100 uh, defendants who are now serving sentences of this nature. And of this hundreds, the docs or the uh, commission would have very limited, much more limited authority, much more limited than the docs commissioner. Their authority would be restricted. Uh, and so at this point in time, when the city is facing a financial crisis, to me, it appears unnecessary. Secondly, it didn't appear to me in looking at the proposal that it would have the built-in kind of authority to do the type of uh, supervision that I'm talking about, have the uh, ability to intervene in a meaningful way. Um, finally, I would also remind the council that the city did have uh, a commission like this, which was disbanded about 15 years ago after being the subject of several scandals um, accusations of releasing people on the basis of favoritism or uh, political connections. And if you are going to uh, institute anything like this, I would hope that you would build in some kind of protections which prevent, would prevent that from ever happening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have District Attorney McMahon. Uh, thank you, Council Sivan. Am I coming through? Yes. Can you hear me? Good. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, uh, Chairpersons Landsman and Powers uh, and all the members of the committee uh, and all those interested in this very important uh, topic that's brought up by this uh, hearing today. And thank you for allowing me to represent uh, the people of Staten Island and the Office of the Richmond County District Attorney with this testimony today. As district attorney, my primary concerns are to serve victims of crime, uphold the rule of law, and keep our community safe by preventing and prosecuting crime. When the coronavirus pandemic reached our shores and spread rapidly through all of New York City, it created an unprecedented emergency for both public health experts and law enforcement agencies alike. We have all felt the massive strain this health crisis has placed on the entire system, and my office has been working diligently with our partners, including the NYPD, to ensure the coronavirus pandemic 
did not cripple law enforcement's ability to protect and serve the people of the city of New York. At the same time, we recognized early on how COVID-19 infections could have the potential to overwhelm our city jails and juvenile detention facilities if containment efforts were not immediately undertaken. From the outset, we recommended uh, in a letter from the city's prosecutors, simple measures that should have been put into place to protect inmates and correction staff, calling on the city to reopen shuttered buildings on Rikers Island to allow for social distancing and better quarantining and care of the sick. Instead, the administration focused on releasing as many defendants as possible from Rikers Island. When this process began, we were asked to consider consenting to the release of those convicted of nonviolent, non-domestic violence, and non-sexual abuse related offenses with a short time remaining on their sentences. In several instances, we were able to identify individuals who had little time left in their sentences and posted min minimal risk to public safety and did give our compassionate consent to early release. In other instances, we have been actively working with defense counsel and the court to expeditiously connect detainees with treatment providers who can serve their serious substance use disorder and mental health needs outside of Rikers, either as part of a plea or while they await trial. In our view, the compassionate release of these defendants would not pose a risk to public safety, so long as the city upheld its promise to closely monitor them through supervised or work release programs. Despite our good faith efforts, uh, misguided and agenda-driven activists, led by the Legal Aid Society and other public defender groups, have used this as an opportunity to demand the total emptying of our jails. In an egregious example, legal aid attorneys successfully petitioned the court for the release of a 77-year-old Staten Island defendant who had tested positive for COVID-19 while at Rikers Island after being charged with the course of sexual conduct against a child for allegedly abusing a minor on multiple occasions. Over our objections, but with the blessings of the city, this COVID positive defendant was released into a city run nursing complex on Roosevelt Island, where it was later reported that over 70 patients had thereafter become infected with coronavirus. It is unfathomable that the city would place a COVID positive inmate in the same facilities as law abiding and high risk New Yorkers. But sadly, this is the state of our current reality. While our concerns are many, we remain most dismayed by the other dismissal the city has shown toward the victims of crime. Many defendants are being released equipped with cab fare, cell phones, and a key to a hotel room, regardless of the crime they committed or their current health condition. Ironically, few if any of these resources have been made available to the victims who are also at risk especially domestic violence survivors in women's shelters or children being for, uh, cared for and forced to homes. I think it's also been quite clear by the testimony here today that in many cases, those who find themselves incarcerated on Rikers Island over the course of this pandemic have had access to more testing and more health care than the average New Yorker, and certainly sad to say, that the death rates on Staten Island, a different island, have been higher than those of those who find themselves incarcerated on Rikers because of the uh, coronavirus. Again, we have to be compassionate for those who are incarcerated uh, in our uh, penal system. But at the same time, we cannot use this crisis as a reason uh, to let those uh, fulfill their longstanding agendas to decarcerate our society. As long as individuals commit crimes, which are acts against individual victims or society uh, and against the norms of those society, then we have to have a system that provides for their accountability as well as provides for those who are the victims of crimes. The so-called decarceration or emptying of our jails does not provide that in any way. One area that I would like to also discuss uh, is uh, some proposed legislation 
uh, that the council is considering, and in particular, the local release commission in New York City, I am compelled to express my deep reservations on both practical and constitutional grounds. As is in my written uh, testimony, there is a uh, series of cases that would call into question the constitutional authority that this uh, commission would have as it takes away the power uh, from a sentencing judge to set the sentence of someone who's convic convicted of a crime. And the other problem, uh, as my colleague, uh, Special Prosecutor Bridget Brennan mentioned, uh, is that the history of this commission uh, is, is, is uh, questionable at best. Uh, I, in fact, I was a member of the city council back in 2004 uh, when the commission uh, was uh, alleged and then proven to have been involved uh, in a conspiracy and bribery uh, around the sentence of State Senator Guy Valella, uh, who had been convicted on numerous counts of conspiracy uh, and bribery relating to a scheme where Valella and his co-defendants uh, received money over a period of time to allow uh, uh, public works construction projects. Uh, the commission at that time uh, reduced uh, a year long sentence to 12 weeks uh, and uh, did not follow its procedures. Uh, and uh, at that time, Mayor Bloomberg accepted the resignation of all the members of the commission and allowed it uh, to expire in 2005. And this was not the only allegation made against this commission. Given the fact that the, the jurisdiction of this commission would be so limited, uh, given the fact that it calls into question constitutional uh, abrogations of a judge's power, uh, I believe that this uh, legislation should be uh, rejected by the city council. We've done so much on Staten Island and indeed across our city to make the justice system more equitable. Uh, and sanctions more appropriate for those who have been convicted of violating our laws. One need not look, not look further uh, than the population of Rikers Island, which is lower than it has been since the 1940s, for proof that our city's criminal justice apparatus has sought every uh, opportunity to divert offenders out of the criminal justice system and into meaningful engagement with pro-social services. The proliferation of exceptional community providers who offer uh, quality mental health and drug treatment, batter intervention, neighborhood placemaking, and other programs is evidence that we are continuing to move beyond incarceration as the only tool to hold offenders accountable. We must not be so naive as to think that there is no need for incarceration and that cutting short judicial sentences in line with the laws of our state should be the norm as opposed to the exception. Any crime committed by someone who was released before the conclusion of their sentence represents a failing, not just of that individual, but of the system and the safeguards put in place to ensure the offender's safe reintegration into the community. And so the commission and all the early releases that are continue to be considered by the city unnecessarily creates more opportunities for such a failing. In conclusion, let me note that we have seen several serious crimes committed in the last weeks on Staten Island, including the double homicide of a pregnant woman and her boyfriend and multiple unrelated arrests relating to the possession of large caches of weapons, including improvised explosive devices or IEDs, flamethrowers, and yes, I said flamethrowers, and dozens of firearms. At each arraignment, we successfully argued for bail or remand to be set, and these defendants currently remain incarcerated pending trial. But based on what we have seen from ad the advocates so thus far, it would come as no surprise to see calls for their release without any accountability as well. The delusional mission to empty all jails will make us less safe in the end, especially the victims whose voices continue to be ignored throughout this crisis, as they have been for far too long. As Justice Benjamin Cardozo said, justice, though due to the accused, is due the accuser also. As we struggle every day to contain the coronavirus pandemic, our elected le leaders need to serve all New Yorkers, not just the loudest and most extreme. Again, I thank you for your attention and time and look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you. Next, we have Director Jill Harris. Director Harris. 
Thank you, Chairman Lansman, Chairman Powers, members of the committees on criminal justice and the justice system for this opportunity to testify regarding COVID-19 in city jails and juvenile detention facilities. My name is Jill Harris, and I am the Chief of Policy and Strategy in the Office of Brooklyn District Attorney Eric Gonzalez. When the first cases of COVID-19 were reported in New York, it became immediately clear to all of us who work in the criminal justice system that jails and prisons would be hard hit by the virus and that it would be essential to reduce the number of people on Rikers Island to slow the spread of this deadly disease. From the earliest days of the health crisis, the Brooklyn DA's office has acted urgently and intentionally to reduce the number of people from Brooklyn who are detained on Rikers, where doing so would not create an undue risk of harm to any person or to the public. DA Gonzalez views it as his solemn responsibility to keep his constituents safe and he understands that his constituents include people who are incarcerated. During this public health emergency, in trying to do our part to reduce the jail population, our office has had to strike a balance between protecting the health and safety of people incarcerated at Rikers and those who work there by consenting to releases that will reduce the population and allow for more social distancing. And on the other hand, protecting victims of crime and the public by supporting the continued detention of individuals who we believe would be likely to commit further acts of violence if released. Striking this balance in favor of releasing someone is especially challenging in Brooklyn because of the work our office has already done to reduce incarceration. Before the pandemic, we had already taken aggressive steps to ensure that we were not incarcerating people on low level cases because we view jail and prison as extraordinary responses that should not be sought if a non-jail alternative is available that will not endanger the public. DA Gonzalez changed our office's bail policy well before last year's changes in state law, instructing our ADAs to consent to release at arraignments unless public safety or risk of flight in serious cases demanded that we seek bail or remand in a particular case. And of course, we've diverted countless people into services and programs to address the circumstances in their lives that contributed to their criminal offenses rather than simply seeking to lock them up. So if we ask a court to incarcerate someone, it is because we believe that public safety requires it. But the pandemic has forced us to change our calculus and we are revisiting even those cases in light of the risk of infection on Rikers Island. We have been going through our Rikers cases involving individuals who because of age or underlying health condition may be particularly vulnerable to serious illness if they contract COVID-19. In some cases, we have received lists of names from the mayor's office or from the corrections health services. In other cases, defense attorneys have reached out to us asking us to consent to their client's release. Many cases have been brought as writs and in others we have simply asked our ADAs to review their own cases for possible release in light of the health emergency. DA Gonzalez has put together a small team of senior executives to help him conduct these reviews. We've done a case by case review to determine what if any conditions would allow us to consent to a person's release without putting a victim or the public at undue risk. In many cases, this has meant working with defense counsel and service providers to provide su to find supportive housing, drug and mental health treatment and other services to support the person released and reduce the danger to the public. And you can imagine how challenging this has been during this extraordinary situation. Our team has also considered cases where the person may not have any special health vulnerability but in the interest of reducing the population at Rikers to permit more opportunity for social distancing, we might consent to their release. And so from March 12th to May 15th, the number of people on Rikers Island from Brooklyn dropped by 316 people, a decrease of 28%. And our reviews are ongoing. There have been cases where we have opposed release, gotten new information, gone back and reviewed the cases. The cases, as I said, are ongoing. DA Gonzalez has personally reviewed every single one of these cases. The decisions were often difficult, but we feel comfortable that we've been striking the appropriate balance. In cases that have victims, which is most of these cases, we have reached out to the victims when we were considering releasing the person charged with hurting them, getting their opinions, and if necessary, helping them with safety planning, including orders of protection, getting locks changed, or potentially relocating. And these services are especially critical in domestic violence cases, as I'm sure you can appreciate. The individuals we did not consent to release are charged with very serious violent crimes, including armed robberies, rapes, 
murder, attempted murder, and very brutal domestic violence assaults. And in these cases, we have very strong evidence. Mindful as we are of the conditions on Rikers and the health risks to those confined there, these are not individuals we feel comfortable releasing into our neighborhoods in Brooklyn. So here's where we are. Not everyone who's in Rikers can get out. Some people need to stay there. We can't free them all because there are people who, if they get out, will hurt other people. But as we can all agree, no one deserves to die of COVID-19 either. And that makes it incumbent on the city and the agencies you have heard from today to see to the health and the safety of the people in their charge. The population of Rikers Island, as you've heard, once hovered over 20,000 and has now reached an historic low in the midst of this pandemic. It's now below 4,000. I hope that the steps that our office and other DA's offices have taken to reduce those numbers will make it easier for the Department of Corrections to implement appropriate sanitation and social distancing to keep their staffs and the remaining inmate population safe. Every life is valuable and DA Gonzalez stands ready to cooperate with our city partners and with the council in any way necessary to ensure that those who must remain in detention to protect the public can be held there safely. Um, thank you for your attention to this important issue, for giving us the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, I haven't um, talked about any of the bills you're discussing in my remarks, but happy to answer questions about those or any other questions you might have. Thank you. Now we have Chief Assistant District Attorney Linton. You may begin. Good afternoon, Chairman Lansman, Powers, members of the committee on Criminal Justice and the Justice Committee. I am Derek Linton, the Chief Assistant District Attorney for the Office of the District Attorney, Darcel D. Clark. I am honored by this opportunity to address you on behalf of District Attorney Clark on a topic that is just as important as it is necessary. The road that led the Bronx District Attorney's Office to this moment began in March 2020 when the impact of COVID-19 forced the city and state to close its church and school doors, redefining the way we work and live. We share a passion for justice, and we as prosecutors are uniquely positioned to administer justice. The Bronx District Attorney's Office serves 1.4 million people in the Bronx, including 3,800 people who walk the halls of Rikers Island jails. They matter and are just as important as every New Yorker who shelters in place throughout the city. DA Clark in her wisdom and concern for employees began the difficult task of reducing the density of our office in early March before imposing the mandates regarding essential workers. This was achieved with clear instruction that social distancing and remote work will not interfere with our shared commitment to pursue justice with integrity. Accordingly, when the office received its first of many lists from the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice requesting our assistance in reducing the population at Rikers Island, it was an understandable but challenging undertaking that embraced DA East Clark's policy of a safer Bronx through fair justice. I will explain. Since January 2016, the Bronx District Attorney's Office has performed a rigorous and intentional approach to case evaluation that has resulted in historic lows in the population at Rikers Island. Whether misdemeanor or felony, every case is purposefully evaluated and subjected to several tiers of supervisory review with the idea that freedom from incarceration is the starting point along with consideration of available services to address the wellness and mental health of the defendants as an alternative to jail or prison. With this philosophy in mind, we began the consuming task of carefully and methodically reviewing each case on each list. First, we reviewed the newly sentenced list, which was soon followed by the parolees over 50 years old, then those of 50 years old incarcerated under $10,000 bail, and defendants under 50 years old held by $10,000 bail. We conferenced each and every case with particular attention to those who were on the city sentence inmate list. The technical parole violations and the cases that were approved by, for release by the New York Police Department. Thereafter, we evaluated the cases of the 300 inmates, 76 involved Bronx cases that were released 
without consulting the office. Further, there was the list of vulnerable pre-trial detainees, vulnerable youth offenders, and consideration of those under 50 on the geriatrics and complex care lists. All of these lists were evaluated daily and required extensive conversations with the defense bar. I mentioned this list of categories as a reminder of all the efforts we made to consider the public health impact of our Rikers residents. Our process to case assessment is intentionally rigorous and requires a thoughtful analysis of the circumstances of each particular defendant. We consider questions such as, why has the defendant committed the offense? What is the criminal record and the nature of her offense? Do we know enough about the defendant to understand who he, she is? Does the person have a history of mental illness or addiction? Have we considered the collateral effects of incarceration on the family of this defendant? Will the Bronx community be best served by incarceration? Is there a suitable alternative to incarceration? All assistants are strongly encouraged to engage the defense bar in meaningful conversations with an eye towards exploring the possibility of resolving the case at its earliest stages. Then each case on the lists were reviewed by the division chief, the alternatives to incarceration chiefs, and the chief assistant. Some cases required several conversations with key stakeholders in the defense bar, along with approval from the final decider, DA Clark. As we discuss those who are incarcerated, As we discuss those who are incarcerated, I must remind you that there are victims who are impacted by our decisions. Upon addressing criminal justice reform, we cannot forget those who continue to suffer from those unspeakable acts of violence and continue to receive services for their traumas. Accordingly, while we attempt to reduce the population of people in jails and prisons for noble and just reasons, we cannot continue to do so at the risk of neglecting the closure, healing, safety, and health of the victim. Some of the most heart-wrenching conversations occur when ADAs must explain to victims of serious violent crime and survivors of sexual abuse that the person who caused their injury is about to be released. You can understand how this impacts their sense of safety and security, changing their lives forever. It is difficult to explain why a man who gouged out a woman's eye and then attempted to do the same to the other eye may be released. Or why the man who wrapped his hand so tightly around his partner's neck, causing permanent paralysis in one arm was considered a candidate for release. In essence, we must balance this public health crisis presented by a global pandemic with our understanding of public safety. As prosecutors, we have an important duty to protect our victims who we serve and keep our communities safe above all else. Herein lies the important and delicate balance for a prosecutor. In particular, protecting the life of the convicted and protecting the safety of the community. This is the life of the prosecutor in the time of COVID. In the Bronx District Attorney's Office, our compass is informed by DA Clark's vision. We can proudly announce that reform began for us way before January 2, 2020. Our bail policies were in place before criminal justice reform was law. This is why the process of bail review and writs of habeas have posed such a challenge. The decision to send someone to jail is serious. When we were asked to review what we had already determined was fair, and appropriate in light of our own policy and criminal justice reforms. We did so with the victims in mind, along with a desire to address a public health crisis and to save lives. However, violent conduct cannot be left unaddressed. Where there is responsibility, there will be accountability meted out with a fair and measured hand. As to your bill creating a local conditional release commission, I would like to briefly highlight a few reasons why DA Clark is unable to endorse your proposed amendment. Simply stated, while this bill attempts to cure what it deems as deficiencies 
within the parole system, the commission's goal undercuts the victim's voice. That is the promise of the negotiated sentences made on behalf of a victim. Further, the proposed bill has ambiguity and contradictory language. In addition, it is arbitrary in deciding those who are selected for the commission since many with relevant experience seem to be excluded, namely judges, justices, and prosecutors. Again, for these reasons, DA Clark does not support this bill. In conclusion, I would like to thank you for this important opportunity to speak with you and provide a voice for fairness, justice, and recognition that the community as a whole includes the victims of crime and our Rikers Island residents. I wish you and yours safety and health as we all work together to navigate the unprecedented challenge of balancing public health and public safety during a global pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Chief, Exec Chief Executive Director, um, District Attorney Nyberg, you're next. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank Chairperson Lanskin and Chairperson Powers for the opportunity to appear and testify virtually before you today. My name is Jennifer Nyberg and I'm the Chief Assistant District Attorney for the Office of the District Attorney, Queens County DA, Melinda Katz. When District Attorney Katz took office on January 1st, she immediately went to work to make significant policy changes to reduce our city's jail population. She is committed to ultimately ending cash bail and feels strongly that a person's financial status should not be a factor in determining whether or not they are incarcerated pretrial. Since day one, we closely reviewed each and every request for bail to make sure that all defendants are treated fairly while also maintaining the safety of the residents of Queens County and the assurance that the defendants return to court. Before COVID-19 hit, we had already succeeded in lowering the average bail set by nearly $5,000 less than compared to the same period last year, 2019. In addition, 75% of those charged with bail qualifying offenses were released either on their own recognizance or with supervision. On January 1st, 2020, when District Attorney Katz took office, there were 1,100 inmates in custody on Queens County cases. By February 1st, that number dropped to under 900. As of May 14th, under 560 inmates remain in custody. That's a 50% reduction in the jail population of those in Queens cases since District Attorney Katz took office. Then in early March, when the coronavirus hit, we ramped up our efforts. We reviewed multiple lists of vulnerable groups of inmates, as well as multiple, multiple individual requests. We did and continue to identify those we could consent to release by either a resentence or disposition that would effectuate release or reduction of bail. We, just like the other district attorneys have uh, testified to, established a protocol with multiple levels of review, with each and every case ultimately being reviewed by me or the district attorney in many instances herself. We have spoken to DOC and CHS, the mayor's office, the Department of Probation about standards of care, about protocols, about housing and services available. Most importantly, we look at the circumstances surrounding each inmate's incarceration the underlying facts of each individual case. We too speak to the victims when appropriate. We look at the inmates health history when provided. We look at a discharge plan when provided. We examine whether a defendant has a, is a flight risk or has community ties. The interests of justice are best served by these thoughtful case specific resolutions. If an individual remains incarcerated at this point, rest assured that the balance of public health and the balance of public safety were carefully weighed and that this remains the most appropriate 
and just decision in light of all the facts and circumstances surrounding the crime. Finally, District Attorney Katz would like to comment on the proposed amendment to the New York City Charter to create a local conditional release commission. It is the district attorney's position that the parole board, the parole board is uniquely situated to make the most informed determination for conditional release. History, uh, as Dean McMahon uh, commented, has proven that local conditional release commissions are not the better choice in making these critical determinations. By all accounts, the city's previous commission had many problems. On the other hand, the parole board, a larger body with much broader and, and in-depth experience and knowledge has aptly handled conditional release decisions since that time. And at no additional cost to the city, an important consideration, frankly, given the economic impact COVID-19 will have on the city budget. To take the decision of early conditional release out of the hands of the parole board and place it in the hands of a few appointed members with minimal relevant background and experience could greatly jeopardize public safety and would create an unnecessary expense for an already overburdened city budget. On both accounts, it is a price that we simply cannot afford. I wanna thank you uh, for this opportunity to appear before you today. And I look forward to working with you and your staff as we uh, navigate these challenges these challenging times and move forward in the months ahead. Thank you. Thank you. We will now turn it over to Chair Lansman for questions. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, do very much appreciate your being with us this afternoon, particularly since uh, tomorrow we will be seeing all of your offices again, but uh, I hope you understand, I know you understand that these are the times that we, we live in. So what are you gonna do? Um, I wanna start with something that's a little big picture. It's, it's gnawing at me and, and nothing would make me happier than for each of you to say, Rory, you don't know what you're talking about. That's not true. I get the sense from you collectively that there is a suspicion or, or, or a lack of conviction that there really is a sense of urgency of getting people off, off Rikers Island, that the situation at Rikers Island is um, not as serious in terms of the, the, the negative health consequences as, as we and, 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 and maybe the administration believe as, as, as well. Um, Mr. McMahon, in, in your testimony, you, you described, quote, an outright falsehood that the infection rate in the city's jails is significantly higher than the city's general population. And um, uh, the special narcotics prosecutor cites statistics. DOC reports daily on the number of inmates who are under observation, either because they're symptomatic or because they have tested positive for COVID-19. And that number has steadily declined from April 1st to May 16th from 286 inmates, from 286 to 66 inmates. I, I don't wanna mischaracterize your use of that, those statistics, but the, 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 what we've been talking about today is, is I think the fairest statistic that according to the Board of Corrections today, well, as of, as of Monday, uh, Sunday, May 17th, there were 364 inmates at um, <clears throat> in, the, in the Department of Corrections who were uh, tested uh, positive for COVID-19. That's a 9.2% infection rate. That is um, a fraction of the identified positive rate for New York City residents at large. Both the administration, the administration in terms of, um, uh, I, think, I think Liz Glazer and, and um, CHS and, and Commissioner Brand being as diplomatic as they could acknowledge that there's a much more serious risk of people contracting COVID-19 at Rikers Island, of having a serious re, um, a, a, a result. And in the letter that the DAs sent, I think it was um, the March 29th letter, you wrote, I believe we'll find onto this, just give me a second. 
Uh, you expressed concern that the administration was, quote, creating a public perception that our city's jails may be incapable of providing sufficient health care for the remaining population of inmates. And you go on to say that we believe this perception is wrong. So, so can we can we clear the air? Can you please disabuse me of my 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 incorrect interpretation? You all do accept that 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 um, there is a serious serious health issue at Rikers Island, and that um, the rate of 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 people testing positive on Rikers Island is higher than, than the general public and 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 that there's some impetus must be balanced with other concerns of trying to get people off Rikers Island if we can. Who wants to go first? Sure. Uh, I'd be glad to am I coming through? I yes, don't sir. Yeah. I'd be glad to disabuse you of that notion, uh, Chairman, uh, that we don't take the situation at Rikers seriously. Uh, that is why we uh, really, uh, you know, in some ways uh, put the, the uh, health of our staffs at risk by making them work immediately during the shutdown so that we could go through the analyses uh, that my colleagues and their staffs uh, uh, described earlier uh, in uh, going through and making sure that we can find people who are suitable for a compassionate release so we get it. Uh, but I think you're, and, and to some extent, mixing apples and oranges a little bit. I think even the, 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 the team from CHS made quite clear to you that, and to the, this committee, that you can't compare infection rates uh, exactly when one cohort, namely the people who are at Rikers Island, are 100% tested, and the general uh, public, I believe, the overall testing number, um, it was at one point was around 10%. I don't know what it is today. Um, I think if you tested everyone in, in, in society in, in New York City, you'd have a much higher infection rate. But what we're saying is, is that Rikers Island, you have a population now that has been vetted for compassionate release. Uh, as you heard, they are at uh, under 50% uh, capacity in terms of housing. There's plenty of room for social distancing. They have uh, protocols in place, uh, and both the docs and CHS spoke to the uh, care that the uh, uh, inmates receive there. Um, I, I, I would uh, counter by saying that one could get the impression from what you've been saying and what members of the committee are saying is that people who commit crimes and who are either awaiting trial for very serious offenses or have been convicted of those fence, uh, offenses uh, with quite often, take, after taking pleas with the consultation of victims and the concerns of victims taking in, taken into consideration, uh, that they should be released uh, just because they should be released because uh, there's a, 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 a crisis that affects the whole society, the whole community. Um, crimes are being committed. And, and, and you know, I, 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 I almost get a a, a kick out of uh, the, at one point early on in the crisis, there were the advocates who were saying there should be a moratorium on arrests, there should be a moratorium on prosecution, and there should be a moratorium on incarceration. How about a moratorium on crime? How about the people who continue to be robbed, uh, burgled, um, taken advantage of through fraud, uh, murdered in some cases, as we had a terrible case, a pregnant woman and, and another man here on Staten Island. These things are still happening. Shootings are still happening. Young people are, 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 are victims of crime. Old people are um, elderly are, are victims of crime. Um, so to say that you uh, somehow read through our pronouncements and, and what we've been at ad our advocacy, uh, that we don't take the situation there seriously, we take it seriously everywhere. But in the, in the, uh, in the example that I gave, if you take someone from Rikers Island who's convicted of a, a series of sexual assaults against a, a minor and say because they're uh, con uh, uh, infected with COVID, they should go into a city nursing home and infect all the, uh, the civilians in the nursing home, uh, I don't quite understand that either. So with all due respect, I think we see this from a from different perspective than you do. Uh, chairman, uh, but quite uh, honestly, I think we all want the same thing. We want a city that is safe, 
uh, that is healthy. Uh, and hopefully we can get there uh, by some meeting of the minds. And I think you've heard today from all our offices that we went to great lengths to reduce that population uh, at Rikers. Even Dr. McDonald, uh, who as from his famous tweets was very critical of, of law enforcement uh, was of the opinion today that great strides have been taken. And quite frankly, we're quite proud of the work that we've done. Thank you, Ms. Brennan. Yeah. I don't think that we believe that there is no crisis at Rikers. I mean, clearly when you have uh, a setup as they do at Rikers where people are living together in such close circumstances, there's a higher chance of infection. Um, I, I think the point that I was trying to make is, and it was made also by the people from Corrections Health Services, that those at Rikers are tested at a much higher rate. And so necessarily, they're going to prove to be positive at a much higher rate, as we've seen in the city. As the test has become more available throughout the city, the city has tested at a, at a higher rate. But it doesn't mean that the problem lacks urgency. You heard, certainly you've heard from us, but you also heard from Director Glazer You've heard from others that we all worked really hard from the beginning of this crisis to review all the cases that were brought to us of the people who were in Rikers, the people who were vulnerable. We reviewed those cases to see whether or not we felt comfortable consenting to release. And the, our discomfort was whether those people would jeopardize public safety. It's a commitment to the people of the city of New York, but it wasn't because we didn't value the lives of those people who are incarcerated. We certainly do. There's a balance that goes on. That was the point that I was making. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to have been corrected. Do any of the other officers wanna, offices wanna say anything on that subject or we could move on? Good. Um, can, can each of you tell me how many defendants you consented to release, um, whether you want to call it compassionate release or, or whatever you want to call it in response to this, this process of trying to get, um, uh, people released from, from Rikers Island? Who wants to start first? Mr. Uh, Linton, Mr. Linton, you're, you're, you're flipping through papers, you look like- Well, I can say that we, we consented to close to 100 um, inmates. Um, I believe um, close to um, mid 80s of those people were, were actually released um, on our consent. Overall, we released over 140, perhaps close to 150 inmates in total. Um, like I said before, the process of our evaluating um, the eligibility of, of those who committed crimes to go to, to, to jail started before this. And so we had been doing this for quite some time. And so, you know, we, we experienced the same challenges that a number of offices did that when this um, crisis hit and we were forced to reevaluate cases of inmates who we had deemed in prison or in jail for fair and a balanced evaluation between um, public safety and, and health, um, we were now forced to view this new category of cases through a different lens, a different prism, if you will. And that was through the, the, the prism of COVID-19 and that we did. And to echo what um, Special Prosecutor Brennan said, we did this with the same degree of urgency that that the, the entire world is experiencing. And so there was nothing lost on how urgent this was. The, the overriding compulsion for us, however, was the desperate need to maintain public safety. We had a responsibility to meet the commitment that we had made to our constituents, those who had elected DA Clark to be in office, that we were going to keep them as safe as possible. And those who were in jail were those who had committed some of the most violent and vicious crimes. And even then, in, in consortium with the defense bar, we did not refuse to evaluate every, every single case. 
And some of these cases we reviewed over and over again. You know, at first yeah. they, they came on a so list the number, and then they came as a bail yeah. review and then a habeas so the, and we still number, review that. Ms. Billington, thank you. So the number from the Bronx is about 140? In total, we consented to, to over 90, close to 100. So what are the other 40 ones that were released? Over well, your there were others that were released without our consent. Okay, so so consented to about 90, 90 or 100. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, Ms. Harris from Brooklyn, do you have a number? Alana, can you uh, unmute Ms. Harris? Alana, paging Alana. I did. There you are. Am I, am I, can you hear me? We can hear you now. Yeah. Great. Um, with respect to your prior question, um, I think I said in my testimony that we understood immediately um, the crisis that we thought was going to unfold even before it did, and we started to take actions to reduce the population on Rikers. Um, we reviewed virtually every case of someone incarcerated at Rikers, nearly a thousand cases. Um, we consented to the release of 260. Um, that's about 27%. We opposed release in 682. That's about uh, the other percent, 70. Um, there are another cat a third category of about 34 people, 30 between 30 and 35 people who. Um, we aren't comfortable consenting to their release because they're dangerous um, and they're dangerous by virtue of mental health issues. They, they get off their meds, they become destabilized, they don't have a place to go, they, go, they would be released to a shelter. Um, and those are people who in some universe might be appropriate candidates for release, but because of, um, just because of the nature of their illness, we're just not comfortable doing that. Um, Good. So and that's about- 30 some cases. All right, don't, don't anticipate my next question. Give, you gotta give me something to do here. Okay. Um, all right, uh, Queens. Thank you. Uh, uh, Chairperson uh, Lanceman, the in Queens County, whether they have asked specifically uh, individual requests from defense attorneys or whether uh, they were included on lists by the mayor uh, that we looked at in the beginning of the crisis for the first few weeks. There were 440 inmates who were considered individually uh, by senior staff in, in the office. 42 of those inmates we consented to release and 170 of those inmates were released without our objection or, or we remained silent. For example, they were in on a parole hold. And, and we left that uh, decision up to parole. Do you know, by the way, how many of those, of the 170, how many were released on your on your specific objection, as opposed to you know your not offering an opinion? Uh, of the 170, we were we did not object. Those were 170 released without our objection specifically. Oh, sorry. That's okay. What was the 42 number? Where we consented. So in other words, with respect to parolees, where we affirmatively consented are the 42. I get it. And the 170 was you didn't, you didn't object. Exactly. You didn't consent, but you didn't object. That's exactly right. Because we didn't think when it came to parole that that was our, uh, they were better situated. There were non-qualifying offenses, for example. Got it. We had pending here in Queens on, on many of those cases many of which ultimately we tried to resolve through a disposition. We're continuing to do that. Got it, got it. Okay, Mr. McMahon. Hold on, hold on. There you go. I'm good to go? Yes, sir. Um, as you know, and, and has been discussed by my colleagues, um, there have really been some different silos that we've been looking at. Uh, through this analysis, uh, because people are on Rikers for a, a few different reasons. Uh, there's the group of parole violators, which as you know, we DAs and actually the city had no say over their uh, situation. That's a state function uh, by, um, by the, the state parole. Um, and so the, the numbers are always changing a little bit. And then you also have people who 
um, are being released on a rolling basis if they're at the end of their sentence. Uh, so the number's changing every day. But from the original analysis that we were asked to look at, those who were uh, on Rikers for a, 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 a sentence as a, a year or less um, and under certain charges, there was a list of 30 from Staten Island. We agreed to seven, uh, but 30 were, uh, I should say, from the list that they presented us, we agreed to seven, uh, 30 were released, so uh, 23 over our objection. Um, and there's another group, the, those who are held as pretrial detainees uh, and we've been uh, dealing with a battery of uh, bail applications uh, and writs of habe for habeas corpus on a rolling basis through the courts as well. Uh, the majority of those we have opposed. Have you um, consented to, to any pretrial releases? Uh, I will get back to you on the, on the exact number, but of how many have been made and how, how many we've uh, uh, consented to, but uh, the number is low because, again, those are people uh, who are charged with serious crimes to, for, to begin with. That's the reason that uh, they have qualifying offenses uh, and um, they um, are being held on either bail or on remand. So in most instances, no, but I'll get back to you with an exact number. Thank you. We appreciate that. Um, Ms. Brennan? Um I only have the numbers for those who are held on bail. I don't have the numbers before me of those who, uh, where there was a request for a 6A release and we took a position and with regard to parole release. So that setting aside, uh, we received requests regarding 40 defendants. Of those 40, 17 were released with our consent as part of our review process. And we oppose the applications uh, with respect to 23 defendants, uh, and none of those defendants have been released. Got it. All right. Um, last question, which uh, Ms. Harris uh, uh, almost, you know, stole from me. Um, but here's an opportunity for you all to tell us how how we, on 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 our side of the screen, could do better. Although in conjunction with you, um, what? programs, services, systems could have been in place, could be put in place that would make, potentially make you more comfortable and more willing to release more people in different categories. You know, Ms. Harris was talking about people with mental health issues. What infrastructure could be, could be, could be in place that would make it more likely for you to support these kinds, the, the, this kind of decarceration effort. Uh, Ms. With, okay, with ahead. regard to our cases, it would be tough. We have those who are currently incarcerated on our cases are mostly charged with operating as a major trafficker. They're involved in multi kilo operations where they're distributing drugs that have resulted in death, and they have strong foreign connections to other countries access to lots of cash. Um, and oftentimes they may have been arrested with a significant number of weapons. And so those kinds of defendants, you know, pose a significant public safety risk. It's hard when you get to that level of defendant, which I think is what you're going to hear from most of us. That's who's kind of of our caseload it's that type of defendant who is left or one who's been involved in significant amounts of violence or is charged, I should say, with crimes involving very significant violence as, as I discuss. Uh, and so that's where you have, a, I, I mean, on balance, uh, and especially as we look at diminishing now risks posed to the defendants as Rikers has been cleared out and as the virus is receding somewhat, Obviously, we have our, you know, our mission is to protect the people in the city of New York. And there's a balancing that goes on, but when their lives are at risk, we're not going to consent to release. I understand. Ms. Harris? So in addition to treatment, um, housing, supportive housing is crucial. Um, and I think one of the biggest needs is our mental health facilities that are secure. So if you think about the person who 
um, has assaults and violations of orders of protection against a family member, you know, and maybe they've, you know, they go back, they get out, they go, they can, they assault them, you know, they start fires, you know, they do things to put not only their family members, but others in danger. And it's because they're suffering from a mental health problem. And the family members in a lot of those cases don't really want their person to be in jail. They know they have a mental health problem and they need help. Um, but they also don't want them to just go somewhere to a hotel or a shelter, wherever they would get released to, and then just walk out the door and come home and continue to assault them. So if there were um, more secure mental health facilities where a person would be getting treatment, um, but would be secure, wouldn't be able to walk around the streets, they wouldn't need to be a Rikers Island. Um, but those kind of places are few and far between. And I know there are also, you know, sort of legal limitations to the extent to which people can be held. Um, for mental health conditions, but that would be that would make us feel a lot more comfortable in many of these cases where mental health is the biggest issue. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I, I would second that, um, and um, uh, actually uh, both comments. Uh, but because because we, I think we all agree that um, there are for many people who find themselves in the system, uh, what they need is the support of programs that we can connect them to. Um, and uh, with, you know, we just kicked off on Staten Island Project Reset. Uh, and again, those are for misdemeanant uh, recidivists uh, who are, it was not uh, uh, addiction related because as you know, we have the whole program here and uh, my colleagues have that as well. Again, diversion early at, upon the time of arrest, uh, uh, a pre-arraignment. And we'd like to do that with other charges, similar charges as well. And in fact, uh, thank you and your colleagues at the council, because I think it's a grant from the council to CCI that's allowing us to do that. Uh, we would like to have a full blown community justice center here on Staten Island so we can do more, um, more services for those who find themselves uh, in the criminal justice system or in the precipice of going into it. Um, be, you know, we really, we see, uh, uh, you go through the arrest reports and you see day after day, those who continue to get arrested for crimes that we know uh, and all agree that Rikers Island or any place of incarceration is not going, is not what society uh, should impose. It's not a way to, to impose accountability or support so that that cycle breaks. So uh, I think there's a lot of room for us to collaborate in that area. We know that the city's coming upon tough budgets um, in the next go around, but anyway, you can help us and build out and create more of those uh, programs and, and programs. I think all of uh, us throughout the city are, are looking forward to doing that. Any other office wanna uh, respond to that? Well, Councilman, if, um, since our colleague from Staten Island weighed in on Project Reset, um, I'd like to also put in a plug for Project Reset in Brooklyn, which has been a very successful way that we've kept people out of jail. Um, and we would like to see it continue. We ask for your help in that. And I'd also like to add something that I uh, stated in my testimony. What we find is that uh, oftentimes, it, you know, defendants reoffend when they get out. And none of us want to see them cycling through over and over again. But most of the supervisory programs that I've seen uh, focus on, uh, they don't have a mechanism for intervening, you know. Uh, the only mechanism for intervening is call the police and have them arrested, which we don't want to do. But you have to build in some kind of support or some kind of way to address that. Uh, because otherwise, people are going to be clamoring for them to be arrested again, uh, since they're put at risk, even though we may consider it a low level nonviolent offense. And so we have to consider not just programs that that are gonna support and offer the defendants uh, ways to change their behavior, but how do we intervene outside of arrest when they do uh, violate laws if we don't wanna get into this cycle again? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm actually glad that we had a chance to, to go over this topic um, here today. Tomorrow we'll, I think, go, uh, um, say more smoothly, not that this wasn't smooth, but, but, but tomorrow we can focus on other things. Um, I hand it back to the committee council for my co-chairs uh, 
questions and, and other members questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Chair Powers for questions. Thank you. I'm I'm going to keep it fairly limited because we do have a lot of time, a lot of people from the public who are here waiting and we have two more agencies. I want to say just say two things. One is thank you for everybody for being here and testifying. Thank you to uh, the DA and all the representatives, DA McMahon and all the representatives uh, and, and Ms. Brennan and all the other uh, representatives. I will say I am tremendously disappointed that, that the, my, my own district attorney from Manhattan is not here or represented in any fashion or form. And I disagree with some of the things that have been said here by some of the DAs and the, some of the sentiment, but that's fine. We can have a disagreement. My, the district attorney from Manhattan deciding not to even be here in the midst of a crisis to talk about even issues that we might disagree on or have, I just want to register on the record my, you know, absolute um, uh, uh, disappointment in, in that. And, um, and that's, that's not a political thing or anything. That is just somebody from his office should have been here and should be talking to what's happening here in Manhattan. Um, anyway, that moving on, I, I just want to address one point here, which is um, in the letter that um, you had sent, the district attorneys collectively had sent to, uh, to um, Mayor de Blasio and the DOC commissioner in March, you mentioned a creating a public perception that our city's jails may be incapable of providing sufficient health care for the remaining population of the inmates. Uh, and believe that you and the collective belief that the perception is wrong. I, I want to reflect just something the, the 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 doctor from the DOH himself, the number two doctor, had said that that was the that was reflecting the the idea that jails and particularly the city jails in Rikers Island are 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 not are, are incapable of providing sufficient health care, not from a talent of the healthcare professionals, but from a environment of what the environment what the environment is there that that's 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 a that's a medical professional giving us that opinion and so i would be cared to hear why the da's believe that that medical we should, we should not listen to that medical professional when it comes to um or or, when, or why you believe we're creating a public perception that we're incapable of providing sufficient health care when we are listening to the to, to the number two doctor at CHS, sure, I, I'll be glad to to uh, respond to that, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, clearly, uh, in March, uh, the situation uh, needed to be addressed uh, from uh, two directions. First was to look through the roles of people who are at Rikers to see if if there could be uh, some people who could be released, so that you had less of uh, of uh, uh, population, which would make then. Uh, the provision of uh, good uh, and accepted uh, medical care and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, distancing, social distancing and, and, and proper PPE and prevention. Um, and that's what we did. We worked with the city to uh, go through the list to see if there was some room for compassionate release. And I think you heard that that was done. And you not only heard it from us, but you heard it from uh, the medical team from CHS, as well as uh, the commissioner and her team from DOC. But the point we were making there was you can't close down Rikers completely. There is still a need for jails in the city of New York as long as people commit crimes. Um, and there are those who think that we're saying at the time, no, we should have a moratorium on arrest, on prosecution, and on uh, incarceration. And you can't have that. You can't have that in a, in a civil society that wants to have some modicum of order, especially during a crisis like the one that we've been facing for the last 90 or 100 days. What we were saying was, hey, yes, we'll work with you to bring down the population, but get your acts together on the side of, of using the available space on Rikers, provide the appropriate medical care, open into other buildings, which has been done, um, do uh, contact tracing, provide the equipment that is needed and the materials that are needed to keep the uh, population safe. And as you heard that that has been done to a great extent. So I think that we heard the other side and work with them to decrease the, to decrease the population. And what I heard today through the, uh, the testimony was that we were heard as well and steps were taken to improve conditions on Rikers as they should continue to be. Um, one thing that Rikers provides, uh, Mr. Chairman, is a lot of space for people to 
to, you know, we were building tents in Central Park uh, and uh, building out spaces at the Javits Center. There was room to do that uh, at, at Rikers as well. And that's the point that we were making. You cannot close the jail completely. We understand that. And at the same time, we did have to make sure that there was a, 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 a lower population. Listen, the best way to solve this problem is no one commits crime anymore. And when that happens, I will join you at Rikers for the closing ceremony and we'll all be happy. But until that happens, or until there's uh, alternatives, we need to have that facility operating. Just, just a point of rebuttal here. I, you know, there is a there is a an error between I think the characterization that that you know I think has been made more than once that this is like I understood there are people there is I understood that you're you're trying to provide a counterpoint to those who are saying fully just you know decarcerate and let folks out, but. For, but that, but the, I don't believe Mayor de Blasio was saying that. I don't believe Commissioner Brand was saying that. I well, what, what they went far, they went way ahead of the list that we made agreements, I think, and uh, on certain uh, individuals, uh, and there was an agreement, yes, they should be released, uh, and they went further than we would have. And that's where you see now a level of recidivism uh, from people who were released that we did not agree with and yet they're out committing crimes again. And you're gonna see that increase as time goes on. And I hope that uh, these committees will continue to monitor, monitor the level of recidivism from the individuals who receive that compassionate uh, release, either in agreement with the district attorneys and, and the special prosecutor or on the, on the uh, actions of the commissioner through the mayor uh, herself and himself. But either way, the public will, dis will, uh, will want everyone to be held accountable the ones the decision makers held accountable uh, because crimes are being committed now by those who were released. Again, a balance has to be found, but um, you, cannot, you cannot argue the fact that there were many advocates and many in government who were saying, you know, moratorium on, on policing and prosecuting. It's not possible as long as crimes are being committed. Shootings are actually up in the city of New York right now, believe it or not, amidst this crisis. I don't understand uh, how that, how people, engage in that conduct. Uh, it's antisocial to say the least, but we've got to keep the people of New York City, and in my case, the people of Staten Island safe, and we will continue to do that. I'm going to I'm gonna leave it at that. I, I, I don't agree with every point. I, I do think there's a little bit of confusion here between... Well, as you said, we're not going to agree on every point. I, I agree that, and I do. I want to do, will mention the Manhattan DA did send testimony in, but I think like others could have been here to talk about their numbers and their release and have an opportunity for us to talk about them. They could have sent anybody. I, I, I DA McMahon, I, I do, do think there is a, um, in a public health crisis, we have to respond that. We, I, I, I understand what uh, Councilman Lambert was saying, but with this sense of urgency, and it, it's not um, all about, you know, the sort of attempt here to fight the decarceration effort in, um, in, in New York City when we're in the middle of a pandemic. It's about keeping people safe and keeping them sure. uh, away from a virus that has the ability to kill them. And, and so- well, I, all, With all due respect, sir, also to keep them safe from becoming victims of crime again. Okay. Um, I'm gonna leave it at that based on uh, uh, where we are. It's 515, I wanna give the public an opportunity to. Thank you all for being here. And thank you Thanks. for spending time with us uh, through a very long hearing. And uh, wish you the best to your, you and your families. Thank you so much. You too. Stay safe. I think we hold on. I think we have a, uh, a council member question uh, from Council Member Holt. Once the timer starts, you may begin. Starting time. Uh, thank you. Do you hear me? Okay, I did, while we're uh, plugging uh, programs, I want to uh, plug the Department of Probation's NEON program in the arts, which is very successful. I've, I've looked at a number of those uh, uh, artwork and I think it's a good outlet for people who have been previously incarcerated and how to get into a new life. I just want to plug that. And, but I also want to mention that New York City has by far the lowest incarceration rate of any big city in the US, by far. So I appreciate the, all the DAs weighing in on this. Um, certainly, I, I think the DAs uh, uh, opinions on uh, releasing uh, uh, inmates or um, detainees 
should be paramount that their opinions they they've dealt with the victims of their crimes they've dealt with the individuals who are incarcerated they know them the best um so i want to thank you all uh also special prosecutor brennan you mentioned that a drug dealer was released and immediately upon his release started dealing heroin uh, out of his apartment and had it not been for those residents who called this guy might have still been doing this and ruining other lives not only you know, with the people in the apartment with the COVID spread, but the heroin that has destroyed thousands and thousands of lives across the U.S. And of course, I think he was dealing with also with, with uh, guns too, or, or apparently, but a life of crime is not going to change when he gets out. And I think we, it's, we're not going to play Russian roulette here with the public and just guess that this guy is not going to commit crime. And, he, and in many cases they do. And like I mentioned before, and unfortunately, the Mock J representative couldn't tell me the breakdown of the crimes that are being committed, um, which is kind of unusual that they, I couldn't get a breakdown of the types of crimes that people were committing upon release, early release. They should know that like the back of their hand. They should, that's how you evaluate a program. Um, just one thing I just wanted to ask the assistant uh, DA uh, Nyberg. Um, I'm not quite you know, set on the numbers for Queens. 440 were considered. Um, and 42, you said yes on 170, you had no objection. What about the others? Were they released? Uh, 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 Councilman, no, the, uh, of the 440, the others are uh, still incarcerated. And oh, okay. when, we, when we look at the, at the population of the 440 who either were presented on a list or specifically asked for release, the ones that remain uh, in terms of their, their, their breakdown, what they're charged with, actually almost 25% of those who remain incarcerated are charged with homicide. Uh, over 50% are still in that uh, are a combination of the homicide defendants, burglary, assault, and robbery. So obviously in a very serious crimes that, that were not released of those that asked for consideration. I, I know my time is up, but I just I wanna ask, are we giving them more programs when they get out early? Are we giving them more counseling? Is that, I, I thought I heard that we weren't. Is that true? I mean, truthfully, that's what, you know, in response to Chair Lansman's question about what could we use, uh, what we can use are more robust alternatives to incarceration, more programs with comprehensive supervised release. We were able to release someone last week, uh, and it's frankly a, a Herculean effort on the part of the court and alternative sen sentencing providers and, and the prosecutor and uh, you know the defense to all find a program that, in light of the crisis, can uh, you know monitor someone when they are released. There's an additional challenge. Thank you so much for all of you for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, chairs. Thank you. Uh, I believe we, okay. now we will move on to, if there are no further questions, now we will move on to a testimony from the administration. We will hear from the Administration for Children's Services. Um, we will be joined by Commissioner David A. Hansel for, AC, for ACS. And for the question and answer period, we will be joined by Acting Deputy Commissioner Sarah Hemeter and Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Angel Mendoza, Jr. of ACS. We will also be joined for question and answers from Chief Jennifer Gilroy Ruiz of the Law Department. I will call on, call on each of you individually for a response um, as I administer the oath. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. I do. Oh, I have to say each of your names. <laughs> Commissioner Hansel? I do. Deputy Commissioner Hemeter? I do. Dr. Mendoza? I do. Chief Gilroy Ruiz? I do. Thank you. Commissioner Hansel, you may begin. I'm muted. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, or I guess I should say good evening. 
uh, Chair Lansman, Chair Powers, members of the uh, committees on the justice system and criminal justice. Uh, I'm David Hansel, Commissioner of the New York City Administration for Children's Services. And as you've heard with me uh, here are um, Sarah Hemeter, who's our Acting Deputy Commissioner for our Division of Youth and Family Justice, and Dr. Angel Mendoza, Jr., who is our Chief Medical Officer. And we're very grateful for the opportunity to testify about how ACS and our partners have responded to the unprecedented COVID-19 health crisis and the impact it's had on our juvenile detention programs. Today's New York City juvenile justice system, thanks to many years of effort by multiple stakeholders, safely serves youth through a trauma-informed lens in the community wherever possible and with appropriate structure and supports in place. During the COVID-19 pandemic, our focus has been on maintaining that progressive approach, keeping young people and staff protected from new health concerns and supporting the efforts of Mock J, probation, the law department and the district attorneys to release those youth in detention who could safely be returned to the community. ACS does not have the authority to release youth, but our collaboration with our sister agencies led to the release of over one third of the youth in detention, 20 from secure detention and 26 from non-secure detention at the height of the pandemic from March 16th through April 9th. During the same time period, ACS also discharged 31 youth or nearly a third of the young people who were in close to home placements so that those youth also were at home and in their communities and in this case receiving our aftercare services. Despite the many challenges that COVID-19 presents, we have adapted ACS's full continuum of juvenile justice programs to meet the needs of youth and their families. Our community-based alternatives programs continue to offer prevention and diversion services to safely keep youth out of the justice system and supported at home with their families. Our close to home system of residential placement and aftercare is serving adjudicated youth and helping them safely transition back to the community. And as I will now discuss, we've taken numerous steps to address the health and safety of the youth and staff in our detention programs. The health and safety of those youth and staff in secure detention is our top priority and has been throughout this crisis. For youth in detention and for the caring, inspirational staff who show up every day to work with them, we've implemented strict protocols to minimize health risks. We've continued to follow the guidance of health officials, including Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Health and Hospitals, the Centers for Disease Control, the healthcare personnel who work in our detention programs, Floating Hospital at Crossroads, and Correctional Health Services at Horizon, and of course, our own Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Mendoza. As health guidance has evolved throughout the course of the pandemic, ACS has adapted and implemented new protocols as needed and will continue to do so. We continually update uh, our guidance to staff and to youth about virus prevention practices, such as hand washing and social distancing. Our detention facilities are regularly cleaned and sanitized, and we've increased the number of cleaning personnel. We've equipped the facilities with ample hand sanitizer, soap, gloves, and PPE for staff who are working with symptomatic youth. Nurses conduct temperature checks for staff on each shift, and our health partners conduct daily screenings of staff, of, of youth, excuse me. And all staff and youth have been provided with face coverings. In the early weeks of March, after consultation with medical and public health experts, we executed a bold plan to minimize the spread of COVID-19, to preserve scarce personal protective equipment, and to limit the exposure of youth and staff to the virus. This plan involved consolidating youth in crossroads with the exception of pre-raise the age youth who have always been and must be housed at Horizon. Leaving the first floor of Horizon exclusively for youth presenting with COVID-19 symptoms. There, the youth would be housed in one area, receive 24 seven medical care from correctional health services. More recently, we've begun to implement a plan to safely redistribute our youth detention population between both facilities while maintaining the public health advantages of a discrete medical isolation space 
for housing symptomatic or COVID positive youth. To date, ACS has moved six youth from Crossroads to Horizon. This has enabled us to fully utilize our facility space to safely manage our youth detention population while maintaining capacity on the first floor of Horizon to medically isolate any youth in our custody who might develop symptoms or test positive for COVID-19. Infection control practices will continue at Horizon to prevent the spread of illness among the expanded youth populations, including strict implementation of traffic control and staff separation, strict separation of transport activities, equipment and laundry, strict implementation of cleaning and disinfection guidelines and practices, and strict adherence to established PPE conservation and usage guidelines for appropriate staff and continuing daily temperature taking for staff. Since the start of the pandemic, we have had a total of seven youth test positive for COVID-19. Five of these youth have fully recovered. Two youth who were more recently diagnosed are currently in isolation at Horizon. ACS and our medical partners tested the other youth with whom these recently diagnosed youth were in contact and all of these youth tested negative. Especially during these trying times, it's crucial to provide structure for youth and maintain our youth focused model of care. Youth in detention continue to receive quality medical and mental health services, access to education and programming, and they are maintaining connections to families. We have a full array of on-site medical and mental health providers serving the youth in our care at Crossroads and Horizon. As I mentioned, we contract with Floating Hospital to provide health services at Crossroads and Correctional Health Services provides health care at Horizon. We've also worked closely as we have for many years with uh, Health and Hospitals Bellevue Ho um, Health Hospital Center to provide Tron informed screening and mental health services to youth in both secure detention facilities as well as our non-secure detention continuum. Through its team of psychiatrists, psychologists, and mental health clinicians, Bellevue works closely with our youth development specialists, our case managers, our program counselors, and our contracted medical services staff to provide comprehensive care for youth. And we're very grateful for the hardworking teams who've been meeting the complex needs of our youth prior to and throughout this crisis. Education and programming are critical components of detention. And of course, they needed to be quickly modified and adapted due to COVID-19. All youth in detention have access to remote learning. And I wanna thank the teams at ACS, including our det detention program staff and our Office of Information Technology staff, and of course, the Department of Education for quickly providing and adapting to new technology. Programming is essential to enhancing the therapeutic environment in detention while helping youth build self-esteem, take part in positive activities, reduce idle time and help youth uh, and uh, help youth to uh, connect with role models and credible messengers, as well as develop skills to redirect their lives in positive directions. We've implemented new types of virtual programming to engage youth while adhering to social distancing protocols. So for instance, um, youth now have access to video games, movies, and books on their tablets. They're participating in virtual programming with our various partners, including a writing challenge through the kite program, yoga, individual exercise challenges and others. Strong family engagement has always been an essential part of our model of care, and we've adapted to make sure that youth remain connected. Our case management staff connect with parents at phone by phone at intake, and they call parents weekly to provide progress updates. One of our earliest and frankly most challenging decisions during this crisis was to have to suspend in-person visiting due to health risks. So we've set up access for youth to do televisiting by video in addition to increasing their regular telephone access so they can maintain connections with their families and with their attorneys. And as always been the case, youth can write and send unlimited letters to parents and family members. Through the, de the dedication of our Division of Youth and Family Justice staff, ACS is making sure that youth in our detention facilities are well cared for as we continue to navigate these uncertain times. As the council knows, we created a new position, youth development specialist 
to carry out our expanded responsibilities under Raise the Age. Our staff of YDS are now carrying out the crucial role of working with youth on a daily basis to provide strength-based supervision, mentorship, and connection under these particularly challenging circumstances. From the start of the pandemic, we've deeply appreciated the councils and the communities close attention to the needs of the vulnerable youth and the heroic staff who provide them with daily care and supervision as we work together to keep those youth, those staff, and our communities safe. I'm so proud of all that our ACS DYFJ team has done to quickly adapt to this challenging time while providing the highest quality care and support to our youth. Thank you and we're very happy to take your questions. Thank you. We will now turn it over to Chair Lanceman for questions. Good evening. Good evening. I will, I will be brief and not give your, uh, the next panel the opportunity to say good morning. <laughs> um, and I wanna thank you for staying. Uh, I, I know it's been a long day. Um, so let's just simply, you got Horizon, you got Crossroads. Um, uh, it sounds like you've got three, now maybe four different units of population. Who's at, who's at, who's at Crossroads, who's at Horizon, and why are you moving, who are you moving from Horizon, from Crossroads to Horizon? Short okay. Version. Um, let me give a big picture and then I'll let uh, Deputy Commissioner Hemeter uh, elaborate on that. Um, so for starters, um, by state requirement, um, the pre-raise the age population, which at this point is very small, it's just a handful of kids, um, they must remain at Horizon. Um, so they have, they were there and they have been there before and they will remain there. And they're, uh, they're during... separate from everyone else. That's correct. That's, that's, one, that's one category. Let's that's say. one cohort of, of young cohort. people who are at Horizon. That's okay. correct. Then second, beginning in March, when the pandemic started, we made the decision to create a facility at Horizon where we would be able to medically isolate any staff, any, I'm sorry, any youth who were COVID positive or uh, symptomatic for COVID. So we've been doing that for about the last two months. Uh, currently we have uh, only two youth, uh, two youth there, um, because we have the two youth who recently tested uh, positive. Uh, but that facility remains available for any youth who uh, become symptomatic at crossroads, who would then for that reason be transferred to Horizon. Right. And the only reason someone would go from crossroads to Horizon is if they tested positive or were symptomatic. That was the case up until recently. Aha. Um, more recently, as I mentioned the testimony, um, we began to redistribute the population because of an increase in population we were experiencing at Crossroads uh, by transferring some youth from Crossroads to Horizon. They continue to be separated from the medical isolation facility um, to maintain, maintain the infection control protocol that we've had in place now, which we think has been very successful. Um, and they also continue to be separated from the pre-raise the age population which is required under state law and state so, regulation. So at Horizon, there are three cohorts. There's the raise the age, there's the COVID-19, and there's the, for want of a better term, uh, crossroads excess. Uh, essentially, I'm gonna uh, turn it over to Deputy Commissioner Hemeter to elaborate before I get in deeper than I, than I should. <laughs> yes, that, that is correct. Um, so we do have the pre-raise pre the age youth at Horizon, uh, the two youth who are in the medical isolation unit at Horizon, and then recently transferred uh, adolescent offenders at Horizon. How many? Uh, the total count at Horizon right now is 14. So we have two pre-raised the age youth, two youth in the medical isolation unit, and 12 uh, other AOs. Got it. And that leaves how many at uh, Crossroads? At Crossroads today, there were 67 youth. And that breakdown is 41 adolescent offenders, um, five juvenile delinquents, and 21 juvenile offenders. Um, what was the reason for the increase in the population at Crossroads? Uh, more kids get in trouble or something else? We've seen um, an increase in the number of youth coming into detention. Mm -hmm. And as the courts remain closed, no youth are moving out uh, since that first um, as the commissioner mentioned, those first, those releases, we have not seen 
um, kids leaving as quickly as we have in the past. So the, our population has, has been increasing slowly. Has the Office of Court, so it's not that more kids have, have gotten themselves put in so much as fewer kids have been able to get themselves out? It's a little bit of both. We have seen some police admits um, coming through um, and we've you know, worked, uh, the, the courts are open for arraignments and a lot of the cases, at least the juvenile delinquency cases, they have been uh, being diverted and released. Um, and the, the adolescent offenders that we have seen come through have been arraigned and have been detained. Has OCA not set up a process uh, for these kids to, to have their, uh, their, 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 their opportunity to have to be released um, heard? So my understanding of the process, and I think Mock J is still on and might be able to answer this better than I can, um, but for, so we have the, the youth parts, which are the adolescent offenders. Um, they get arraigned um, and once, if they are detained, um, then further court hearings are, are, have just started happening, I believe, um, in terms of grand jury and things like that. I'm not as familiar with that. Mock J can answer you know, what the process is with respect to that. On the juvenile delinquency side, um, for the younger youth, family court is open for arraignments um, and probation and the law department have been doing what they can do to divert those cases. Um, and then the court has, again, the decision about whether to remand those youth or not. So we have seen some youth coming through on both sides, on the adolescent offender side and the juvenile delinquency side. Coming in, but not being able to, to get out. Correct. There, there, here, there are no hearings other than the emergency hearings being held. Right. right. Okay. Some cases, um, when that initial release happened um, on the delinquency side, they were placed, um, and so they did go to our close to home facilities. Okay. All right. And and um, just remind me, has has every uh, youth has been tested for COVID nineteen, or are you are you two waiting for uh, symptoms to emerge? Uh, we have not been testing every youth, um, only when, when they are symptomatic, according to the, the health guidelines. Right. Well, now that we have rapid tests and now that the Department of Corrections is testing every new um, admission, shouldn't uh, you guys be doing that also? I think this is something that we're looking into. We, we don't have a protocol for that yet. I can, uh, Dr. Mendoza is here and he can speak about the health aspects of that. Um, but, you know, we, we are definitely, it is definitely something under consideration. All right. Um, listen, I appreciate our cooperation and, and communication. It's been very, very uh, uh, effective. Um, but, you know, on the testing issue, that's been under consideration for a long time and you have such a small population uh, and, and the Department of Corrections is, is doing it. Um, I don't know, doctor, do you, do you wanna tell us why this, what possible reason there could be for not, at this point for ACS not doing this? Well, the, the biggest reason and the most major reason is that there is no um, health guidance actually coming down, uh, even specifically for detention centers. And we've been monitoring all the health guidance that comes from the CDC, from DOHH, and from DOH. Um, so it still continues to be a symptom driven kind of screening process. But again, as we said, as we continue to monitor all of these guidelines and as the uh, situation within the city evolves, we'll, we will change our guidelines accordingly. Well, I have to respectfully, very strongly urge you to not wait for some guideline to, to come down. The testing is available now. The Department of Corrections is, 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 is doing it. Um, there's, you have a small and manageable population. Um, the, it makes little sense to wait for someone to have symptoms, which means that they they are and probably have been infectious for some period of time. Um, and uh, uh, we, you know, there's no reason not to, not, not to test. I mean, if, if there's some medical reason, I'd, I'd be willing to hear it why it's a bad idea, but it's so obviously and evidently a, 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 a good idea. I can't even understand why you wouldn't do it. Also, and 
you know, I'm not a doctor, so uh, I, I may be misstating this, but we're all reading about this, this new or this um, newly understood impact that, that COVID is having on kids, like a kind of like a separate side disease or side ailment. Um, I urge you, like, don't mess around. You got less than 100, 100 kids, test them today. We, we, we promise you, we will not mess around. And we are going to look at everything. Uh, we can consider every con uh, factor that needs to be considered, completely understand the concern about the new syndrome, the MISC. And in fact, on the day that we got information about MISC, we immediately we, uh, informed all of our providers, our healthcare providers and all of our staff about it. And we have guidelines on how to recognize it. The key with MISC, of course, is early recognition because there is actually quite effective treatment for it. And so um, all of our staff are very aware of what they have to watch out for. And uh, yes, about the testing, we are, we are going to study it and we'll, we'll, we'll make a decision about it very, very soon. I hope so. Alana, are there other, are my colleagues have questions? Yes, we will. If, if you yes, are sir. finished council member, we'll yes, turn it to, to great, to chair powers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm going to actually pass it along both to uh, Councilmember Amphrey Samuel and Councilmember Rose. They've been here for a long time, logged in, uh, I think, waiting to ask a question of ACS. So I'm going to hand my time over to them so they have an opportunity to ask their questions in. Uh, Councilmember Amphrey Samuel, you may begin. Starting time. I appreciate that. Um, Chair Powers and um, Chair Lanceman, thank you so much for those questions because that was a line of questions that I had um, since several hours ago. I was just like waiting to, to get those um, answers. Um, so, because everyone knows I represent Crossroads in my district and um, on March, Wednesday, March 18th, I received a frantic call from a mom of a son who is at Crossroads. And I immediately, it was eight o'clock that night, March 18th. And I called um, one of the deputy commissioners and um, my colleagues to find out what was happening because her son was sick and um, visitation had just stopped that Saturday prior to. And so she was very concerned and we all were. And again, this was on March 18th. And so we have been going back and forth with questioning as to what's happening with the young people at Crossroads and Horizon, myself and Councilmember Salamanca. And so um, th it's been some trying times. And so, um, I just wanted to ask a couple of questions in reference to the video conferencing, because one of the mothers told me that she's able to, you know, of course, do the visit, visit the video conferencing, um, but it's once a week. And I just wanted to find out, um, is there a way to do, what's the hours for video conferencing? That's one of my questions. And is there a way to increase that because of what we're going through um, and the mental health piece of it, having to stay connected and engaged. And then also um, another mother texted me and said, her son is not able to wear a mask. And so I know that you mentioned in your testimony that every young person has a mask, but there's, there's one, there's a, there's a mother right now who has a son at Crossroads and he does not have a mask, is not allowed to have a mask. And so I want you to be able to clear that up for me. Um, and, I, and I know I'm running out of time, um, but also, um, the training and programming in the facility as well, because we had community-based organizations that were going in there like cure violence groups and really having a um, like cultural competent programming with our young people. And so I wanna speak to what are you doing to continue to connect with the CBOs who are working in there because I'm told that they're not able to go in there. And so I don't know who is actually in there now doing the programming because I'm told it is not appropriate or um, there should be more appropriate programming and, um, and workshops and sessions. Um, and uh, I had another one, uh, I'm trying to rush. Um, uh, Oh yeah, and the increase in the population. So um, I'm told because I see what's happening here in Brownsville and we have young people getting locked up left and right every single day. And so um, can you speak more to what you're seeing as far as the increase in the numbers and how many, what's the percentage of the increase since COVID? That would be helpful to, to get a sense of. Time expired. 
Okay, so I'll start um, with, I'm, I wrote down your things, so I'll try to go through them. Um, with respect to the masks, um, every youth, I feel like there's feedback, is there feedback? Um, okay, so with respect to the masks, every youth has been um, given a mask. Sorry, I am getting feedback now. There we go. Um, all youth have been given masks um, and they, they, so I'm not sure what, what uh, reports you've been getting um, because all youth have been issued masks. Um, they all have surgical masks. We have enough surgical masks that if a, a young person needs a new one, we can give them a new mask. Um, so, so that shouldn't be a problem um, at, at all. All staff have also been given face coverings as well. They've given, uh, they've been given, given um, cloth face coverings, um, at least two. I think we've given more than that so that they can wash them and uh, uh, reuse them. Um, so both youth and staff have been given face coverings um, in detention. Um, with respect to the televisiting, um, the televisiting, uh, so this was something that we did have to put up very quickly um, because we made the decision early on, as the commissioner mentioned, uh, to suspend visits, which was, which was a hard thing for us to do, knowing that this was a challenging time for youth um, and for their families, um, not knowing what was going on with them. So we did, we we're able to put um, five computers um, at Crossroads uh, for young people to do televisiting. Um, but that televisiting is also uh, being used for um, visits with attorneys, uh, visits with parents, and also if, if there does happen to be a court hearing um, where a young person needs to be produced virtually, we are using it for that as well. Um, so it's being used for a lot of different purposes, um, and we are looking to see if there's a way to expand that uh, that capability. But but right now um, we only have the five um, five set up in our, our visiting area. Um, the hours for the visiting um, were originally scheduled uh, for parents um, Monday Monday through Wednesday, two to six, and the visits last for an hour long. Um, but we then um, realize that that was not enough because lots of parents want to be in contact with their kids, obviously. And so we did expand uh, the televisiting on Thursdays and Fridays as well. So all five days uh, are being scheduled for televisiting with parents. Um, between uh, March 30th and May 11th, um, there were 356 televisits um, scheduled between youth and their families at, at, at both Crossroads and Horizon. So it is definitely being, uh, being used um, and uh, um, that's, you know, it is being used. Um, with respect to uh, programming, um, that has also been a challenge, obviously, um, as we suspended visits uh, for people coming into the facility, we also had to suspend our community-based organizations coming in as well um, and had to figure out ways to um, establish virtual programming for young people so that they could continue to be engaged, um, not only with the school, which we've had to do remote uh, learning, um, but also the programming aspect of things as well. Um, the youth have been um, issued um, tablets, um, and as the commissioner mentioned, there are there are games and books and and other things um, loaded onto those um, onto those tablets. But we have also um, been uh, we have um, implemented um, other types of programming. There was a, a writing program um, through the uh, writing challenge through the through the kite program. Um, we've, they've been doing yoga on the tablets um, and other, um, other opportunities on, on the tablets. Um, we have been working with, a, with some of the community-based providers um, to figure out ways to increase programming um, as well. So we've been working with CCA um, and with some of the other, um, with um, Carnegie Hall and other programs to, to work on ways to um, get more programming in, in loaded onto and available for the kids through the virtual programming. Um, that's the, those were the, 
ones I wrote down. Is there? Thanks. Um, hey, uh, sorry about that. I think Councilmember Ampry Samuel had a follow-up question. I just wanted to give her and Councilmember Rose an opportunity to ask uh, just a just a small amount over their allotment because they've been here. And, and they've been gracious enough to wait through there a very, 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 very long hearing and, and mostly on my behalf. So uh, if you just can offer an opportunity to ask a follow up question. I appreciate that again. Um, just for cl um, clarification, because you mentioned the five computers um, that are set up for the video conferencing. Um, the reason why that's pretty like a flag for me is because um, now the city seems to be finding um, funding to do 10,000 tablets for seniors and, you know, we can, um, you know, find ways to be able to keep folks connected. And then for you to say that you have um, five computers and, you know, just trying to figure out a way to be able to increase that. To me, that just sounds, you know, again, like um, Chair Lansman stated, this is such a small um, population. And so um, the young people and their families in this setting should be able to get anything and everything that they need at this particular time. Um, so that's one thing. Can you explain to me what the, uh, what the challenges are um, related to the video conferencing? And then also, um, are you able to make sure that the families, the, the parents or the guardians um, have the technology on their end in order to be able to do the conferencing with their, um, their um, children? And then um, going back to the programming with the CBOs, when we're talking about uh, like whatever, Carnegie Hall or that, that, the organization that you just mentioned, and I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about all of the issues that we see now and the fact that the mayor and the police commissioner um, and the district attorneys are talking about ways to stay engaged and connected and increasing funding and programming with our cure violence or crisis management systems. And that's on the outside. And we knew the importance of them to be on the inside with our young people. And so um, I don't understand the reasoning as to how you can have um, programming and, and, and partnerships with entities that, that are not really relevant right now to what we're seeing and the increase in our youth be, you know, going into the system. And so um, what are some of the challenges that are causing you to not be able to connect with the CBOs and have them inside of the buildings? Because it's not the fact that they don't wanna be there because they tell me all the time, the ones that used to be in there, how can we get inside? Because those children need us and their parents are asking us what happened. And so I know that there is um, interest and a desire for those same groups to go um, inside. And so um, can you speak to what your challenges are, again, related to the CBOs going inside, as well as the, um, the increase in the computers and the technology that's needed in order to have the uh, young people stay engaged, because we all know this is a critical time. And uh, one mother that I talk to on a consistent basis, child is going through some real serious mental health issues. And he had those same challenges before he got locked up. And he's going to be in there for a while. He's not one of the young people that can actually go home. And so, um, uh, what he needs is not being provided for in the setting right now, but he needs to be there. And so um, I just, I, I hear the stories all the time about the young people not at all. Like I heard what you said, but that's not the picture that I see every single day um, from the families that reach out to our offices. So can you just speak to, you know, a little more of what you were just saying? Thank you. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. Uh, we appreciate the, the questions. Um, so, so we um, part of the visiting issue with visiting is space within the facility. So we want to create spaces where where kids can visit um, one on one with their parents. And so having finding the space is has been one of the challenges. Getting the you know, I've been there. I, I go in there all the time, so I know where every single like room and space is in the building. So don't say that. Like I, I literally know, I can tell you right now, well, what about this place? What about that space? What, what about this room? What about that room? So let's. Well, I think that's part of it is the space issue. I mean, the, there's also technology in terms of like Wi-Fi and getting those things kind of set up uh, for, the, for the kids as well, or not the kids, but the, the technology that is needed, like the, the laptops and those kinds of uh, things um, we have been able to get, it's the, the the building infrastructure as well and getting that set up for Wi-Fi and things ha has definitely been um, a challenge. 
in terms of um, making sure that if we have all these tablets um, and being doing the Skype visits and other things that we have, uh, that they can actually work. So that that's also been um, part of it. We we um, you know as as the we had to do things very quickly, very fast at the beginning, and and now we're able to take a step back and take a look at at what we are doing and what else we can add to. Um, the programming and the other things that we have available for youth. So, so definitely we are connecting with, with the CBOs that, that were um, coming into uh, our facilities. We actually have a call later this week with some of the advocates as well. We had a call a few weeks ago um, also where, where we were working with um, some of the, the CBOs to try to, to get them uh, um, more involved um, if they can't be in the in the facilities physically, um, how do we get them in virtually so so that they can assist with um, with programming and keeping the kids engaged? Um, we um, we are also one of the big things that we're looking forward to um, are the summer programming and making sure that the kids have the programs for the summer um, as summer school is not going to be available like it was in the past. Um, to make sure that the education and other other things are continuing for the kids so that they can continue to earn their credits, um, that they are um, going to be able to be involved in their schooling as well. Um, so, so again, you know, we're definitely um, working to connect and, and collaborate with, with all of the community-based organizations um, that were in there before and, and being trying to be creative in terms of coming up with ways to get them back in. Okay. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, I want to say, Councilmember Amprey Samuel, before we, we move on, that uh, you know we are working uh, closely. Our case managers work closely with every every young person in their family, and we realize every family situation is different, and we want to do everything we can to encourage as much communication between parents and children as we can. So um, we would be delighted to work with you offline on any any concerns you hear from families, any concerns you hear from constituents. Um, we, we would very much like to know about and see if we can work with them and work with you to resolve them. Okay, and I don't wanna go um, back and forth because I know that Council Member Rose is right there with me. So I'm gonna, Thank you, and now I look forward to working with you. <laughs> okay, Thank Council you. Member. <laughs> <laughs> Council Member Rose, you may begin. Starting time. I want to thank uh, Chair um, Powers for allowing um, allowing me to to go before him, and it's always a pleasure to follow um, Council Member Amber Samuels because she is is quite uh, she does a comprehensive uh, sweep of all of the information that's needed, and um, many of my questions were um, were in the same vein as as hers. So I don't want to belabor the point, but um, I, I have to co-sign to many of the things that she said. As the chair of the youth committee, I'm getting reports that um, that the young people don't have access to masks, soap, and hand sanitizer um, for the youth or the staff. Um, and uh, my other concerns is I'm just going to throw out my my questions, and um, then you can answer them. Um, I'm also concerned, really, really concerned about um, our young people receiving proper educational instruction from DOE, because we've been told that there there's not there's not or there's limited functional Wi-Fi at both either of these centers, um, and so. Uh, it makes uh, distance learning um, a, a real challenge. So how are you um, transitioning to remote learning and how effective has it been? Um, and, you know, and that would translate also in terms of summer programming um, as well. And, and since our young people are, you know, have been isolated from their families 
um, you know, with very limited activities, uh, recreational programming and schooling, you know, how are you helping them to cope with, um, with the toll that it's taking on them mentally and physically? Uh, and, um, and do they actually have unfettered use of the phones and, uh, and tablets? I know, I know my colleagues spoke about remote, um, about the, um, the visits, but I'm talking about um, actual access to the phones and, um, and the tablets so that they, they are engaged. They have something to do, especially in light of the fact that the CBOs are no longer coming into the facility. Uh, yes, uh, Councilman. Let me let me start off, and then uh, Deputy Commissioner Hemeter can can elaborate. Um, very important questions um, with regard to education. Um, I think you know. I th I think what we f we found initially, just as you know, we saw with so many families who were trying to connect their kids with distance learning at home, um, is that there was to use a bad pun, there was a learning curve in getting up and running with remote learning. It wasn't easy for anybody. It was a very different way of operating than any of us was familiar with. And so um, it did take uh, a time for us, first of all, to make sure that we had the right equipment from DOE. It made, took some time to make sure we had the right connectivity in the facilities so that we could use the equipment. Um, and then uh, it's been also a process to work with the young people to make sure they knew how to function in a very different you know, style of interaction. Um, with, with education. Um, so uh, it was a process of getting there. Um, I think we, we have made progress. I think we're, we're there now. Um, we, we, we do have the, the equipment, we do have the connectivity um, and um, our staff at our end, the youth development specialists, the case managers, the program counselors are all working with the youth now to make sure they really can use the technology to engage in distance learning the way that, uh, that we want them to and to make sure that they can fully take advantage of the educational opportunities that DOE is making available to them. Um, they do also have, as, as I mentioned in testimony, uh, they have uh, tablets that they can use for other kinds of um, uh, um, activities like uh, video games and reading books and watching movies, things like that. Uh, there are recreational activities and things like that. So we're doing as much as we can to keep kids engaged both in the remote learning activities, but also in a range of other things um, so that we uh, make sure they have as, uh, as much constructive activity and as little idle time as possible. So uh, the infrastructure is now in place. You have Wi-Fi. All of the infrastructure um, issues have been resolved and, um, and they are um, available now for them to use and when was that and when did you actually uh, accomplish that what was that timeline uh i don't i don't have the detail on that we can get that to you i don't know sarah do you have the details on, I don't, on the time I, press? sorry i didn't know if i was muted um we uh i i'd have to get back to you i, I know that the the chromebooks or the tablets that that the doe um gave to us to hand out to the kids, there were definitely challenges with that in the beginning. Um, and we had to pull them back and, and, and redo things. And so that definitely was a challenge, um, but they do all have um, tablets now that they are used, they, they are handed out daily um, for educational and the programming purposes. Um, if if uh, the young people, uh, you know, the longer they, the, the better their behavior is, the longer they get to keep the tablets and, and, and use them um, as well. We also are, are um, as the weather is turning nicer, um, the kids are going outside also. Um, they ha they've always had access to the gym and, and the outdoor spaces for the recreation. Um, you know, the kids want to play basketball, um, which has been a challenge during this time um, where we're trying to keep the kids apart and socially distanced. Um, so we are working with them on, on um, calisthenics and, and other things in the outdoor spaces as well to get them up and moving around um, so that they aren't just sitting using the tablets all day as well. So, so we're trying a mix of different things with the kids to keep them active and engaged. But didn't you say to um, council member Amper Samuel that, that there were some issues with infrastructure and Wi-Fi, and that's why um, there was some issues in terms of teleconferencing with their, with in, their families? In the visit... Uh, Sorry, in the visiting area, there has there have been some challenges with the Wi-Fi. Um, so, so the areas where the visiting is taking place, 
Um, be, we have only been able to put up five uh, tablets there because of some challenges with the Wi-Fi. Um, and the, so what is your, um, and what's your timeline in terms of, of correcting that? Um, since uh, apparently you do have Wi-Fi in the building, right? There is Wi-Fi in, in, for the educate, for the tablets and the education, yes. And so now um, you, you, you are actively working to get the, the sitting area or the visiting area um, wired for Wi-Fi? It is, it is wired for Wi-Fi. Um, we, we, had, we have been having some challenges. Um, there was just an issue the other day um, in terms of in the visiting area for, for that. It, it, it is, it, we've had some challenges with it. And is um, that only at Crossroads or is that also at Horizon? It is at Crossroads. It's just at my, Crossroads. My understanding, it's just at Crossroads. But I can verify that. Okay. Um, I, I want to thank you for uh, allowing me to have the time, Chair Powers. And, um, and we, really, we really need for you to make available all, all the resources that you can to to make sure that while these young people are, are suffering through this isolation that we all are, that um, their mental health and their physical health um, issues are, are, take, are addressed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I believe Chair Lanceman has one more question. Thanks, this is for the, the law department. Are, are you folks still around? Hi. Can you unmute the law department? There you go. Um, so uh, we heard from Mark Jay earlier about this uh, intense deliberative uh, process for trying to get um, adults released from adult detention. And I want to know if there's been any uh, a comparable process to get juveniles released, what the law department's role has been, and uh, how many young people, if any, has the law department consented to, uh, to release, at least you know, for those who are being prosecuted by the law department. Yes, thank you, um, Councilman. So there was an... an intentional effort to this, um, which began actually on March 13th when Deputy Commissioner Heminer and I spoke and we were given lists of the um, youth who were in detention. And we began to go through the list on a case-by-case -case basis, um, reviewing every single case of the youth in detention. It was a multi-layer review by the law department, um, starting at the line level up to the unit chief, up to the deputy chief of litigation, including myself. Um, and as a result of that, the initial reduction that had happened with juvenile detention, the, the population in secure detention was decreased by 66% and in non-secure detention by um, 53%. As this was happening, ACS also did a similar uh, review of medical conditions as we've heard about in the adult system today. And um, so we were provided then with a list of 20 youth who may have um, conditions that make them more vulnerable to the virus. Um, and so there was, again, an intentional review. Um, and we believe it was that number because we had reduced the population so much previously. So we did do another review of these. This included all the youth in detention. So it was a review of each case by our office, as well as um, with the assistance of the Department of Probation, with MACJ and ACS, with input from NYPD, as well as the DA's offices. And so um, a group of that youth were deemed appropriate for release. That has to do with the number of cases that were in at the time. And so that number of cases um, ultimately resulted in um, an original list of 53 youth, 32 of whom were released overall. And as the commissioner said, with both reviews, there has been a one third decrease in the population in detention. Um, a question was asked by one of the councilwomen with regard to the cases coming in now to detention. And I, I believe Commissioner Bermudez may speak of this as well, as it's a different process than in the district attorney's office. 
when a, when a case is referred by the police department, it was referred initially to the Department of Probation, who then either adjusts the case or um, refers the case to the, to the law department. And then we determine the appropriateness of filing the case. Um, there has been an, a, a real intentional effort between DOP and our office actually handling these cases at the police precincts prior to them even being transported down to the court. And as a result of that, approximately 80% of the youth initially in custody have been released either by the Department of Probation or by the Law Department pending a potential filing later on. I just wanna correct one thing that was said. Um, the family court has not stopped um, at all. And so the hearings that were necessary to accomplish these releases were done by the family court judges. So once we had come to a conclusion based upon the supports provided by DOP and ACS and MACJ through the alternative to detention programs, we then went to the attorneys for the child who are the defenders in family court and together we negotiated, agreed upon conditions of release, which were then approved by the court. Um, so there has been a continued effort to make sure that um, only those youth who need to be in detention are in detention. And I would just state that the standard that we used went above the standard that is the initial remand standard in family court. That standard is based on whether there would be a further act of delinquency or whether there would be a non-appearance in court. Instead, we went to the mission of the family court itself in terms of outcomes, and that is a balancing between the needs and best interests of the youth and the need for protection of the community. And so that was the standard that was applied to each and every case that was reviewed at a very high level um, in the initial cohort and continues to be reviewed as we go forward today. All right, thank you. Thank you. If there are no further questions, we'll move to the Department of Probation. Um, testifying here from the Department of Probation today, we have Commissioner Ana Bermudez. In addition, we have Deputy Commissioner Sharon Goodwin of the Department of Probation, who will be here for, for questions and answers. Um, I will call on each of you individually for a response. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. I have to say your name first. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Bermudez. Yes, I do. Deputy Commissioner Goodwin. Yes, I do. Thank you. Commissioner, you may begin. Thank you. All right, let's bring this home. Um, good evening, Chair Powers and Chair Lansman, as well as members of the Criminal Justice and Justice Services Committees. I am Ana Bermudez, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Probation. And with me is Deputy Commissioner Sharon Goodwin. Thank you for the opportunity to testify about the important work of the Department of Probation and the recent bill introduction to reestablish New York City's local conditional release commission. As you know, probation is the largest alternative to incarceration in New York City and plays a crucial role in keeping us all safe. At DOP, we understand that safety is more than just one's physical well being, but that it's the network of trusted relationships built around a person to keep them on track when times are tough. This has never been more apparent and important, and I'm very proud of this agency's ability to be nimble and adapt to the present circumstances. The 17,225 people currently under supervision, divided up between 16,000 adults and 1,225 juveniles are being safely supervised by our dedicated and professional probation officers through electronic means, mostly like phones, text, videos, and web check-ins, um, similar to how we expanded intensive community monitoring or ICM for youth that would otherwise be detained when we saw the need with Raise the Age, we have adapted to this new now by transitioning our programming online so that clients and other community members can stay engaged with the people and programs they have grown to rely on during this time when they have when they are needed most. Our groundbreaking credible messenger mentoring programs such as Arches and the Parent Coaches are unique partnerships like the Made in New York Animation Project, Neon Arts, thank you uh, um, City Council Member Holden, uh, and Neon Photography, as well as our behavioral health specialists are all available remotely for clients and their families to access. 
And touchingly, as I have spoken with probation officers about their experience with remote supervision, they often report that clients are calling to check in on them and to see how they're doing during this crisis. So for those on probation where regular in-person check-ins are necessary, we are employing social distancing and other recommended precautions to keep individuals under supervision, probation officers, and the public safe. In fact, the part of our in-person operation that has increased the most during this pandemic is our Neon Nutrition Kitchens, with, which with the support from the Young Men's Initiative have now tripled their capacity. We are now serving some 12,000 people per week, a more than six-fold increase of our typical pre-COVID volume. Though that is a sobering statistic, it is also an uplifting one as it shows the incredible impact the work of this department is having on the lives of our clients, their families, and the communities in which they live. We could not have done this first and foremost without our dedicated staff who came up with the Nutrition Kitchen idea in the first place, as well as our partners like YMI and the Living Redemption Youth Opportunity Hub in Harlem, who stepped up to the plate, no pun intended, um, when our previous location had to close in Harlem. And it comes to no surprise, that's no surprise to us that the neighborhoods with the most positive COVID-19 cases are home to communities of color and, and whose residents are disproportionately employed in frontline service. COVID-19 has revealed the racial and economic inequity that is deeply embedded in our city's socioeconomic infrastructure. Our NEONs aimed to be the opposite of that, instead serving as engines of equity by working with neighborhood residents to develop ground up solutions for what their community needs. By being rooted in partnership with both residents and service providers, the NEON model has allowed us to invest valuable resources and help to restore a sense of agency in these communities. We are, and we are seeing the results pay off. For despite decades of concentrated disadvantage, the residents of our NEON neighborhoods are successfully completing probation at a rate of more than four out of five, the same rate for residents of neighborhoods that do not have these structural challenges. Though there is still a lot more work to do, I am proud of this department's contribution toward ensuring that justice system outcomes are not defined by a person's zip code. Though the local conditional release commission has not been operating uh, during my time as commissioner, I am familiar with its duties and scope. As commissioner of DOP, I would be an ex officio and non-voting member of the commission and anyone granted conditional release would be supervised by probation for a, a period of one year. An advantage of the LCRC is that all components of the process would be housed under one roof within probation, ensuring both a consistent pro programmatic ethos and seamless integration across the conditional release, release continuum from application through community supervision. The department does not have any objections to this legislation and would work with you to not only ensure its implementation, successful implementation, but to prioritize connecting the work of the commission with the communities that have historically been disproportionately represented in the jail and prison pipeline. I'm happy, thank you for um, allowing me to testify and um, moreover, thank you council members for the incredible and continued support you have shown this department and the people we serve over the years. I am pleased to answer any questions that you may have. I'll now turn it over to Chair Powers for questions. Thank you. Thank you for bearing with us on a marathon of a day as we're now at 620. Uh, I'm going to get a couple questions down and I'll hand it over to folks. Um, I thank you on the feedback on the bill that about the local commission uh, on release. Um, can you tell us um, uh, what staffing for that would look like if, if we did pass it? Does that require additional staffing? Do you believe the department could staff it or any ideas on that? Yes. Um, so in the past, it was staffed by uh, two probation line uh, folks um, and two administrative support uh, staff. And we think that's appropriate uh, moving forward. Uh, my understanding is that and, and the statute calls for five uh, commission members. So um, it would be a, a separate unit. And, and uh, distinctive unit within DOP. And we um, were confident that we could staff that. Okay, and, and in terms of appointees, do you, um, any, any thoughts on 
uh, qualifications or what would be looked for in terms of an appointing? Well, the the uh, state statute is very clear as to the qualifications uh, that are, are required. Um, so you know it would have to, it would have to conform with that. Um, I have let's see. Um, for example, so each member of the commission has to have uh, graduated from an accredited four-year college or university, at least five years of experience in the field of criminology, uh, the administration of criminal justice, law enforcement, probation, parole, law, social work, social science, psychology, psychiatry, or corrections. So it's a fairly you know, uh, definitive list of criteria that need to be met. Okay, um, thank you. Um, and um, can you tell us how many people are currently incarcerated due to a probation warrant or a violation of probation? There's very uh, few of those. There is an issue about the data there because oftentimes solely on a violation of probation, there's generally nobody on hold uh, at, at Rikers. Usually a person who is at Rikers on a violation of probation is because there's a new case for which they're being held. Judy, and you don't know how many there, there are in that case? Not at the moment. We can, we can, uh, I'm sorry? You have, okay. Um, so, but we file less than 1% of uh, violations right now. So, so it's very, I'm, I'm sure it's very few. Got it. And just to just, you know, on the bill that we have, I think there's, there is that state law, but I, I think that we read that as maybe a, maybe a minimum versus a, a, uh, uh, a, a maximum in terms of uh, stating it out, but we'll, we'll happy to work with you on in terms of um, hashing some of those issues out. Um, uh, are check-ins for juveniles now entirely remote? Uh, for the most part, we have uh, some group of young people that we go to their homes still. Our ICM, uh, which is our intensive um, community monitoring, is our alternative to detention. Uh, uh, intervention both for the youth parts and for family court. Um, we have, uh, we go to the youth's home as uh, on a regular basis, following social distancing, et cetera, but nobody comes to our offices. There's some cases that we go out, however. And is there is there any instance where you would provide a, a, a juvenile with a telephone or a tablet so they can be? Yes. Okay. Do you know how many instances you've done that? Uh, let's see. I thought I had that. I'm not sure I have that, but we have done that. I don't have the actual number. I will get that to you. But every young person, one of the things that we did when we moved to remote uh, work was to ensure that everybody had a device through which we could communicate. So they either have laptops or phones. And when they haven't had it, we've provided it for them. We've been able to do that. Yes. OK, thank you. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Chair Lanceman and then other members as well to be able to ask questions as needed. I believe Chair Lanceman does not have any questions. Okay, I see him waving. Okay, um, and um, uh, can I do, can I just ask uh, just a question in terms of the department itself? Have, do you know have any data on staff or individuals in terms of the Im impact of COVID on the department? Yes, so we've had uh, 30, 39 confirmed cases, um, 32 in the probation officer line, and um, seven in the non-probation officer uh, uh, units. Um, and uh, yes, that, that's. And, and everybody, how, how are folks doing? Are they? Folks have uh, recovered well. We had one confirmed uh, death, um, unfortunately, and one, one non-confirmed, but strongly suspected. Okay, I'm really sorry to hear that. So send all our best to, to everybody at the department and, and, and their families. Um, and then uh, just some fi just some final questions. Here. Has there been any requests for equipment or uh, it could be PPP, it could be other equipment or other things that the department has been unable to provide to folks at this time? So far, we have been able to provide what we need. We've been working very closely with our union, the UPOA, and between them and us, we've been, uh, you know, been able to outfit our staff with what they need to go out um, in uh, out in the field when needed, and to do the nutrition kitchen uh, food distribution as well, um, which we'll also actually providing through our nutrition kitchen food distribution, also PPEs for the public when they come to get their food, they get their 
you know, masks and, and information about COVID, et cetera. Okay, got it. Well, thank you. Thank you for spending so much time with us today. Uh, and and we, we send all our best to everybody at the department and uh, to their families. Thank you and hope you're staying safe and healthy as well. Do we have any other questions from folks? I don't see any at this point. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. We will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom. And I will call on you after the first group of panelists has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I would now like to welcome Dalvani Powell to testify. Starting time. Mr. Speaker, Chairperson, Council Member, my name is Dalvani K. Powell, proud president of more than 800 majority African female members of the United Probation Officers Association. For, for more than 33 years, I've worked in adult and family court services as a probation officer and supervising probation officer. Probation officers prior to appointment must minimally, must minimally have a four year college degree with related experience with related experiences or, or a master's degree. As peace officers, we carry firearms and undergo eight weeks of training. We are community correction supervision, the best incarceration alternative. We provide services to adults and to youth who have been convicted of a misdemeanor or a felony. Youth can be placed on probation from six months to two years, while an adult can be sentenced to probation for as long as 10 years. Probation officers enforce the conditions of probation. Officers teams interview potential clients and supervise probation or probationers slash clients for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. After court findings and convictions, officers complete mandated pre-sentence investigation reports. These critical documents include recommendations of community supervision or incarcerations. Officers make sure, make sure services are provided to those under our supervision. The objective is to keep people out of jail. Every probationer is an individual. We do not believe in one size fit all. We prepare supervision plans to meet the needs of our clients slash probationers. These plans are adjusted accordingly to each goal as each goal is met. Probation's primary objective is community safety and to assist those who we serve to become law abiding citizens as well as have new and meaningful lives. Probation is a second chance. COVID-19 has not changed our work. Probation officers and supervisor probation officers are required to make home visits. We are on the streets essential personnel protecting our city. Electronic monitoring is now an important tool for, our, for many reasons. It, all, it allows keeping more people out of city prisons while providing additional safety to the community at large. Whether an adult or youth should be incarcerated or placed in the juvenile facility during COVID, during the COVID pandemic must be contingent upon public safety risks. Who can, who can effectively provide this oversight are trained, experienced probation officers can and will. To the extent that we have to come in direct contact for their safety and for the safety of my members, we will take all we will have to take all safety recommended precautions. Therefore, therefore, to keep us on the street, we need the proper equipment such as PPEs, larger vehicles, the frequent cleaning of our offices and our reception areas, as well as the installation of plexiglasses in our offices when we go back to our new now. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you. Um, if there are no questions, we'll move on to the next group. Thank you for your testimony. I would now like to welcome Vidal Guzman to testify. After Mr. Guzman, I will be calling on Donna Hilton, Sharon White. Oh, apologies. We have one question from Council Member Powers, from Chair Powers. Hi there. Sorry about that. Um, and thank you for, for, for uh, sticking through a long hearing. I just want to say thank you to everybody who's been on this for, for seemingly all day now. But um, just as you talked about going back to work and all the 
um, all of those things you're going to need, including plexiglass equipment. Have you been talking to the department about your needs and have they indicated that they will be able to accommodate the needs of your folks whenever they may have to go back to work? Yeah, we continue to have labor management meetings with the department on a regular basis. And we have expressed to the department the needs that what we're going to need in order to do our job more effectively and to keep the members safe as well as our clients. So yeah, we've been working closely together with them. Okay. And right now, do you feel like you have everything that your folks have everything they need in terms of whether it's equipment or support right now from the department? I, like the commissioner said, we've given out um, um, PPEs to the members and the department has been very helpful with helping us get distributed to um, PPEs to, the, to our members. And like I said, they have been very cooperative with us in this whole, whole crisis. And, and thank the conversations continue. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for, for that and uh, hang in there and it's nice to see you virtually and uh, we'll hope to see you sometime in the near future. I just want to make sure that we get our plexiglasses. <laughs> We will be, you let us know, and we will be happy to, to help advocate for that as well. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, Chair Lanceman, did you have any questions? Okay. We will now move to our next panel. I would like to now welcome Vidal Guzman to testify. After Ms. Guzman, I will be calling on Donna Hilton, Sharon White-Harrigan, and Brandon Holmes. Time starts now. How you doing? Thank you, everybody, for giving me the opportunity. My name is Vidal Guzman. I was on Rikers Island, also the Manhattan Tombs. I'm also a Harlem residence, uh, resident. I am the outreach and, uh, and engagement organizer for the Close Rikers Island campaign. And thank you for hearing from me today. I want to talk about the conditions on Rikers Island, the culture and the response to COVID-19. and has people of fear for their life. We heard from people who are on Rikers Island, their loved ones, through our Free New York campaign, as, as we heard some of the DAs talk about it. The fear that I can hear and see in family members' faces and voices tells us that they are worried about their loved ones. The Department of Correction was not prepared. We knew they was not prepared when they gave masks too late to people detained from people who was incarcerated on Rikers and, and women who was incarcerated in Roses. There's no way to create a full plan to allow social distancing in Rikers Island. New, uh, New York City was not prepared to protect Rikers Island dur during the uh, Hurricane Sandy's or the swine flu epic, uh, epic center. Uh, they were slow to respond to this pandemic as well. I went through Rikers when I was 16 and again at 19 years old. And I will tell you that I learned how uh, New York's treat people who are incarcerated. We're always treated the second class when it comes to anything. Right. And I think another thing that I've been hearing, um, because I could also send you my testimony, was through DAs and everyone uh, talking about the importance of investing in communities. So for a lot of people who know that uh, the Close Rikers Island campaign created a built community platform, it's called two point, uh, the built community platform called 2.0, that talks about every single issue that every city council or DAs or anyone who actually spoke before us uh, uh, concerns, right? Some of these built community platforms talked about the public health, housing, employment, economic developments, education and school system, community programs and services, conflict transformation, alternative accountabilities, and structures and investments. So when people talk about answers about what public safety actually means, public safety has to be defined from the community side first. And when we talk about as an organizer, when I talk to people in my community about what they actually need was not more policing or uh, incarcerating people, was more investments in our community. This, you know, I overheard someone even quote, uh, 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 even give a quote. And this is what I have to say, because this is embedded in, in city hall's uh, uh, um, chamber, right? That this nation under God should, uh, should have a new birth of freedom that this government of the people, by the people, for the people, should not perish from the earth. And when we talk about quotes from Abraham Lincoln that define what exactly does our community actually need or what, is, what defines what a society that's healthier and thriving actually needs. Time's expired. All I have to say that when it comes to any community investments, we have the answers. It's called the Build Community 2.0, and we can send it to every single one of y'all. Thank you. Donna Hilton, you may begin. Time starts now. Good evening, thank you. So long waiting, but 
important. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak. I would like to say that all the things that I've heard on this hearing today, I, I'm changing my testimony. I have to bring to light that the, um, the issues that people have brought up, and I don't see many people from the DA's office and the like on the call on the hearing anymore, uh, continue to talk about those that continue to commit crimes or do or conduct or misbehave. We don't talk about the thousands upon thousands that don't. Most people like me and those that have been waiting to speak to you and are working on the front lines. I was in the field this morning addressing the needs of our communities. And I am including those on, on Staten Island, those who continue to be marginalized and discriminated against because they're poor. Poor poverty in itself is a violent, it's a violent situation, it's violent. But we don't wanna recognize that. We treat people badly because of it. We treat people badly because they're poor, because they're black, because they're not educated, but we don't look at the root causes of these things and want to address it. And we have become a country that wants to incarcerate it. You incarcerated me as an adolescent who was being raped and abused by a man who served in World War II, whose mother was the head of New York State Mental Health. You treated me less than, and you continue to treat those like me less than, instead of facing the issues that we oftentimes contribute to. If we continue to talk to people and talk about people like they are less than, that they are not human beings, that they are not uh, important, then they will continue to act in such a way. They should not wait until jail or incarceration to get the treatment, treatments that they need. Mental health is not, is not treated in jail. Substance abuse is not treated in jail. It is not. We see a, a lot of people still being technically violated right now, during this time, during this pandemic, going back to Rikers Island, sitting there and getting sick, very sick. And let's be clear and honest that the medical care on, in prisons and in jails on Rikers Island is an adequate subpar at best. And when you have, when you're sick and you're released and you go to uh, Elmhurst Hospital where the treatment is, you don't get treated as well as everyone else that's not, does not have a NICID number or a DIN number. Let's be very clear on that. So it, it's really disheartening right now during this time of a pandemic when human lives are at stake, regardless of guilt or innocence. And we must emphasize a lot of the people on Rikers Island are held pre-trial. They're detained. They're not convicted of anything. And if they are, they're sentenced to city time. You're talking about bills that have nothing to do with someone that's going to state prison. You're talking about bills that the city can address, that the council can address. These are not serious so-called offenses, violent or otherwise. They would not be doing time city expired. time if they were. Thank you for this opportunity, but I also demand that you start looking at people as human beings and recognize the co harms that you cause, you cause, and shame yourselves, shame yourselves. Thank you. Sharon White Harrigan, you may begin. Time starts now. I would just like to say thank you so much for this time to both chairman and the rest of the council's uh, committee committee members. Um, I just, for the things that I heard, I, I just don't even have enough time to even speak on that, but that would be another day. But I would like to speak to the 6184 bill to amend the administrative code of the city of New York in relation to the maximum fee allowed when transferring money to a person in the custody of the Department of Correction. And so in this time of, of this pandemic, we're already poor and marginalized people are hurting, struggling and suffering. People have lost their, has lost in their employment, their homes, their good health and their loved ones. We have to take time out to address a fee to transfer money to people incarcerated. This is reprehensible. We continuously find ways to target our black and brown communities. And so I represent the Women's Community Justice Association, but I'm also here representing the Justice for Women COVID-19 Task Force. And when the task force went to place money in the accounts of all the women on Rikers Island and could not give them $25 each because the fee went to $6, dollars and 95 cents per person. So we had to settle on $20 at $3 and 95 cents per person. 
or a wife who tries to maintain a household, a kid's transportation, just kind of keep things afloat and trying to support her incarcerated husband, but could only give him $15. But after the fee, it turns to eight. We shouldn't just cap the fee. It should be removed. In a time of COVID where everybody, everyone is suffering, come on. I mean, this is not even something that should be up for discussion. We need to stop profiting off the backs of poor people. And lastly, we need to do better with our language and categorizing people. It's offensive and anyone here would be offended if we were stigmatized. So when we know better, we should do better. It's not inmates, it's not you know, these are derogatory names. These are men and women who are detained or incarcerated. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, and uh, I just wanna just clarify, I, I think we have uh, are in agreement to you with you about um, the fees and, uh, you know, in this council I've tried to pass legislation that as long as I've been here in the chair, to uh, eliminate any sort of uh, area where uh, we think the city is making money off folks who are incarcerated. It's unconscionable. It, it, it's, 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 um, it's, it's, it's hard to believe at any point that that has been the, the policy of this city. Um, on this particular one, we are uh, looking at some of the state laws and how this bill interacts with the state laws and what we're allowed to do. Of course, I think if we are able to, we would get this to uh, uh, to be no fee. And I just thought I want to share that intention because I would be look at the, some of the state law this interacts with. Um, but I am very grateful to a lot of my colleagues and we who have introduced and passed legislation in this council about telephone calls. We've done fees on, on, on bail and other things. And that's where this is intended for you guys to share that. So you understand where we're coming from as well. Um, you for the testimony. And we'll, uh, I think Alana will move on to the next one. Thank you. Next, we have Brandon Holmes. Time starts now. Good evening. I'm a lifelong New Yorker whose family has been on the other side of the bars at Rikers Island. And I'm testifying on behalf of Just Leadership USA and the Close Rikers campaign, and as a member and supporter of Jails Action Coalition. Thank you to the city council and all central member staff who've shown a commitment over the last two months to holding this administration and its agencies accountable to protecting the most vulnerable New Yorkers during this pandemic. We have a long way to go to complete the New York City we are fighting to build. And because of this, I wanna acknowledge the urgency of the current budget making process. We need a council that is going to be relentless. Many of you have participated in the height of a grassroots movement to end mass incarceration, a movement to respect black lives and to invest in the infrastructure needed to afford housing, education and health care as rights for all New Yorkers. The urgency of your work and our work to shrink the jail population, demolish facilities on Rikers and enforce true culture transformation within the justice system is directly tied to the urgency of fully funding and supporting communities, not only in a time of crisis and pandemic, but always. The mission to close Rikers in partnership with directly impacted communities and advocates is more urgent than ever. And while this mayor, district attorneys, and NYPD Commissioner Shea are set on hoarding resources for law enforcement and punitive responses during a global pandemic, while their cops have been recorded on multiple occasions assaulting New Yorkers of color, New York City has to realize we have faced a deficit before. There is no shortage of money during this pandemic that we can't overcome. What we have is a misalignment of priorities, which will dig us deeper into a depression if you do not fight for budget justice. The Close Rikers campaign and our leaders support the reporting amendment to improve transparency and oversight of DOC and CHS pandemic response efforts. We enthusiastically support the creation of a local conditions release commission. In April, over 1500 New Yorkers were released through COVID-19 advocacy efforts. And many of these people were reunited with loved ones, continued education, or received treatment in their communities. We've seen that roughly 95% of the people released have avoided rearrest. Despite fear mongering and racism from media and law enforcement bigs, there is no increase or crime wave. In the past several weeks, though, we have seen a slight increase from the city's low of around 3,808 uh, average daily population to 3,943 uh, reported May 18th. 
we have seen a significant results from the city's more cost-effective hotel placement programs too, which have been done in partnership with nonprofit service providers who can support people recently released or people with supervision conditions. The city, the city should be investing in future resources that will further the progress we've made towards decarceration and ending mass incarceration and protecting that and future generations of New York. This commission should also serve a more transparent and aggressive role for correcting harmful trends within the justice system through challenging district attorneys and judicial discretion or enhancing New York City based ATD and ATI programs to protect New Yorkers uh, from current failures on bail reform. I'll submit the rest of my testimony uh, to the record. Thank you. Are there any questions from Chair Powers? Chair Lanceman? Thank you. If there are no questions from any other council members, we will move to the next panel. Next up is Dr. Victoria Phillips, who will be followed by Jennifer Parrish, Kelsey Davila, and Bianca Tylek. Time starts now. Yes, hello, it's Ms. V. I'm from the Jails Action Coalition, Zero Profits Coalition, Mental Health Project, and Justice for Women COVID Task um, Force. I want you to hear directly from the inside. Listen to your constituents, please. The beds next to us to look like someone occupied it, so they don't bring anyone else. He signed a, a paper that I wrote. He's one of the guys signed out of 40 people. We all went through these symptoms and all these problems with the COVID-19. Mm -hmm. um, there's a guy named Jesus Alvarez. He was held way over his time. He's supposed to have been released. He couldn't find out who his lawyer was, who was parole, so he was just stuck here. Um, my, uh, my friend, who you, the other one that's on the line with us, we found out who his lawyer was. His lawyer got into his parole, so within three days he was out of here. A week later, he died because he was sick from COVID. So as soon as he got released, he didn't even make it a week and he died. And his name is Jesus Alvarez. And he was one of the men that was in his dorm with me. And he was a nice old guy. I, I, I just want to hurry up and skip forward because a lot of things were said today. So um, there, uh, I, it's very important. I had this call last night because I know DOC likes to tell um, everyone that I reach out to that things are taken care of. So I had to make sure I got this call in last night. And so please listen. Um, the hell people came today. They came twice during this whole pandemic. They come once like a month and a half ago and they came today to see if anyone is sick. Things like that or having any symptoms, but I'll, like we said, I'll, I'll tell them like you're two months too late. Like everything they're doing now, it's great that they're doing things now, but they're way late. After we spoke with you that Tuesday or after after Tuesday on Wednesday, that's when they started coming. Oh, you have the supplies here. You go with this. They started bringing things. They brought a sign that they cleaned the phones. And they start posting things. Thank you for using. Call you Goodbye. This is like ridiculous. My chest, my back, my feet, my arms. And I'm just, this happens to a lot of people here, so we've all come to the, the conclusion, like, it's no water. Because we don't know what the hell is breaking us out like this. Like, it gets bad, like, it turns red, it breaks out like rashes, and then a few days later, it'll start turning brown. Then my skin will peel, and I'll be itching, like, I can't even explain it, it's almost like poison ivy or something. I'm seeing from that rule book that they don't abide by body. And there's no new documentation, there's nothing in black and white that's been changed. They haven't provided any information like that to show otherwise. So, according to this rule book, it still applies until they produce another one. But at least we really need them. And we have no type of outlet unless you go to the yard. And, you know, like we go out there and people want to come back because you don't want to drink from the south. Water holes, you don't have water out there. They get my re rehabilitation continued to like what facility they have to start it back. So that's the best rehab that I can get is go into the yard, try to stretch my arms, try to work out my arms a little bit, rehab my legs a little bit. And then, Time expired. Or can you get your medication? That's it. Other than that, we have nothing. No type of outlet. So let me notepad to write on. You have you can't listen to any of your inspirational things because you don't have batteries because the commissary doesn't have the battery. And right. you, your your in your housing unit is not up to par for a heat sensitive unit 
but if you go across the yard, you don't have access to water unless you're drinking out of a broken hole. Yeah, it's right next to urinals and toilets, exactly. That's disgusting. Um, uh, officers are not wearing masks. You know what I'm saying? They, 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 they touch you. Uh, like other individuals touching other areas with their personal gloves. Like, uh, you know, uh, like, like, you know, personal matting gloves or something like that or any type of gloves. Not no rubber gloves, but matting gloves. And they're touching other things like chains, handcuffs, or whatever it may be. They touch the kiosks that logs you into different locations. And then touching you, touching your, your shoulder area, your neck, by your face. You know what I'm saying? So that's, that's really not a good Ms. Folks, thank you. We're gonna have to we're gonna have to move on. I'm sorry I cut you off there. I know you had more, but you can definitely send that to us. And I would just note to anybody, for any individual, I mean, I, I agree with some of the sentiment in there, which is it seems like we were very late in terms of in, in instances of getting the appropriate um, resources we needed, whether it's sanitized or hand soap or or much or even release things like that. Um, we certainly our office and uh, staff here will, will accept any of those, um, either whether anonymous or or if somebody wants to call us to talk to us about any of those individual issues. But thank you for the testimony. And I think we'll keep going unless there's questions. Oh, Councilmember Sam, I think Amber Samuel has a has a question. Um, I just wanted to say real quick um, that I appreciate you, sis, for that, because um, when we're conducting these hearings, we um, say that we are making sure that we hear from the public, hear from our constituents, and allow people to be able to testify on whatever the subject matter is. And what we're never able to do is be able to hear directly from our brothers and sisters who are detained. And um, just like the other sister said, Ms. Hilton, that um, you know, we have to remember these are individuals um, that are not evicted. They are detained, right? And so they, um, you know, our brothers and sisters are still even able to vote during this time. And so again, I just want to say that I appreciate you for being able to come in and allow us to hear the voices because we were not, that. that is something that we didn't, we're, we're never able to capture. And so I just wanted to say, I appreciate you and that's all I have to say. Thank you. And we And we should figure out a way to be able to hear the voices of our brothers and sisters um, so that they can be able to testify before our hearings as well. That's it. Thank you. Next, we have Jennifer Parrish. Starting time. Good evening. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. My name is Jennifer Parrish. I work at the Urban Justice Center Mental Health Project, and I'm a member of the Jails Action Coalition. There are still more people in the jails who should be released. I want to focus on the 199 people incarcerated solely on technical parole violations. After the governor announced that this population would be released, the State Department of Corrections and Community Supervision implemented this directive by categorically excluding from eligibility for release people with serious mental health concerns. After this blatant discrimination against people with mental health disabilities came to light, Doc said that it would reconsider the release of people who were initially disqualified. However, there's been no public reporting on the outcome of that review. We fear that many of the 199 individuals incarcerated on technical parole violations may be there due to their mental health disability. Please keep in mind that mental health disabilities place people at high risk for serious complications from COVID-19 and is a reason for their release. Extensive research has established that serious mental health concerns and the attendant chronic stress, anxiety, or depression compromise the immune system's ability to defend the body against viral infections. In addition, people with serious mental health concerns Conditions have higher rates of chronic medical conditions, such as hypertension, diabetes, and cardi cardiovascular disease, which increase their vulnerability to COVID-19. Also, I want to respond to what Ms. Harris said about the 60 people whom the Brooklyn DA refused to release because of their mental health needs. 
Just as Mock Day arranged hotels to house people who would be homeless upon release, the city should be providing services to make sure that those people with mental health needs aren't denied release because of their disabilities. For example, the city could involve mental health treatment providers, such as forensic assertive community treatment teams, to provide those services to these individuals who could also be placed in the hotels. This is a clear example of people with mental health needs being warehoused in jail because there's no accessible comprehensive services for them in the community. DAs and judges are content to leave people with disabilities in jail. This is shameful and the council should not stand for it. You must ensure that funding for these resources is included in the city budget. I also want to mention that we're concerned about the availability of mental health care and discharge planning for those who remain in jail. CHS is certainly committed to providing the care, but given all the competing interests within the jails, many incarcerated individuals are not having their mental health needs met. We urge the courts and district attorneys to reduce the number of people going into jail, not only because of concerns regarding COVID-19, but also because of the strain on health care generally. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you. Thank you for waiting for so long to testify to everybody. Let's let's have a follow-up conversation after the hearing, maybe in the, this week, about some of the issues you raised, particularly around 199 folks. And we'll have a chat that maybe we can do to talk about following up. Thank you for that. Next, Kelsey Davila. Starting time. Hello, my name is Kelsey Diavila, and I work with Brooklyn Defender Services. Thank you, chairs, for calling this necessary hearing. I appreciate the questions that have been asked, most notably those aimed at the DA's gross mischaracterization and disconnect of how jails are appropriate responses for care and safety. You know, today, we heard two very different perspectives. Uh, one narrative is shared by city agencies and largely reflects policies to describe how things should be, while the other is described by directly impacted people who see firsthand how those policies are failing them. From the advocates before me and in the panels to come, you're gonna be hearing a very different reality than what you heard by the agencies. You're going to continue to hear about conditions and what's happening in the courts. So just due to time, I'm just gonna focus on uh, issues related to access. The first being the CHS hotline. Of course, we support additional means of communication, but the implementation has caused a great deal of confusion and concern. It wasn't clear that there was a separate number for mental health, the hours are limited, and even during the set hours, people in custody are sometimes met with a voicemail. There's no confirmation or follow-up. Um, and just to briefly discuss about the phones, in BOC's recent report, and today board staff said that they did not find phones, that they, they did not find phones to be regular regularly disinfected, nor were there cleaning agents within the vicinity of the phone areas. Our office hears these, these same concerns consistently. People have resorted to using their own soap and shampoo in an attempt to sanitize the receiver, or they cover the phone with their sock. People do this not because they want to, but because they feel those are their only options at protecting themselves. And the second piece is about grievances. I know DOC's Office of Constituent Grievance Services staff are now primarily working remotely, and, the new, and the, their new protocol is encouraging people in custody to share their grievances with correction officers, who are then to share it with grievance staff. This fails to address the very real problem of submitting complaints to officers in the unit. In some cases, people have no choice but to submit them to a correction officer, which eliminates any notion of privacy and endangers people who voice their complaints. Our office has received hundreds of calls from people in custody, and this is not an exaggeration. People are terrified, they are anxious, and these calls are being heard by family members, their loved ones, and, and the other defender offices we're all hearing the same thing. And I just wanna stress that these issues are not isolated to just a couple of people, but rather uh, facility and island wide. And I just wanna end on this note that the chief medical officer said today that the focus is on new admissions contributing to the rate of infection to the jail population. You know, the larger strategy here for containing this virus must include and address NYPD practices and we must continue decarceration efforts. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you also as as far as uh, in terms of waiting for a very long day, and thanks for the testimony. And, and um, um, you know, similar to what I said earlier is is as there are particular instances coming up. So first of all, I, I did not get to my section of questions on grievances. I should mention that 
I had a number of questions on that and due to timing, we'd be here at midnight if I went through all my questions, but, um, but we, um, we did have some questions around that that we'll follow up with. In terms of any, any particular, if you are hearing of any particular areas where perhaps there's not a proper, um, uh, uh, and when and there's a, the clock going on right now, um, if, if um, so, I'm, I'm going to keep going. Um, if there's our particular entities that you think are worth bringing back to us, we have regular, uh, we are having regular calls with all the agencies that were on here today to talk about specific issues and raise them. Our staff who are on here have been in regular contact with them about particular areas where we think there's something that needs attention and. Um, and of course, there's just the Board of Corrections as well. We can raise those to them as well. And I just raise that because I know I don't know that everybody understands or knows that we are in a sort of constant communication with them, bringing issues and vice versa. So um, on the very particulars of any particular housing unit might need something or if an individual raised something, those are things worth relaying to us in addition to the work you're doing. And we will do our job to make sure that we follow up with them and get attention on them. So thank I you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Trevor. And, um, I think we have a copy of your testimony as well. So thank you. Thank you. Next is Bianca Tylek. Starting time. Hi, hello. Um, thank you. Is it? Oh, I can't actually. Hear. Um, thank you uh, for calling this meeting and for the chairs, um, uh, chairs Power and chairs Lanceman for um, just your continual work on these issues. Uh, I want to reinforce one all of the calls that advocates have been making for obviously releases from the facilities um, as well as the conditions. But I also do want to talk really specifically today about. Um, the uh, bill uh, around money transfer fees. Um, so I think that there's a number of things that were raised in the testimony um, earlier from um, some of the administrators that I think really needs to be honed in on. Um, so I think the first thing that I wanted to sort of um, address is that this bill, um, while a really important intention, also just codifies state law. There is um, the fact that there's state law that exists and the city has been getting a waiver um, from that state law to charge more um, is something that kind of hasn't been raised. And the fact that there has to be a city law to simply ensure that state, like our city agencies um, actually abide by state law um, is, is reprehensible. It seems absolutely ridiculous um, and quite low of a bar. Um, and so in saying that, it feels like the city should do more than what is required simply by state law. Having to pass that city ordinance um, seems um, a very bizarre um, sort of tactic and it feels like we can and should do more. Um, importantly, there was a question asked um, to DOC around whether it has spoken to DAS um, uh, sorry, to DCAS about other free opportunities to make city payments. And in fact, um, they had not. And this exact question was raised by the city council back in 2016 when another similar bill was being considered. Um, and at that time, city council members had once again asked whether um, the, whether DOC had in fact um, checked with DCAS about three ways um, that people would be able to make money transfers. They had not then, and now four years later, they have still not. And so uh, it's absolutely imperative that the city council actually hold DOC accountable to that because we know that there are actually several other agencies, jurisdictions around the country, states and counties um, and cities that are actually doing this themselves um, where the fees are far lower. Arkansas, Maine, Montana are all doing that. And now during COVID, um, this rate, is actually really, I mean, when we're talking about families um, or people inside rather using their own cleaning supplies, things that their families bought in commissary with that money that was transferred, um, having to use that money to uh, pay for these items, then absolutely these should be free right now. And when we talked about free phone calls, that cost of free phone calls, um, you know, was a cost that the city took on. And it feels like this is in that I'm place. Fired more than two families are spending $2 million a year on money transfer fees, something that obviously um, they, were, they should have never had to pay. And now during COVID, um, certainly they cannot afford. Uh, the very last point, and I'm gonna stop, is just that payment processing fees, like just generally do not top 3% in the free world. There's absolutely no justifiable reason that JPay, this predatory company is, pay, is charging as much as 
to make a payment transfer. Uh, thank you for your time. And we'll be submitting a uh, written testimony with more on the technical aspects of this legislation. Great, thank you. We'll, we'll, um, uh, we'll take your written testimony when you have it. Um, and we'll schedule a follow-up to talk about some of the points you raised when it comes to the bill. Um, and, and we are trying to address some of, I think, some of those issues. And I think you, you know, for, and, and, and I appreciate all your work you've done with the council on this in these areas, at least since I've been the chair for the last two years. Um, and I think we share a lot of the sentiments that you raised and some of it's a, how to draft and how to work through some of those issues, but we're happy to set, set, have a follow-up conversation with you to talk through some of those issues. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thanks. Thank you. Um, if there are, I see no other council member questions. If there are council member questions, please use the raise hand function. Okay, seeing that there are no council member questions, we will move to our next panel. Next testifying will be Mary Lynn Whirlwas, Lisa Freeman, Young Mi Lee, and Zachary Katz Nelson. Mary Lynn Whirlwas, you may begin. Starting time. Good evening. And I'm Mary Lynn Whirlwas, the director of the Prisoners' Rights Project at the Legal Aid Society. And thank you for giving us this time and everyone sticking around so that we can all work together. It's actually been a very informative day. There are many things I think we've learned. One thing we've learned today, CHS and DOC have the data about COVID-19, scientific information that would greatly benefit public policy and help New Yorkers understand their health. They just haven't shared it. If we want data-driven policy in our city, we need the data. So we greatly appreciate the council's efforts to obtain important fact data, including cumulative infection rates, testing, housing density in the Department of Corrections that we need to guide our response to this challenge. That's why we support the legislation seeking this data and encourage your steadfast commitment following through. It doesn't slight the efforts of the hardworking people in CHS or DOC or the city to face the fact that the city jails by their congregate nature are not providing the physical separation and sanitation to stop this virus. The talk of an average occupancy in the department blurs the reality that in our city, a dozen, three or four dozen men are confined during this pandemic in the same room, breathing the same air, using the same toilet 24 hours a day. That's simply a public health hazard to them and to all of us. We cannot morally burden the doctors and nurses who are trying to control this virus with the added weight of new admissions to the jail. The city must accelerate its decarceration work. It hasn't done enough and work aggressively to ensure that vulnerable people are out of harm's way. Uh, very disturbingly today, we also did not hear agency officials today acknowledge, let alone deal with many of the facts that people in custody are not getting what they need. That, this, that we've heard about CHS phone lines, but not about the many complaints that they're dirty or not answered. We've heard about people not wearing masks, but not about their repeated and futile efforts to get them. Even, even here insinuations that incarcerated people must prefer to clean the communal handset. That's their only link to a doctor with a sock rather than a sanitizer. Uh, and on that last note, we've heard about cleaning, but not about the workers tasked with this critical public health mission, namely incarcerated workers. And this is a group of people most exposed and most likely to expose others as they hand deliver 12,000 meals a day to their brothers and sisters, move from unit to unit, their risk is astronomical, their bargaining power non-existent. We, just as we supported COVA at the Legal Aid Society in its efforts to obtain masks and protective gear, so too do we support these workers and ask the council to intervene and protect them doing this critical public health work. The work is just beginning. It's work for mortal stakes. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to do it all with you and for the council hearing all of us today. Thank you, and thank you for your work throughout this uh, pandemic, even from the beginning, uh, all your folks to help raise issues that might be needed to be addressed early on when it comes to conditions in there. We really appreciate um, that work that is ongoing and does help inform us being able to do more work. And in areas where there are folks who are working that need PPE, obviously we support them and we will be happy to lend our voices to any places where people are not getting 
proper treatment or equipment. So just please stay in touch with us then. Thank you for waiting and thank you for the testimony. Thank you. Next, we have Lisa Freeman. Starting time. Hi, my name is Lisa Freeman. I'm the director of the Juvenile Rights Special Litigation and Law Reform Unit at the Legal Aid Society. And um, I would reiterate much of what Mary Lynn has said, but say that while there were many problems with the testimony of folks with regard to the adult system, the testimony with regard to the juvenile system is is really frankly just as troubling. There is no testing program going on in the juvenile system. There is no contact tracing going on in the juvenile system. We know kids are getting infected. They all live in housing areas that were envisioned to be used only when the kids were not out of the housing area and at school, but instead, because all school is happening remotely, the kids are locked into the units essentially all day long, except when they are um, either doing recreation or they're, or they're eating their meals. And all of this is happening, happening congregately. So there's also no reporting whatsoever. So these, these numbers, we've heard numbers in the past, but these numbers were the first that we've heard that were confirmed. And I think in part it's because there's no testing. So they don't even know what the scope of the crisis is. Uh, we, we in fact have been told that there were more than 40 staff who've tested positive in the juvenile system. So, you know, there really needs to be, um, there really needs to be a stepping up on the part of ACS and, and, um, and we would call on the council to hold their feet to the fire and mandate reporting and mandate um, more information flow. Um, I would also just point out a couple of other things. There, were, there was discussion um, from uh, council member um, Amphrey Samuels and uh, Rose about complaints that they've heard about access you know, all in-person visits have been stopped. You can only imagine what a frightening experience this is for kids who are incarcerated or for, or for their families. And the, the technological obstacles that they're talking about, you know, obviously need to have been addressed by now. Uh, we also have been told that it was only as of this week that kids are beginning to get access or are supposed to begin to get access to actual teachers. Uh, <laughs> they've been handed, you know, uh, packets often packets, not even computers, but more recently, I think they've been improving it and getting them access to computers, but no actual live individuals to assist them with their schoolwork. So there really needs to be increased programming, which is not happening. There needs to be uh, improved school access. And um, you know, one of the key programs for kids in the summer is kids even in detention have access to the summer youth employment program, or some do. And we would really call that, that the council um, press for that to be funded so that there is in fact an opportunity for kids to have some meaningful experience while they're incarcerated. So thank you to the city council for holding this hearing and uh, we look forward to working with you. Thank you. Next is Young Mi Lee. Starting time. Good evening. Um, my name is Young Mi Lee. I'm a supervising attorney at Brooklyn Defender Services in the criminal defense practice. I want to thank uh, the city council committees on criminal justice and justice system, uh, as well as uh, the chairs Powers and Landsman. Uh, BDS supports intro 6175, which would create a local conditional release commission with the power and duty of determining which persons sentenced within the city of New York may be released on conditional release and under what circumstances. Um, I did hear testimony from the DAs earlier uh, voicing their opposition to the re-establishment of such a commission. However, uh, I think an isolated incident uh, which led to the eventual disbandment of this commission in 2005 should not be the reason why we do not have a, a local conditional uh, release commission. Uh, the reason why I'm giving this testimony is that uh, as BDS has been working so hard through so many writs, including parole writs, uh, to release people from Rikers Island, um, we are seeing that parole violations are continuing at an extremely steady rate 
Uh, we see people who are coming through arraignments, getting ACDs, uh, good dispositions on their open criminal cases, yet they're being held uh, because of parole violations. And many of these parole violations are based on really uh, technical violations like missing curfews, missing appointments, uh, and people are just going back to Rikers Island and it's being repopulated as we work so hard to try to get as many people out of Rikers Island. We believe that a local um, conditional release commission uh, working with the Department of Probation as opposed to the parole board uh, will help uh, depopulate, decarcerate Rikers Island. We, uh, we strongly believe that these arbitrary decisions to just um, issue and execute parole violations uh, would not be as rampant, especially for those people who are serving city uh, jail sentences of up to a year. Um, and for those reasons, uh, if a local conditional release commission is established, obviously choosing who will serve on that commission uh, is extremely important. We would ask that at least one or two uh, defender uh, representatives as well as advocate uh, representatives uh, serve on that commission. Because really uh, when I hear the, the testimony, when I heard the testimony from the DAs earlier, this is not just a question of public safety uh, and who is deemed to be dangerous. Unexpired. It's really about the humane treatment um, and providing services for, for really the most needy people in New York City. Uh, and for those reasons, we do support uh, the establishment of a local conditional release commission. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. I, I share a lot of your, your sentiment there and I just wanted to add my, uh, my agreement with you that I think that the past, the reason that uh, I was cited for the past uh, breakup of that commission does not seem to me to be relevant to the need to maybe reestablish one and protect against any particular situation that may have caused uh, it, it to be abolished in the past. So I, I appreciate you raising that point as well. Um, thank you and thank you for, for waiting so long through all of this. I think we're gonna head to the next person. Next is Zachary Katznelson. Time begins now. Hi, good evening. I'm Zachary Kept Nelson. I'm the policy director at the Littman Commission, and thank you for holding this hearing. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I uh, want to start out by just saying the approach, as, as many of you have mentioned, uh, the council members have mentioned, the approach over the last several weeks to jail, using it incredibly sparingly or hopefully as sparingly as possible, making sure that it truly is the last resort. That should be the new normal moving forward. And we need to do everything we can as a city to make sure that that's possible. So one way, one key way to do that is to ensure that there's a robust array of alternative to incarceration programs. So when DAs and judges are looking at a case, looking at an individual, there's a program there that they meet, meets their security concerns, but also meets the concerns and the needs of the person who's facing incarceration. And so that's things like the commission, the conditional release commission being considered today, which we support. It's things like making permanent the 6A program, which the city has been using to get city sentence folks out of jail. And it's making sure that supervised release providers have the resources that they need. And there are really two through points for all those programs. The first is the incredible community of nonprofit service providers who have stepped up tremendously during this time to provide services, wraparound services that some of the DAs themselves mentioned earlier is necessary for them to feel comfortable with releases, but also the provision of housing. And the city really has been tremendous in providing housing over the past several weeks to anyone coming out of incarceration, both at the state level and the city level, who needs it? And that housing matters tremendously. You know, study after study after study shows the importance of stability to people's ability to, to you know, get back on their feet and frankly, not to commit more crime. And so we really need to focus on that. And the cost of, of housing somebody, providing wraparound services, which are critical, it, it's not cheap on its face. Obviously it's 70, 80, sometimes even $90,000, depending on the intensity of services. But compare that to the upwards of $350,000 a year that we spend at Rikers Island. And what do we get for that? We get degradation, we get brutality, we get violence, we get isolation. And so continuing down that path is not only morally unacceptable, it is fiscally irresponsible. And so really this is an opportunity to shift quite dramatically the way that we approach incarceration moving forward. 
And I, I would just I would just note one one key piece of this, obviously, moving forward is the closure of Rikers itself. And to get that done, we need to get borough based jails built as quickly as possible. And so over the next fiscal year, there needs to be money there and we need to ensure to move forward that the planning process moves forward, that the design build teams are selected, that procurement moves forward so that we can get stakes in the ground as soon as possible and ensure the jails are built by 2026 at the very latest, but hopefully sooner than that. And with that, thank you very much for my time. I appreciate it. Thank you. If there are no council member questions, we will move to the next group. Seeing no questions. I will call on the next panel. We have Elizabeth Fisher, who will be followed by Tahani Dunn, and then Christopher Boyle, and then Alex Tereshnikova, and Amanda Mazel. Um, Elizabeth Fisher, you may begin. I begin Good. now. Good evening. I'm the managing attorney of the criminal defense practice at the Neighborhood Defender Service of Harlem. And thank you for holding this hearing. And I want to say off the bat that we support all three proposed measures that have been discussed today. But I want to talk uh, briefly about something that has only been mentioned in passing. From when the pandemic first hit, we have been fighting for the release of our clients from city jails and juvenile detention centers in order to protect them and those who are forced to remain in those facilities from this too often deadly disease. And amidst these efforts, we were pleased to hear that electronic monitoring had become available on April 20th to allow for the release of additional pretrial detainees that judges and DAs had not yet seen fit to release. Upon learning of this new initiative coordinated by Mock J and the Sheriff's Department, our attorneys immediately began to ask for the release of our clients on electronic monitoring. And despite these requests, a month into the electronic monitoring program today, we have been unable to get the court to release a single client on electronic monitoring. Indeed, as of today, only three people have been released on electronic monitoring across all five boroughs. This initial failure of electronic monitoring to secure pretrial detainees release has two primary causes that we've seen. One is that the requirements for eligibility, which are stable housing and a telephone disqualify the poorest clients who could benefit from its use the most. Our cash bail system has already ensured that whether someone remains incarcerated pending trial depends mostly on whether they're rich or poor and the electronic monitoring eligibility requirements exacerbate this inequity. Rather than requiring that clients show they already have access to stable housing and a phone, the city should help facilitate and coordinate access to these resources necessary for eligibility so that no one is declined release by electronic monitoring simply due to poverty. The other reason that we've seen that electronic monitoring has not allowed more people to be released from our city jails is that judges and prosecutors are simply refusing to use it. Even though it can mitigate concerns about flight risk, prosecutors and judges are not agreeing to release people who could be safely back at home on electronic monitoring. If prosecutors and judges begin using pretrial detention only for its intended purpose of assuring a client's return to court and not as punishment or as a tool to induce a client to plead guilty, there are far more than three people across our city who could be released and could be home and not in our jails now with the electronic monitoring program. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Tahani Dunn. Time begins. Okay. Good evening. My name is Tahani Dunn, and I am a criminal defense and prisoner's rights attorney with the Bronx Defenders. On behalf of the Bronx Defenders and the Bronx community, I would like to thank you for your attention for these critical matters and for the opportunity to testify before you today. Our office has submitted comprehensive written testimony. However, my testimony today will specifically address the persistent violations of minimum standards regarding punitive segregation and issues relating to access to counsel. In the course of hundreds of conversations with our clients and advocates in my office, it became apparent that every single one of our clients who has been placed in solitary confinement reported that it happened without a hearing. In almost every case, our client reported receiving not receiving a ticket explaining the alleged infraction or the disposition stating the findings and the consequences. Their rights to due process are being compromised in ways that are unacceptable no matter what the circumstances may be. To make matters worse, our clients have reported that when they inquire into these due process violations and attempts to assert their rights, they are told by correctional officers that the, that the disciplinary process has been suspended due to COVID-19. To our knowledge, no such suspension was granted by any government governing board, body, or agency. 
The remedy for addressing these due process violations is to file an Article 78. However, gathering the necessary information to write and file this motion requires the ability to communicate with our clients, which, as I will explain, has been extremely challenging. As a result, our clients sit in solitary confinement for 30 consecutive days without any due process or legal recourse. Access to counsel has been significantly limited since the onset of the crisis. Without in-person visits, video conferences are the only way for attorneys and advocates to proactively communicate with our clients in custody. They're, they are also the only means to conduct virtual court appearances, competency exams, and now grand jury proceedings, therefore creating a significant backlog, requiring requests to be made several weeks in advance. In addition to the backlog, urgent issues of confidentiality and technical difficulties affecting audio occur frequently. Our clients are rarely in the booth at the start time of the video conference, cutting significantly into the 30 minute time slot. 30 minute video conferences are inadequate for serious and case related conversations, thus impairing our clients' rights to have access to their defense team in a way that could have devastating effects on the outcome of their cases. We ask that the City Council inquire into efforts to increase, expand, and, and systemize these video conference capacity, capabilities. We applaud DOC for providing people in custody with a round of free stamps and pre-stamped envelopes at the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis, and are happy to hear that this will continue. In addition to ongoing mailing supplies, we, re we request that DOC implement a mail forwarding process for all mail, but specifically legal mail. It is frequently reported to us by our clients that they have not received mail from our office. It, this seems to be due in part to the increase in facility transfers on Rikers Island and NYC jails. While advocates understand the need to move people in custody around to keep them and others safe and healthy, placement in new facilities should not hinder one's ability to receive their legal mail. Legal mail I'm almost expired. Legal mail almost always contains sensitive and confidential information relating to a person's ongoing case, thus the importance of having mail forwarding system is essential. In conclusion, we encourage City Council to con consider involving the adv advocacy community as well as those directly impacted by incarceration as part of the commission and urge the council to think creatively about other ways to reduce barriers to decarceration. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you could send that over, just make sure we have it. I want to I not heard that mail issue so we could take a look into it. and. Obviously, the issue around punitive segregation uh, very concerning. So if you can share that with us so we can have our staff and maybe the board take a look into it. That'd Absolutely. Be cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Next is Christopher Boyle. Uh, can everybody hear me? OK. Yes. Okay, great. Um, time begins. I want to thank the chairpersons and the committee for having the um, the meeting today and uh, we really appreciate it. But I, I wanna, I've already submitted my testimony. I'm not gonna read it. I wanna go into a bunch of things that have come up during the uh, many hours I've sat and watched the hearings here. The first is, is I, I under, my understanding is that the governor is telling uh, nursing home staff that they have to be tested uh, twice a week when they go into the nursing homes. I don't understand why there shouldn't be at least two tests a week for Department of Corrections staff personnel, as well as clients and inmates going into the facility, uh, I think it's pretty clear that there is this two or three day lag time at best, uh, and it makes sense to double test people each each week. I don't know why that's not happening. Um, I've been on phone calls with the Board of uh, Corrections. They have been helpful, uh, but one of the things that come up is that uh, they've been talking about having different categories of clients to try to get them released, and they started with the over 50 population and the population uh, that had pre-existing conditions of some type. Uh, we need to expand that. Uh, there, there are nonviolent offenders that are under the age of 50 that don't have any pre-existing conditions that should be getting out so they could physically separate from the over 50 group that have pre-existing conditions that are charged with homicides or violent felonies that we may not get out. Uh, you need to be able to socially distance these groups. Uh, we have done a survey and we've asked clients to answer questions of our survey. Some of the anecdotes that we have are, uh, one client said, the only way I can socially distance is if I stay in my bed all the time, otherwise I'm around other people. I stay in my cell most of the time. I shower at night to avoid the crowds in the bathrooms, even though we aren't allowed to. Cleaning supplies are scarce. I tell officers and captains that there's no cleaning supplies or rags, and they give me the runaround. 13% of our clients report that dock staff wear masks at all times. 54% state that their masks are visibly dirty. 77% of individuals have been reusing the same mask for at least a week. Um, only 18% of clients state that they are able to observe socially distancing protocols. 
Uh, we tried to give uh, PPE material over to a client. We mailed it to them. Department of Corrections wouldn't accept it. They mailed it back to us. We sent a FOIA request on April 24th to the Department of Corrections to get information from them about uh, the PPEs and how they're handing them out. We followed up on May 5th. We followed up on May 14th. Uh, so far, we've received no response. I do want to add that we've gotten about 100 people out and 98% uh, have not recidivated. Uh, we've only had two clients that during that time period got rearrested. So 98% of our clients are staying out and staying uh, engaged in reentry reform. Uh, I would ask uh, about the, the uh, electronic monitoring is a major problem. Uh, the fact is, is that this, ha this has been going on for about three weeks. Uh, and we all thought that the, the 50 electronic monitors for the five boroughs would be out, would be out and uh, we wouldn't have anybody getting them. And so far at three weeks, we've only had three. I don't know why that's happening. Uh, just want to say thank you for having the hearing. Thank you. Next, we have Alex Tereshnikova. Time begins. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you for hosting the hearing today. My name is Alex Treshnikova, and I'm one of the organizers of the Emergency Release Fund. We are a grassroots bail fund for LGBTQ individuals in New York City and COVID-19 bailout community response. We believe that cash bail is an unjust system that punishes people in poverty with jail time and should be ended. It is unfairly being used even during epidemic to keep medically vulnerable and marginalized communities in unsafe conditions in detention. Since the mayor and governor refused to release people during this pandemic, especially medically vulnerable individuals, we are using cash to get people out of jail fast. Since the beginning of the pandemic in New York City, we have bailed out over 160 medically vulnerable and LGBTQ individuals from Rikers. We have sent over 40 volunteers to bail windows in each borough and have faced a number of issues when paying cash bail. The testimony discusses the need for an easier bail payment system at all times, but especially given the current pandemic. As there have many initiatives in city processes remotely, um, bail payment appears to be left behind, and in turn, people behind bars have been left out. Like Local Law 6184, we request the city provide an alternative to in-person bail payments during the public health crisis. We also request that you ensure bail refunds continue to be processed and returned to individuals while the court is on a reduced schedule. Historically and at present, the process of paying cash bail in New York City requires going to physical locations to retrieve cash or a cashier's check often taking public transportation to get to bail windows, interacting with GOC staff and other sureties in a, in a crowded payment area. Each step of the process creates risk of exposure to COVID-19 for both the person paying bail and everyone they interact with at each stage. For example, with reduced bank hours and locations, we have spent over an average of two hours a day on, length, on lines at the bank to get cash or cashier's checks to pay bail. State rules restrict bail payments by one individual to no more than two bail payments per month. Hence why we have deployed over 40 volunteers to bail windows. We've gone to bail windows only to find that no staff have been reported for duty or have been reassigned to work at bail windows, making the wait time for us to pay bail even longer. Bail windows are small and it's impossible to be apart. So our volunteers and other sureties have been forced to wait outside for hours, even in the rain. I spent over eight hours to pay bail once. Um, and this in turn means people behind bars are forced to wait even longer to finally be released. Creating a process for taking bail payments over the phone and online would be a simple and powerful solution. This would protect both families paying bail and the city's civil servants who accept it. The city contracts with GovPay to accept virtual payments for cash bail, but with a burdensome non-fundable service fee of 7%. We talked before about the local law for the commissary, 7% for a $25,000 fee is huge, um, and especially for marginalized communities to pay. Um, so we're asking for all service fees to be waived and for GovPay to be included um, for all bail payments. And thank you for your time. Great, thank you. I, I, I think you are, but I think just, you know, to make sure you stay here, I think you're staying in regular contact with some of the staff here, but uh, we, it sounds like there's some issues for us to take a look into. So if you have a testimony, send it over. And also I know a lot of others will be in, in contact with you to address any issues if there are. And, I hear you. Thank you for the work you're doing, and I, I understand if there are difficulties to doing that. We want, especially in a pandemic, we want to we want to take a look at them. So thank thank you, and thank you for waiting for so long. Thank you. Next is Amanda Mizell. Starting time. 
Hi, um, my name is Amanda Mazel. I'm also a volunteer with the Emergency Release Fund, and I um, thank you for the time to make a comment today. Um, there's a lot that could be said, but I want to um, limit my comment to some very specific issues that we've had with paying bail and with being able to support those who will be released on bail. Um, I would like to emphasize um, Alex's point that we are demanding that bail um, be online available for all um, bail payments during this epidemic and that the um, the 7% and, and um, credit card fee and the online fees be suspended for all bail payments. But I'd also like to bring attention to the, um, the lack of predictability and extreme wait times that we've been experiencing um, for releases after we post bail. Um, we have been seeing multiple instances where people are meant to be released in the morning and are being released at all hours of the night. Um, we're seeing multiple instances in which people are released um, like more than 10 hours after the time that they were meant to be released. And this is causing a huge issue during the pandemic um, for individuals who um, are going to help with release and help transfer um, those people to safe places to quarantine and to homes. We've had a number of people who are medically vulnerable stranded um, at night because they were released hours after we expected um, and volunteers have been unable to communicate with them to um, meet up with people to take them to quarantine um, if that is what they're doing or to take them home to be with relatives. So we ask that there be set release time schedules that are adhered to so that we can make sure that people who are um, leaving who need rides um, are able to meet up with family members or loved ones or volunteers that are assisting them. Uh, we think this is an important matter for public safety as well. We don't want people who are released from a place with astronomically high rates of infection to have to take public transportation or walk. Um, and we also ask that everyone who is released have access to a non-compulsory um, test so that they are not at risk of unknowingly infecting um, their family members or loved ones or others that they are staying with. Um, so in addition to having set times, uh, we ask that there be a test optional bond release and that people are not in the process of being released, shuffled to multiple different facilities um, where they are at risk for exposure um, and they are coming into contact with people who they wouldn't I'm expired. into contact with. Thank you. Thank you. Not seeing any council member hands. We'll move on to the next group. We have, looks like three people left. Uh, we'll first have Tita Theodora Beal, followed by Kate Adamides and Kelly Grace Price. Um, Tita Theodora Beal, you may begin once the time is called. Starting time. Thank you very much, and thanks for your stamina. Uh, I am here with the New York City Jails Advocacy Coalition for Fair Treatment of Rikers Detainees. I do not work in the legal system but I knew an innocent man who waited for trial in Rikers in seven Maine for 14 months. Uh, so I hope you will pass uh, the T2020-6175 uh, for the Conditional Release Commission, um, not just for today's COVID time, but also for any future flooding with hurricanes, fires, terror attacks, chemical explosions, whatever you can imagine. The commission would have the time to do what somebody said earlier, look at the bill, suggest improvements and pass it so needed decisions can be made and action taken um, before COVID spreads too much. One in one or two cases can turn into a hundred quickly. Today, I have heard a lot of either or thinking. Um, a commission would have the expertise to move people charged with violence and repeat offenders to COVID free areas and send nonviolent offenders home with ankle bracelet trackers. It's not either we protect the public or we take care of prisoners. Uh, some people keep, seem to set up that dichotomy. 
Um, I have three main reasons for supporting the commission. Innocence, income and race. One of the foundations of our legal system are, is that people are innocent until proven guilty. Today, some people talked as if all detainees and Rikers are guilty. Phrases like don't, don't commit crimes and we won't have a problem. Uh, a lot of people are waiting for trial. The man I knew in Rikers for 14 months was charged with violence, but refused plea deals, insisting he was innocent. No record, but not given bail because of the charges and maybe because his complexion is brown, he's Muslim and he's not American. While his accuser was a wealthy white New York businessman. Unlike many people in Rikers, the defendant had the money to hire uh, lawyers and an investigator who uncovered strong evidence of innocence and the reasons for false accusations. Few detainees in Rikers have that kind of money. A jury acquitted him 100%, but today he would be, while if he were waiting for trial, he would be at risk of disease and death, maybe never make it to trial. And think about, I hope the people just dismissing the commission and calling everybody criminals will think about that. Uh, how many people are really are innocent or, or well, the next issue is income. Um, I thought maybe my person was an exception. His lawyer saw so many black and brown people in Rikers who were only there because they couldn't afford a lawyer to check evidence. People. Time expired. Okay. And the last one is race. My white kids would get calls from lawyer from police warning them, uh, call me and warn me. Their black and brown friends ended up in Rikers for same, you know, open carry beer or cigarettes or fighting or whatever. So I think, I hope you can make sure people think about that when they think about the commission. Thank you. Next is Kate Adamides. Um, you may begin once the timer starts. Starting time. Thank you for having me. I know this has been such a long day for everyone. My name is Katie Adamides. I'm the New York State Director for the Fines and Fees Justice Center. I submitted testimony in writing. I won't read it. I believe council is familiar with the Fines and Fees Justice Center, and we thank you for introducing a bill that um, would limit money transfer fees, and we support the bill. Um, and while limiting money transfer fees is an important first step, we do need stronger fines and fees reforms for New Yorkers. Um, especially now, these fines and fees are causing, they're exacerbating the already disproportionate harm to low income communities and communities of color that already preexisted COVID-19. But in the wake of COVID-19, we're seeing the exact very same communities harmed by both the public health crisis and the fines and fees at the same time. So we knew that these practices were wrong before COVID-19 and they're even more egregious now. Um, so for example, um, with JPay, um, they, they continue to extract millions of dollars from people in city jails and their loved ones. And often, even if the fee is just $5, it's still like 20% of the deposit. And, and we are concerned that companies can still, um, for example, limit the amount of the deposit to keep that percentage even higher than it is right now. Um, our position is that fees should be abolished, especially now, but we understand that the city um, may not end money transfer fees. So if the city does not end money transfer fees entirely and only lowers existing fees, um, it must do so in a way that stops the worst forms of price gouging for people who are supporting the basic needs of their loved ones behind bars. So we would like to see the law prohibit vendors like JPay from reducing the current allowable deposit amount um, and rather than a standalone flat fee cap, um, we would like to see a percentage cap up to a maximum of $5 so that we know that this price gouging by percentage wouldn't be possible. Um, we, we also think that there needs to be more data publicly available and easily accessible about what these companies collect. And we wanna see those contracts publicly made available so that these things are easy to track and easy to reform when they're, when they're harming our communities of color and our low-income communities. 
And uh, we'd also like to encourage council to take up the other fines and fees issues that are harming people. We're so grateful to see that, that these issues are moving in New York City, um, but there are still so many, especially access to diversion. Right now, diversion allows people to make money, continue to work, continue to see their families and continue to practice physical distancing rather than being behind bars, where on top of all the other harms that it already caused people, there's also inspired. risk of exposure to COVID-19. Thank you so much for letting me speak. Thank you. And last we have Kelly Grace Price. Once the timer begins, you may begin. Starting time. Hi, I'm just, um, I'm going to turn in my written testimony. I'm so tired after this eight hour hearing, but I, I didn't hear anything about the furloughs mentioned. And I wanna ask please Councilman Powers, Alana and Councilman Lance, please look into the qualifications for these furloughs because we've heard specifically from a press release on April 23rd from Court Innovation and also in a little bit in the, the intercept that quoted someone from Mockche saying that 300 people have been released on these for stay at home furloughs and there's still LC supervision. What are the qualifications? Who's being released in this? Why can't this be used to release everybody? That's why like I have to say I'll turn to testimony. Thank you for a really great hearing, Councilman Powers. Thank you. I'm done. Thank you. Um, thank you. If we have inadvertently missed anyone that is registered to testify today, well, also assuming if there are no questions. Okay, there are no questions. Um, if we have inadvertently missed anyone that has registered to testify today and has yet to be called, please use the Zoom hand function and you will be called in the order that your hand has been raised. Seeing none, I will now turn it over to Chair Powers for closing remarks. Chair Powers. Thank you, thank you, Alana. I wanna thank everybody. Uh, I see so many folks who signed in right at the beginning and have been through this entire hearing. Uh, I know some probably came and went, but we are deeply appreciative of everybody who has spent this seemingly uh, entire day with us here to talk about what is a really important essential um, uh, uh, hearing here. When we talk about the COVID crisis and the bills that we are working on today, the three that I carry to get more data, to, to set up a release commission and to talk about the fees, I think are incredibly important for us to pass and pass very soon to make sure that we all, uh, both the city council members and those who are doing the work out in the field have the appropriate amount of information, have the appropriate amount of data and are able to do our jobs and also make sure that people that are inside of our city jails are being treated appropriately at this particularly very difficult time. We're not gonna stop advocating for release. We're not going to stop many of the work that we have been doing since the beginning of this pandemic, but these bills, I think, help us bring us along the way. Um, and I do want to offer one thing, which is I know that sometimes that these, these hearings go on for very long, and I know that sometimes many of you wade through many of this, but the public testimony is perhaps the most important part of all these hearings. We listen to all of it. We take all of it. I take notes, staff take notes, and um, we copiously go through them at the very end to look for issues that are in the legislation, issues to raise with the agencies, and of course, other ideas for legislation, other issues we should be focusing on. So I mean that very seriously when I say you should follow up with us, you should talk to us, and, um, and thank you for spending that time with us because it helps us do our jobs even better. Um, I, I, I'm not sure that we set a record, but we certainly came close when it comes to at least a virtual hearing. I wanna thank Chair Lanceman, I wanna thank all the staff. I see Councilmember Holden, I know Councilmember Cohen had been on since the very, very beginning and, and, and listening and, and uh, paying attention. So thank you to them as well and any others I might have missed. Um, and I am exhausted, so I'm gonna leave you at, at there, but I'll hand it over to Councilmember Council Lanceman and um, a very gracious uh, to all of you for spending so much time with us today. Thank you. Keith, thank you. Um, thank you everyone who uh, testified today, particularly to the members of the public who stuck it out to the very end and, and to my colleagues. Uh, this is one of the most important issues that we are trying to deal with in this uh, coronavirus crisis. Uh, it's been said, and I don't think it's an overstatement that at least in New York and maybe in the United States, the Rikers Island is the epicenter of this crisis. I think everybody um, uh, on this panel, uh, the staff uh, and all the witnesses can take a lot of pride in having moved the ball 
forward uh, very considerably uh, from where we were just two months ago. But as uh, people have testified to, there's still work to be done. So let's keep doing it. Uh, Keith, thank you very much. Thank you to the staff that, that made the mechanics of, of this whole day work and um, look forward to continuing working with everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll have the chair close us out. Thank you, everybody. We are closed here. I'm going to gavel out. Thanks so much and have a great night. Talk to you soon. And Zach, you're great. You have wonderful, beautiful kids. Thank you. <laughs>